payments and instant messaging support, rules, entitlements, and workflow management, AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings. This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. Conference and SME Banking Awards on 29th and 30th of November.
Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using Partner Hub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. Partner Hub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for Beyond Banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. Partner Hub, your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXEED's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements and workflow management, AI powered smart forms, straight through processing, unified access across downstream applications and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using PartnerHub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. PartnerHub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for Beyond Banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. PartnerHub your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iExceed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper-intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements, and workflow management. AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
Hello, everyone. Welcome. Today is November 30, and we are live from Krakow. I'm very glad that we gathered here in the Ice Krakow Congress Center in the very heart of Krakow with a beautiful view of Wawel Castle, SME bankers here from our CEE region, fintechs and tech, tech companies. Thank you very much for coming. I'm very excited that you made to come and we have this opportunity to, to talk to each other in person. And also, I'm very glad that this year we have this opportunity to uh, do a live streaming of our conference again and uh, to have our online viewers that couldn't come here physically. So thank you very much, both of you, for coming and also for watching us online. And thank you, of course, our partners for making this uh, all happen. So, today we have a very intense agenda. 30 speakers from 10 countries uh, are ready to share with you their experience in uh, digital SME banking, SME finance, digital transformation and digital sales. And uh, in the evening at 6 p.m. we will award the best SME banking and tech solutions in the region. For the first, for the fifth time already. So, as you probably noticed, that this year, except the SME Banking Awards and FinTech Awards, we will award the best and the most innovative tech awards, uh, tech companies in the CE region. And there were you actually who voted for the best solution on our conference website. And right before we go to our first panel, I also invite you to use. Uh, the conference website during the day because you have several opportunities there. Well, first of all, for our online viewers, uh, from your right, when you watch our online stream right now on the live stage, on your right, you have a chat, and I invite you to type your comments, thoughts, and questions to our speakers and panelists, and we will be reading them here from the stage. Also, we have a networking zone where you are welcome to network with your peers. So you see there are both in-person participants and uh, online participants, and you can send their individual and uh, messages and also type in the group chat, but also uh, send emails from the level of the, of the networking zone. And also we have uh, online exhibition uh, area, uh, which is the online version of our expo era, which we have here physically in the Ice Krakow Congress Center. So also please explore all the stands and our exhibitors will be happy to answer all your questions. So this is it for the, for the organizational moments, I would say, at the moment. Let's, let's start our agenda. And the first panel, which is a tradition actually uh, already, that the first panel and the first topic that we are discussing during our conferences is the artificial intelligence and how it influences the financial industry. And for the first panel, I would, I would like to invite now Claudia Arhimovic, head of customer service at Verita HR and magazine recruiter, to moderate the panel. Claudia, the stage is yours. Hello, hello. Is it working? Oh, okay, cool. So it's very nice to, to see you all here. A lot of pressure, I have to say, like a first panel, that's always a lot of pressure. But I would like to, to invite uh, our two panelists uh, to, to join me. And first of all, uh, Filip and uh, Bartek. So, yeah. I'm going to tell more about you in a second. So. Ah, okay. <laughs> Okay, okay, but that's Okay, so let's sit down. All right. So Philip, Philip, you are head of independent model review and regulatory compliance in HSBC, but you are also uh, author of a book called the Big R Book from Data Science to Learning Machines and Big Data. And Bart Fomi, you are head of the project management team at the Bank Peco in Warsaw. Like do you want to say something about yourself except that? <laughs> yes, of course. What's your connection with artificial intelligence? Well, um, artificial intelligence is something that uh, keeps me busy and uh, awake already for many years. I usually kind of live more in the future than in today. 
And I started preaching about AI probably 10 years ago, that it was really something important, that it would transform the world. But it's so exciting that those things are happening today. And so I bring that subject to many different universities. For example, the MBA program in Warsaw, uh, in Krakow. Uh, lots of things are happening now, and it's all going faster and faster. Bartek? Yeah, this is uh, also similar in my case. I'm really following the AI uh, topic uh, for many years, and and uh, I I'm focused to combine the knowledge I gather from these developments with the the progress of the fi financial services industry, banks uh, specifically, and uh, throughout years in different roles, in consulting roles, in banking roles, I, I'm looking for the use cases uh, uh, for the real beneficial application of the um, artificial intelligence. Yeah, I think it's very important what you said. You're involved in artificial intelligence already for like uh, many years. And it became like a huge and hot topic recently because of ChatGPT actually being uh, released exactly one year ago. And everyone suddenly started to talk about artificial intelligence. But we are not focusing today on generative AI. We are just fo like we are focusing on AI as a whole. And the first question I have to both of you is like, what are the current use cases of AI in the banking? How banks are benefiting from AI? at the moment. So maybe let's start with Bartek now. Okay, so um, I believe that it's very important to distinguish uh, two areas. Uh, we have like a kind of traditional artificial intelligence which is being developed for uh, many years and we have also a lot of the discussions since uh, last year about large language models and artificial uh, generat generative AI. And this is important to distinguish these two because when you ask Claudia about uh, what our banks are, are currently doing, uh, the, the answer is that there is a lot of experience in application of this traditional uh, artificial in intelligence in the, in the er areas where you can actually find a important correlations between the data, regression models. So all the possibilities to find the hidden information within the data that you have in the mm -hmm. in your bank and this is it was it is developing and uh, it it brings a lot of benefits but it's important to see a big difference compared to the uh, generative ai because in the second case there is a uh, much more, and it's the, the, this technology is much more promising. So, so if you ask uh, what banks are currently doing, mm -hmm. so I would say they start to experiment in uh, uh, generative AI, but they are also quite advanced in the area of, uh, of uh, I would say, traditional AI. Mm -hmm. Philip. Yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, AI is a very important uh, development. Uh, it is being adopted at an exponential scale at this point, and that means that about everywhere in the bank, and I suppose banks aren't even an exception there, everywhere in every organization you will see people thinking about how we can use AI to mm. produce more, to do things more efficient, to save costs, or to do more things, or to do things that we didn't ever before. Uh, for example, there is another bank uh, in Spain that a few years ago they decided, well, we are in lending and we're good at lending, but you know, there are these customers that live in that area of the city that is poor and, um, you know, we can't give credit cards to those people because you know it's too risky and nobody did and they said well let's use ai and they teamed up with ibm and instead of using the traditional banking data only they started to use data that is publicly available like streams of facebook and so on which basically meant that they were able to mine thousands of columns in their data and not just a few hundred. That also meant that they, in the end, were able to build a credit model that was stronger than what they could have otherwise. And it was very successful. They had more sales, they had more things that they could do, and they were able to reach customers, more importantly, that otherwise couldn't have credit cards. So with that AI, we were able to service customers that 
wanted to do something with their life, but otherwise would have been blocked. I think that's a beautiful example of how AI can be used for good. Now, credit in, is typically one of the areas where we are really very careful to use AI, because many of the methods, and for that particular example, was based on neural networks, and that is what, say, that is a type of AI that gives the most surprising results. And part of the story is also, well, we know exactly how the model works, but it works with billions of parameters. And so we, as humans, well, we can't understand why it does take a particular decision. Now, that is dramatic in credit because the customer can go to the court and say, look, I didn't get a loan, and that is because I'm black, I'm a lady, or whatever that person feels discriminated for. And if you are using your AI model only, well, then it's pretty hard to explain how the model made that decision. You can say, well, gender wasn't part of the columns that was fed in. But if it uses all the information, and for example, it knows that you went to the lady school for whole trinity, well, then it probably assumes that you are a lady. And so the thing is, those machines can use data and construe it in such a way, they will find patterns, even if those patterns are accidental. There are so many other examples. Marketing, for example. Well, actually, any organization uses marketing. And there it is much less um, harmful to make a mistake. And so there we can, of course, be a little bit more liberal in our approach. So, and it also, you don't really have to explain why you send a letter to a certain customer. So marketing is another big area. Customer service is another big area. Know your customer is another area. Banks have a lot of responsibility uh, about knowing the customer so that they can later on check if sanctions are respected, for example. And so a bank of the size of HSBC, well, it pushes through every second 50,000 payments. Now, there is probably something like 50% chance that every second there is a fraudulent transaction, a transaction that shouldn't go through. And sometimes that is because the transaction goes to Iran, sometimes that is because somebody called an older lady in Sheffield and said, well, I'm your grandson and I need urgently money and they're trying to set up some scheme. And so there is too much information going on, 50,000 payments per second, and you want them to go as fast as possible. So you actually have to rely on machines to check those payments. And then to find that needle in the haystack, that one payment that you want to stop and investigate further, again, you have to rely on AI. See, the interesting thing is, the AI will basically say, okay, here is a payment, you have to look at it. And it goes into a queue, and then humans will look at it. And humans will use their discretion, their overall general intelligence to find out if it has to be stopped or not. Maybe let me also stop here. <laughs> you actually <laughs> answered my next question already. <laughs> because I wanted to ask, like, how do you see the future of AI in banking? Like, what, what can be improved? How to, how to improve the efficiency? So, Bartek? Yeah, I, I think uh, to add to what Philip said, um, it's important that we see a lot of the opportunities for optimization and automation of the process where there is no direct interaction with humans. So we see that uh, AI will help a lot in the areas where human used to work with the data and the computer. If uh, you have a scenario where uh, one human, one person is talking or working with another person, we don't believe this area will be, I would say, um, optimized by AI, but all the different aspects, working with different data, which is either structured or not structured, this is a big subject for, for, uh, for optimization. And also, uh, if we are discussing the future, uh, how this AI will develop, uh, we can already observe some, some new trends. So one of the most visible and obvious uh, applications of uh, generative AI, large language models, is in the area of the knowledge management. So this will change how we interact with the information we have we, when we work in our organization. 
So to be more specific and you provide more clear example is when you look for some specific information. Imagine you, you would like to learn how your, uh, your organization is, uh, what policies are applying, uh, applies to you in relation to your vacations, what type of vacations or a day off you can take because of the different regula uh, regulations that you have in, in your country. Normally what you would have to do, you would have to find a, a specialist, a person who could provide you this information. Probably it would be very difficult for you by yourself to find that data in a respective company policy. But with AI, there is an amazing space of the improvement because you can use your language, natural language, and you can ask the specific question with your language, with your words, and the uh, uh, generative AI will really understand what you are asking about, what is, the, what is the sense of what we are asking. And it will find the relevant information in the, in the procedures that are provided to this AI. So it will help to answer your specific question in a way that you will understand. And that, uh, that's a huge difference. It's a game changer, I would say, comparing to the traditional AI, which would be you know, train for the specific purpose in generative AI, you don't need to train it specifically for the task you are giving. You can ask basically any question which is related to the data that you have, and you can find quite useful answer. May I uh, continue a little bit on that one? I think sure. we have to be very careful with the words that we use. Uh, I don't think it is completely correct to say that AI understands your query. Basically, even those large language models, they use trillions of parameters, and it's really amazing. You ask them a question, and they answer in a way like it seems, that they understand you, and it makes sense what they answer. Yeah, and it makes you believe and that they are saying the truth, actually. Yeah. Yes, but actually what is going on, it is just taking the string of words that you have put there and finding what would be the next word it basically finds the word that has the highest probability to be next. And then given that string with you, that first answer, the next word, and just predicting the next word. So it is actually very simple in logic, but it, to us it really seems like it has its own logic, even identity, personality. It's amazing. But may I come back to your question about uh, the future of AI? That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a fantastic yeah. question. <laughs> um, and honestly, that is the only question that we really can't answer at this point. You know, you have been at airports, isn't it? And when you see people walking around, they're all pulling their luggage, and you realize the luggage has wheels. And your luggage, when you look at it, it has wheels. Now, 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. Most people were carrying their suitcases. That was a revolution. It made sense, and it got adopted really very fast. Interestingly enough, that was invented already in 1956. However, you know, we invented the wheel probably something like 7,000 years ago. And we have been using the wheels to carry luggage in a certain way on carts pulled by horses and stuff. But we never thought about putting it under luggage. And so predicting where an innovation or an invention is going to bring us is nearly impossible. The AI is actually a technology underpinning a wave of development in capitalism as we have never seen before. Well, the waves we have seen before, we have seen the steam engine, the steam train, the motor car, the, the chemistry, the electronic computer, and so on. But let's take the motor car. So that was the new technology, or actually new technology between quotes, in the 1920s that fueled the economy. That was full of innovation, things were going on, stock prices of the companies producing were going up. The technology as such already existed for a while, the concept as such already existed for a while. And we were just learning how to use electricity instead of candles in the motor of a car, so to speak. And that has transformed society in a way that you possibly couldn't imagine before. The way we do things, the way where we go, uh, everything has changed. The way the streets look like changed because of that motor car. And AI is very much in the same space. 
it will transform society and it will transform the world in which we live. And we really can't even start imagining today where it is going to end up. It's, it's an amazing thing. And then when you look back at the motor car, well, we, start, we invented it maybe more than two, yeah, 150 years ago. It, uh, it really started to work something like 100 years ago. And we are still improving on it. And so it will be for AI. Bartek, do you want to add something? If it comes to the future? Um, I mean, I agree that the future is uh, its very difficult to predict. Um, however, uh, you may observe some trends. And because the nature of the generative AI, because we believe, I think we all agree that generative AI will be the next big trend in the uh, AI in general. I have so, a question to the um, audience now. Who, who did not use chat GPT yet ever? Like, uh, who, who never used chat GPT? Never ever. Nobody. Okay, we have we have one one okay. Person, yeah. Okay. We have Only one person, person didn't use ChatGPT yet. So yeah. that's that's quite impressive. Yeah, but um, the nature of this technology uh, from the perspective from the technical perspective how it works is kind of similar to the AI that was previously. Mm. And this is why I'm saying about that because this is uh, maybe some good indication about the predictions that we can make how the future will, would look like even i fully agree philip with you that it's extremely difficult to, to to have the right prediction but what is interesting when you look into the uh, traditional ai where it solves a very specific well-defined problem like recognize a person recognize what is in the image categorize it things like that you can see that this the level of the improvement is crossing the level of the human. Yeah. And it's, you could imagine that this is growing and developing and it's achieving the level of the human, but it's not exceeding because from our revolution, we are, the, we are suboptimal or optimal in how we interact with this world. However, when you look and compare different domains like uh, picture, like video, like sound, you, you will see that AI is just cr crossing that boundary, that, that limit uh, for the human, and it's passing. So looking from the traditional AI perspective, seeing that it's becoming more and more powerful and effective, uh, I would say that for gener um, uh, uh, generative AI, it will go similar trends. So for the moment, the, the experts are saying that the level of advancement is like for a nine-year-old uh, child. That's the level of advancement of uh, general understanding that, that large language models such as uh, uh, ChatGPT are having now. But, but when you think about uh, that these large language models are developing so fast, then you may come to the very very unusual uh, uh, conclusion that if this AI is uh, developing faster than the humans in terms of the years, you may come to the conclusion that these children which are at the age of nine would never come out with the discoveries without using the AI because the AI will be even better comp to, to their capabilities. And this is kind of, I would say, scary but uh, it's important to be aware of that. Yeah, that's a great point. You can look at patterns and you see what is happening, and so you can predict what is going to happen on medium term. Absolutely, that's a very great point. And for example, if you look back even two years ago, what would have been your prediction about what AI would do to the, which job it would replace first? Well, my guess would have been cleaning the floor, building streets, building houses, the, the, the jobs that are rather procedural and that can be automated very easily. At least that's what I thought. But now that we have these large language models, generative AI and so on, what you see is that actually there is so much high added value on intellectual work. And so that is probably the big revolution. And that is the thing that will happen on short term. Within 10 years, salaries of welders will exceed salaries of high-level managers. And actually now already, if you look in Poland, you know, somebody who is a good welder and good at the job 
Well, he at 20 years old will earn something like 20, 25,000. So if you st study mathematics and you go in the AI, well, then you are in a hot sector of employment market. And then you will work, you will do your studies and you will finish when you're 22 years old and you will work hard for 10 years and you will have that salary that the welder had already at the age of 20. Mm -hmm. So lots of things are happening. And I think that in the first phase that AI assistant will be the key thing that we see. Mm -hmm. Whatever job you have, you will have an AI to assist you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Bartek, I remember our discussion, like I think it was two months ago, and we were talking that there are some predictions uh, about the year when artificial intelligence uh, is actually going to be intelligent enough to, to make decisions. So, which year was that? 20, uh, 2037? Uh, uh, I believe it was 2032, and it, it was uh, based on the AI community mm -hmm. who was like making, uh, I would say, bets. It was like the average value from from different people, so it was like a survey based, uh, and uh, it was uh, the, the question was there about the what when the uh, the AI or generative AI will uh, will become artificial general intelligence. And mm -hmm. this uh, artificial general intelligence is the artificial in intelligence uh, which is at the human level. Uh, so it's like comparable to us completely. Uh, although there are different definition of what AGI is, um, but the common sense is, as I mentioned, it's like when we will have the, the tool or maybe, maybe uh, a solution which would have the capabilities uh, comparable to human. So we have nine years until robots kill us. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's, it's going to kill, but uh, it's, we, not, we don't really know. And, and that's also the problem. Uh, I believe that uh, humans are not fully, they can grow the n neural networks, but it's very difficult to really understand what's, what is happening between the neural networks layers. It's very difficult to understand. It, the complexity is so great that mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, difficult for scientists to really come to the conclusion why this model is working better compared to, to the, the, the another one. They are trying and seeing the results, and that's how they are improving it. But it's really difficult for them to, to, to completely understand the, how it works. They, under, they have general understanding, of course, but uh, it's not like complete understanding. And what about regulators? Because when, when crypto started to be popular, it was like back 2016, 17, when, when banks actually got involved in crypto. Involved, like that sounds bad, but like interested in crypto. Regulators jumped on the topic straight after, and there was a couple of regulations coming up, like FCA is interested, SEC is interested. What if it comes to artificial intelligence? Are there any like regulations already being prepared? Is anything implemented already that banks should be aware of? Regulators are very, very much interested in that. They're, they're responsible, they know that it is going to have a massive impact, and they know that, um, well, using it in a careless way, it can have dramatic impacts for individual groups of people or whole society. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of thinking going on. Um, I believe uh, in China there is already regulation in place. Um, the European Union is going a little bit slow, but it's a very tricky thing to do. You know, AI is a technology, it is a tool, and it is very much like a motor car or a knife in that way. You see, knives, they can kill people, so let's forbid them. Mm. But if you do that, you won't... How are you going to cut You can fruit? do so much yeah. more with a knife, and you cut your bread, for example, mm. and those things won't work anymore. And even if you forbid knives in your country, then there is for sure another country that doesn't forbid knives, and they will learn how to use those knives. And so very much the same with AI. Banks, well, even just think about cybersecurity. That's extremely mm. important. Banks, they are cyber houses at this point. Everything is electronic. That is really the core of the business what the bank does. So you have to keep it safe. And banks obviously are an interesting institution for hackers to go after because they have a lot of money. So the balance sheet of HSBC is $300 trillion. That is massive. That is 
multitude of the gross domestic product of the whole world. That's three times larger than the gross domestic product of the whole world. So there is a lot of price to go after for hackers. And of course, they're using AI. And of course, they won't mind that you have something in the law that forbids the research around AI or something like that. They will just do that. And if you don't have the research, you just don't have the defenses. It's very much like firearms and say, look, they're not nice, so we won't use them. But the next country next to you is using them. So you must be very careful not to stop the research because that you can't and that is happening anyhow and that is your line of defense. The thing that you have to do is say, look, we have guns or knives, so let's have laws that it is illegal to kill each other with guns and knives. Now that makes sense. You can control agency by laws, and so very much the same for AI. I think there is a lot of room still to think about how that is. And of course, you have the whole question about, OK, well, as you were saying, Bartek, AI evolves faster than our brain. Our brain is pretty much the same as 5,000 years ago. It evolves a little bit. A IQ goes up somehow. Well, that seems to have stopped now that we're using the mobile phones too much. But <laughs> of course, correlation is no causation and not uh, insinuating anything here. But the point is, AI follows an exponential evolution. And so at some point, it will be better than whatever we can imagine. Also, if you look at creativity, um, AI can design things that we could have never have thought. And you know, they are structurally more stable, they're stronger, and they look fantastic. So at some point, AI will going to be more intelligent as us. AI will be better in taking decisions. Like, you know, for example, um, there is a lot of information about court cases. And you see that if you look at all the parameters of court cases, that people who had their verdict at 11 a.m. were worse off. Well, why is that? That is because the judge is hungry, <laughs> not because those criminals were worse. And so you can think of, well, actually, it does make sense to have an AI as judge. And actually, in the US, they already have AI assistants that say, well, that's maybe the right approach. But still, you have that human overlay there. So it's, it's still the AI assistant. But at some point, you know, those machines will be way better, not biased like we are, and so on. And they will work 24 hours a day. Like, why would you have a human taxi driver in the future? A human taxi driver will make more mistakes, need taxi breaks, uh, sorry, uh, personal breaks, sleep. Uh, lunch breaks. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he has to sleep. And so the taxi isn't working for a large part of the day. You will have taxis that work autonomously. Uh, taxis that will work 20 hours per day. Taxis that will always be there when necessary. Maybe we even don't own cars anymore in the future because it doesn't make sense. You just have an app on your phone or even you don't have phones anymore. You just think of what you want and some machine will read your mind and a, uh, a car will show up. Um, okay, maybe... Yeah. So I will come back to the topic of the regulation. Of course, we all agree that these regulations are uh, really important. And um, as uh, we don't have a lot of experience how to approach these regulations, this is probably one of the reasons why these regulations are coming slowly. However, I wanted to make some points about what is going to happen in terms of this regulation. So I believe there, is, there are a few things uh, that uh, will be more uh, specified. One of them is like the areas where you can apply AI. So there will be for different institutions across European Union, but I believe also globally, um, that you will have the catalog of the areas where you can approach AI the way you want and some areas where you have some limitation and some areas where you have uh, you you will be prohibited from using AI. So that's one one perspective. Another important perspective, it, and it, it will be a, most probably as the part of the regulation, is the human in the loop uh, concept. So in order to create responsible AI, uh, we as humans we will ensure that each and every decision making point will always be involving. Uh, a human. It, we will never leave everything to the AI, so that's the second thing. And third thing I believe will be also very important is to 
assure for humans the ability to recognize what is created by AI or what is created by human or together. Uh, but it's very important that we will have the right to know what, if this information is, was generated or it was created by, by a living uh, person. Because it will be more and more difficult to distinguish that, that that is why it's more and more important for us to have this right. And I believe that uh, in general, uh, in terms of the regulations, this, these are the aspects that are uh, being discussed now. Okay, I think that's very interesting. Uh, great points, Bartek. Uh, I think one of the key things that we should strive to is even more profound and that that we keep our agency because we rely more and more on AI to decide for us. You know, when you open this Amazon app, it kind of knows what you want to buy next, isn't it? At some point, those things will be connected to sensors on your toilet that will know long before you feel it, that you're going to get sick. And so it would make sense that already the medication arrives and is ready at your breakfast before there you even feel sick. There is already a sensor, actually, a company called Weedings is by Nokia. They have some sensors you put in your toilet. And yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. well, that's the, the obvious replacement for a doctor, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You know, th that thing will work whenever you are in that particular place. Mm -hmm. That thing can make analysis way more precise than any doctor yeah. would be able by just looking at you. And that can accumulate from so much larger databases than doctors as humans ever can manage. And, and, so, and yeah. this is here where it's getting even more interesting because from one perspective, which I completely agree, uh, these solutions, the technology will, be, will prove to be better, even better than uh, our best doctors. But on the other hand, you have humans which probably trust more to other humans. So the, I think the greatest benefit will be to combine both. So to help doctors to use the tools properly and uh, have both uh, aspects, I mean, the best professional expertise provided by the person who, to, to whom you, you, you trust. But actually for the younger generations, I think 20 years, they're gonna trust machines more than people. Because that mm. happened with the banking. Like at first, people trusted only the traditional banks. Like you wanted to do something, you were going to the branch, you mm. were dealing with your money there. And now everyone is using apps. And maybe in 20 years, everyone is gonna be using like a challenger bank apps, like a Revolut or something very, like that. Very, very good so. point. We all have children, isn't it? And you know, you are probably worried about your privacy. Should I post this picture because it shows what I'm eating at home, but children don't have have that problem. They have lost the battle about privacy and they don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And because everybody has lost the battle about privacy, it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. So the key thing is, you know, what you probably don't want is that suddenly a robot police shows up at your door and say, okay, you're arrested for the crime that you're going to commit the day over tomorrow. <laughs> That's not what you want, of course. Yeah. So there has to be some limit to so the agency or deciding what happens next to your life, even if the robot knows better what is good at you, I do hope that we can make that decision ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. We have last five minutes left. Is anyone having any questions? Because I have, I have more. That maybe, maybe someone... Oh, yeah, go on. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Micro you can microphone scream. is coming. <laughs> Oh, now I'm sitting on the mic, okay. So there's a lot of talk about AI, you know, and it's like kind of hard, becoming hard to distinguish what's really hype and what's really happening, right? So I wanted to ask you like, uh, regarding the specific projects in your banks, where have you seen uh, the most advanced uses of AI so far? Um, maybe just briefly, of course, I don't think you have time to talk about everything you've done so far, but uh, you know, I'm very interested in like Polish banking, uh, market and uh, what's happening here with the AI? That's a question for you. Okay, so uh, in, for the Polish banks, uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, potential for automati automatization uh, uh, process improvement. And this is in, uh, in the area of the customer uh, uh, compliance, for example. So to, to help the process, which is very work intensive, uh, to make it uh, uh, going faster and uh, using uh, AI can help a, lo a lot. The another example, good example is, uh, for example, for anti-money laundering, uh, know your customer, KYC. In these areas, there is a lot of work with the data 
from the inside of your company and from the outside of your company. You have to combine the sources and you have to work with the data which is not fully structured in the way that you, you would need in order to make the very important decision for the bank. Is, the, is your customer performing suspicious activity which is risky and it's using the bank for illegal operations or not? So it's a very important question that the banks are have to have to answer, and uh, in these areas, there is a lot of um, a lot of effort, human effort, and it costs a lot. And mm, my observation is uh, the following: the best potential for the optimization are these areas that actually people don't like doing because it's not creative, it's repetitive. We don't like it. So f imagine the case you have to browse each and every customer for some phrase in Google to make sure to find, if you find if this person is performing some illegal activity and you read that. You do that one day, second day, third day. After a month, two months, you are not a very enthusiastic to that activity because it's, it's not developing you. And we observe the trend that in that areas, there is a, a, a lot of space for AI to help with the tasks which are, for us, not, not very um, interesting. I don't know, Philip, you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Um, but frankly, yes, so the things that are repetitive, that happens a lot, and there you can have massive uh, improvements. But frankly, everywhere in the bank, people are now actively thinking on how to use AI for advising customers, for transactions on the stock exchange, for balance sheet management, for insurance, for everything. People are thinking on how to improve those things. And so part of the story is, of course, banks, they are very regulated. And we have a very strong model risk management procedures and mm. team in HSBC. I'm part of the model risk management team, which basically means that all those things have to come to us for approval. So there are multiple layers in place to make sure it happens in a secure and responsible manner. Yeah. Any more questions? OK, go on. Go. Um, hi. Uh, do you think the strict data protection rules in the European Union will leave us behind in the, you know, in the AI competition compared to the US, Asia? Yeah, that's my question. Mm. Very tricky question. Honestly, well, everything comes at a price. And if you want to protect the privacy of your citizens, well, maybe some technological developments will happen slower. But personally, uh, it's a price that I'm happy to pay if there is any price. And it's a price for security is very hard. Let's say if we would pay a police officer to regulate the traffic, you know, maybe it just wasted money, but maybe that would have prevented an accident that could have ended somebody's life. And so I think it's a very good thing that we have that privacy approach. I don't think we should uh, ever um, consider to trade privacy of people for uh, profit. Yeah, I agree, and I, I also believe that it's a very good question. We have to be aware of that uh, even we need to treat the privacy properly. Uh, there is a big race between China, US, and Europe. Um, I don't think this race will stop. Uh, I think that will be both. I mean, that we will have uh, regulation which are relevant and proper to protect us, and this will long term uh, looking it will position us better but in the short term it might be that uh, this regulation will to the some extent also limit uh, some of the developments but not completely because these things I, I think that you cannot stop and also you have to be aware that there is a lot of interest not only in the commercial area but the governments and the military is also exploring the technology uh, for their benefits, for our benefits, uh, which means that the race will continue. 
Lovely. Thank you. We don't have more time for, for any more questions. So thank you very much, Bartek, Filip. We were supposed to talk about ethics and ESG still, but Olena, next year we need two hours. <laughs> so thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Photo together? Like, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can you? No. Okay, later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And next panel will be devoted to the topic of the digital customer onboarding. And before we have uh, the discussion itself, we will have the presentations. And uh, for the first one, I invite uh, Viktor Yashchak, uh, Director for the CE region at FaceFi. Viktor, you are welcome. Yes, thank you. Let me get the, the pilot. Uh, hello, everyone. Very excited to, to start the second panel of the day related to digital onboarding and biometrics. My impression is that it used to be the hottest topic in the industry. Now the hottest one is AI. Luckily, biometrics has a lot of AI in it, but I will try to present you a different perspective today. Uh, my name is Viktor Jaszczak. I'm uh, head of Central Eastern Europe at FaceFi. We specialized in uh, digital onboarding and authentication with the use of multiple biometrics. And today I will guide you through the uh, hidden costs of digital onboarding. Uh, the, probably the most important topic will be customer experience and abandonment, how it impacts your business. We will do some mathematics, but don't worry, not to not to complicate it, and I will guide you through it. And I will give you some guidance you know, uh, to take away from, from this presentation. So why customer experience is so important? Uh, because of the fierce competition we have uh, nowadays in the uh, financial services, customer experience is basically a key brand differentiator. Uh, customers are already used to, uh, used to it. They are willing to pay more uh, for a service if they can get a great customer experience and in return, you know, better value, uh, time savings, uh, and, and so on. And 84% of companies increase revenue after they improve the customer experience. So it's a really, really important thing and uh, the key to, win, uh, key to win in the market. So what is the cost actually of onboarding abandonment? It can damage your revenue, brand reputation, and market share. 42% of customers report uh, abandoning sign up to a new service because the onboarding process was too long or it was not good enough or they didn't like it. So you can say 40% or even half of them will, will drop out because the, uh, the customer experience was bad. And having abandonment rate can boost ac customer ac acquisition by 29% and increase the revenue by 26%. So we can see the direct impact on, on the business. If we consider the banking use case, the, the most, the simplest digital onboarding process uh, in, on, on mobile or web, let's say firstly we have to take the photo of the identity document, we will have the uh, document capture, OCR, maybe we'll use NFC. Secondly, we need to make, uh, we need to do facial capture uh, with liveness test, so we make sure this is a live person doing the onboarding. We compare the photo to the uh, photo from the document. We might do uh, prior onboarding verification, so if whether this person has been previously registered with, uh, with our institution. In the background, we can do some identity validation, so maybe AML checks, uh, blacklists, our internal or external, uh, or other biometrics, and then the account is created. So simple onboarding consists of many steps, and on, uh, on, we, on each step we can lose a customer because the process wasn't ideal. And what are actually the reasons for it? First of all, manual document capture. So we ask our uh, clients to, to capture the document by themselves. They have to click on the screen, and maybe they will take a bad photo of it, they will cover some areas of the document. So it causes internal and external uh, uh, problems. So for us, maybe we have a bad image of the document, we don't see uh, the date of birth, and for the users, then they have to redo it. Customers need to fill in the form as opposed to automatic OCR. And this is so frustrating when I go to a hotel and I have to fill in the long form with my, with my data rather than somebody taking my ID and doing it automatically. Uh, the uh, liveness test takes too long uh, and is uh, not user-friendly. So uh, in this, in this uh, 
in this regard, active liveness is, uh, is something that we should move on. The process will take more than 60 seconds or even, even longer. Uh, and we ask the user to change the devices. So they, they want to start on desktop, but then we re, uh, redirect them to, to, to mobile. And at this point, we can lose as many as 20% of the users. So first time success rate is the key metrics to consider when you choose an onboarding solution. So let's take an example, really simple example, that we have to uh, onboard 10,000 users uh, in a year. And a simple cost analysis is, uh, as you can see, the first provider charges 80 cents per, uh, per user, the other one, one euro. So we have 8,000 versus 10,000. So the math is simple at this point. So one provider is more expensive by, by 2,000 uh, euro. But then we have to consider what is the first time success rate. Because even if the onboarding costs are higher, superior first time success rate uh, will have a better impact on the, on the revenue, uh, will uh, direct us to smaller uh, abandonment rate, and we will have better earnings. So in this scenario, provider A uh, has a 75% success rate, and provider B, 92. And we consider lifetime account value of 160 euro. This is very uh, dependent on the business. And this is statistics for, for a retail client. And of course, for a business client, it can, it can go higher and higher. But the math, the math, when you do the math, it will still prove the point. So with the first, uh, first provider, uh, out of 10,000 people, 2,500, uh, we have 2,500 fail on boardings. With the provider B, 800. And how does it compare then to, to the overall cost? So we mentioned before that 40% of users uh, drop off the process because of the poor user experience. So this is something that we can directly control uh, when we implement uh, something else or the process is better. So in this scenario, provider A lost 1,000 users because of the uh, bad user experience, and provider B uh, 336. So if we consider the potential revenue lost, the provider A uh, cost us 168,000, and the provider B, 53,000. So the, the difference is really striking. We can see the, you know, the, the first time success rate was 75% versus 92%. But even if the gap is lower, uh, the, the, the difference will still be there. So if we consider an overall mathematics, provider a, uh, the total cost for provider A was uh, 176,000, and for provider B, 63,000. So we can say that uh, with provider B, we can save more than 100K euro. And this is, not, this is not everything, but to make it really simple, I try to, uh, to put it in this framework. So what are the hidden costs, you might ask? Because there is a lot more in the process that you need to uh, consider. For example, what is the manual intervention inside our organization? Because maybe somebody has to uh, check the samples that were provided to the, uh, to the, you know, to the CRM. Uh, we need to employ more people to check the documents because the system was not bulletproof enough to detect fake IDs. Then, what if we have to do extra integrations because the provider only uh, gives us uh, a solution for one channel, for mobile, and doesn't cover web? Uh, what if they don't have additional biometrics? So if we want to implement voice as a multi-factor authentication, then what do we choose, right? And authentication with, with face, with behavior. So this is another RFP maybe, another internal pro process to choose a vendor. A lot of costs. Uh, cost of fraud, obviously. Uh, so financial losses. Uh, regulatory fines, uh, internal manual checks, so every organization will have a cost associated to it. How much it costs them you know, to, to check a fraud or to, to detect it at a later stage. Uh, this is something very interesting that is uh, many times overlooked at, higher bandwidth and uh, CPU costs. So active liveness solutions will need more frames and data to be sent to the CRM, to the, to the back end. So if we have millions of customers, uh, that, is really, that can really make a difference. And the solution has a high AI bias, so maybe it will not work 
uh, properly. The biometrics will not work uh, properly with, for people with different uh, ethnic background uh, and, and other factors. So what you should consider when looking for onboarding solution? First time success rate, and I cannot stress it enough, and you should be asking your vendors for statistics from, uh, from the implementations, uh, how, how, how much they achieved. Automatic document capture with OCR and NFC reading. So we should take also uh, the burden from our end users that you know, they will not, might not be familiar with using the software, with using the mobile app or you know, biometrics, but we should make it simple enough that the, uh, the software itself will choose when to capture the document or when, when to capture a selfie. And of course, NFC reading uh, gives the, the highest security, pos security possible in terms of uh, remote uh, uh, document upload. Uh, accuracy rate, so we can check uh, you know, the, uh, statistics for the biometric algorithm. Uh, this can be checked with National Institute of Technology, so vendors can uh, apply there to, for their so software to be tested. Anti-spoofing protection. So, uh, you know, we talk a lot about deepfakes, presentation attacks. This is really, this is really important. We have to make sure that the solution will detect deepfakes, uh, presentation attacks, you know, uh, screenshots or, uh, or, or other uh, type of frauds. And the industry, uh, industry standard is now passive liveness with IBITA level two. So IBITA level two, IBITA is a certification that uh, proves uh, that given uh, onboarding solution will detect deep fakes, uh, you know, uh, photos of high resolutions or masks. So a lot of frauds will already be rejected. And we need to think how inclusive the solution will be. So needs to have a low AI bias needs to be accessible to people with disabilities. And that's where passive lightness is very useful because the user just need to take a selfie. They don't need to move their head or wink or you know something else. So it will be already more inclusive to, to the uh, larger population. And if the software can work with older devices, then we can cover also you know, uh, less developed areas or areas with uh, lower, you know, lower speed of internet. This is really important. Some of the security and cl on compliance, of, obviously, uh, this is very important in banking, so we can ask the vendor whether they are tested by NIST, whether they have ISO certifications, whether they, whether they detect uh, presentation attacks, and obviously local regulation is, uh, is important. Last but not least, uh, just to introduce uh, face fee, uh, we specialize in digital onboarding and authentication with the use of, of biometrics, and we are multi-biometrics company, so we provide facial biometrics, voice, behavioral, and fingerprint. Uh, we work globally with clients mostly from the financial sector. Uh, our first time success rate is an example from a banking client is 92%, but we can go as high as 97%, it's also a real statistics. We are tested by NIST, and uh, the liveness check that we do is, uh, is less than a second, so it can be used very quickly for onboarding, but also for facial authentication when you log into the, to the app, when you need to approve the transaction or you have a device change and you need to make sure that this is still the same person. Uh, face fee solution uh, has proven to speed up onboarding by 40%. And I've been checking a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, solutions on the market. Last week I did an onboarding that took two minutes uh, with, with something else whereas ours can do as little as 30 seconds. We cut compliance and operational costs by 50%, mainly by reducing manual input required at the institution. And we increased digital account openings by over 35% with a, with a banking customer. So this is how we, that's our presence uh, globally. We have, as a, as a identity vendor, we have the largest number of banks in the portfolio. The company is headquartered in Spain, so uh, we grew the business in Latin America, where we are market leaders. We have also a very strong uh, branch in APAC, working with uh, Korean government, with Samsung hospitals, and other institutions. And we are part of the EMEA team since last year, rolling, rolling the solution uh, to our markets, working with, you know, having local presence in the regions like Central Eastern Europe, with, in Africa, uh, and Western Europe. These are some of the 
references that we have. We have a stand today, so uh, feel free to come. We can show you the demo, real demo, how it works. Uh, we have some fake IDs to also to prove you how we detect you know, fake identities. And if you want to move more, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victor. And please yeah, think of the questions to Victor. So, uh, on during the panel discussion, yeah, okay, <laughs> great. So let me invite uh, next our speaker, Enrique Caballero, EMEA director at Ever Company. You're welcome, Enrique. Hi. Hello. hello. <clears throat> Hi. Good morning. My name is Enrique Caballero. I'm the sales director for AWER, uh, AWER Inter Incorporation. Uh, I'm located in, the, in Vienna. Uh, and today we're going to talk about uh, how AI and deepfakes is uh, impacting the digital identity and onboarding. So uh, I'm going to present a couple of uh, nice slides. Uh, I hope you're going to like it. Um, so about AWARE, so we are a US-based company, so we have around 30 years in the market. We work uh, largely with banks, uh, government, government organizations. Uh, in Europe, we work, for instance, with the Bundeskriminalamt, which is the equivalent of the FBI. In Germany, we work also with FBI, CIA, Interpol, Europol, NASA, Department of Justice and Administration, etc., etc., etc. But we also work with banks, so basically we are bringing the same technology that we have with the governments, and we are bringing this to the banks. Okay. <laughs> so, let me ask you this. So, do you think this is a real person? No? Who says yes? Who's Looks real, yeah? Another chance. You think it's a real person? It's the same person, yeah? Yes? No? No? Okay. Well, the, quest, the answer is no. It's an AI-generated image by a Spanish company called uh, the uh, Clueless AI. And if you have Instagram, I only have to follow uh, couple of people, uh, you can follow her actually. So she's not real and she's generating money. So she's generating around $5,000 uh, per month. And if you, you follow her, so you're going to see that she's doing some kind of fit, uh, fitness uh, and then, well. But the main point is that this is an AI generated image that now is generating money, right? So this is where we are moving now. So all these images that are being generated worldwide, now they are uh, monetizing and this is uh, how it looks like the uh, the AI. Um, the AI recently has been generated around 50 billion of images. AI generated is expected by by 26. Around 90% of all the images online they are going to be AI generated. We were talking before that the. All the logos that you have, one of them, they are generated by AI, and the others are not generated by AI. And the ones that are generated by AI, they are more impressive, right? What the expert says is, according to the, uh, to the experts, is that uh, by, uh, by the end of the decade, uh, is going to be the next big thing. So you have internet, like the good thing, and now the next big thing is uh, all the different images that are being generated by AI. So this is massive. So, if you have ideas for a startup, I really <laughs> encourage you that you do something with AI uh, uh, generated images because this is the, the next big thing. But now let's talk about deep fakes. Uh, deep fakes. What is a deep fake? So, deep fakes is the combination of two words. One is for uh, deep learning AI, this is the first word, and the second one is for fake, right? I'm sure you've seen this image before. It was uh, all over the places that uh, they, they captured this guy, but no, it was a fake, right? So this is a combination of deep, fake. But what is a deep fake, right? Uh, deep fake is an artificial intelligence uh, manipulated media that you can use uh, to put either a face or a voice or a gestures in someone else. So you are uh, putting this at the top of the person or at the voice as well. Uh, 
Uh, of course, this is brilliant, it's very productive because you can do a lot of things with this, but also this is impacting not only the financial uh, institutions, but in general all the different uh, areas around the world, right? Uh, I'm sure you've seen this as well. Uh, this is uh, Morgan Freeman. So you Google uh, Morgan Freeman deepfakes. You're going to see how Relix it looks like. Uh, sorry, it's not running the, uh, the video. But anyway, so this is a deep fake. Uh, this is a Dutch company. Uh, the name of the company is called Rebel AI. And then the person who actually make uh, a Morgan Freeman uh, is, a, is an actor called Bob the Junk. Uh, and the voice is by, by this uh, other uh, actor as well. So they combine everything. And actually, when Morgan Freeman seen this, he say, OK, this is not me. So he really needs to uh, step up and say, no, this is not me. This is a deep fake uh, generated uh, image. And this is also very, uh, uh, very popular. Uh, this is for uh, Tom Cruise. Uh, there is actually a, a TikTok channel for all the different deep fakes that this company create. It's called Metaphysics. They create these uh, deep fakes, very funny. So you Google it, and he's doing, uh, he's talking about nonsense. Uh, but basically, it's very interesting. So they are also creating this, and they are generating all of this. Uh, but what is the what is the reason behind of talking about all of this, right? Because this is impacting uh, nowadays when someone is trying to open a bank account remotely or when you are trying to get access to your account as well. So you are not sure if this is an AI-generated image or a deep fake, right? So it's, this is a, becoming a, a race. And actually, you can create your own deep fakes as well, right? So this is my LinkedIn uh, uh, photograph. And then uh, I, uh, there is a, a, a web page where you can create your own deep fakes. Uh, you need to pay for every second that you are getting, right? But basically, how deepfakes works is that they are taking one image from a person A, and then they are uh, superimposing this into the person B, right? So I just took my, my face, and then it was a video from this gentleman, and then they are creating automatically the deepfake, right? So you can play around, so just go online, and then you can go let move here. But this is not uh, all the threats that we have uh, within the biometrics and the digital identity as well. There are other things as well. It's not only about deep fakes and AI, deep, uh, deep fakes and AI, so you need to invest, you need to put a lot of money, but there are other kind of um, uh, threats as well within the digital identity. Uh, you can see here, for instance, in the right-hand side, uh, there is a person that is trying to get access to a bank account. This is real, uh, happening in the real world. So using a, a printed image from the person, real size. Then you have also a high-quality video, 4K or 8K. The guy in the middle, this is actually happening in Brazil. Uh, one company, they, one of the largest banks in Brazil, they didn't have any kind of uh, liveness detection. And they were doing a lot of money. They managed to do around 1.8 million of dollars because they were uh, they get access to all the different bank accounts. Well, luckily, they they catch him. And then you can see the mask in the left hand side as well. You can see it here in the stand as well. So they are hyper realistic masks. They are around thousand dollars each. So. People are using this to try to get access to the accounts, right? Trying to get access and to create a digital identity in order to get access. Uh, but this is what we are doing, right? So we are fighting uh, against all of this. Oops, sorry. Next. Yep. And this is also interesting, right? So um, this is coming not to AI. This is coming to the standard uh, presentations attacks. There is a very popular uh, movie called The Mask Scammer, which is basically uh, a guy called Gilbert uh, Chilik. He's a French-Israeli uh, person that he was impersonating the uh, Minister of Defense in France. And he was uh, talking with several CEOs around France, and he was asking money. But the method that he has to get access to the money, he used a simple mask. 
and then he run a video. He also has the voice as well, very similar to this guy. And then he was able to, uh, to do 1.8 million of uh, euros just by doing this. Luckily, they catch him. He explained all the secrets behind. But if you have a chance to watch this movie, it's very interesting because it's something that we are also protecting. This happened back in 2015, 2016 uh, in France, right? So uh, if you have a chance, have a look. But how we are protecting against all these kind of uh, attacks, right? So what is our credentials, what we are doing? Well, uh, as I say, so uh, we are working with all these uh, large organizations uh, that I already discussed about. So we have all the experience in the forensic, uh, and we are bringing the same kind of technology to the digital identity and to the financial sector, right? So we are uh, one of the pioneers as well on so standards. So we are working with several organizations around the world. The NIS it stands for National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology in the US. So we are actually uh, the pioneers in this type of technology, right? So we are 30 years in the market. We apply uh, data science, artificial intelligence, and machine learning as well uh, in all our technology. Uh, so basically, we know what the bad guys are doing in terms of AI and machine learning. So we are also uh, protecting against this. And then we have the whole solution, right? So we have... Um, different uh, modules that you can incorporate within your own uh, processes, right? So this is what we are doing overall. One of the successful story, this is actually happening in Americas, uh, similar as the mask that I described. So they, uh, the bad guys, they were uh, having access to all the different bank accounts because they were impersonating uh, a, a lot of people, right? So the bank uh, give us a ring. They say, we need to fight this kind of fraud. So we work together with them. We find a solution. And after they find the solution together, so we see a reduce of the fraud for around 87% in the period of six months. So it was really impressive, right? So basically, they just implement the live detection uh, because they didn't have it before. So they implemented that they, they can see clearly how everything is being reduced, right? The fraud is being reduced. So something to highlight here, right? When you are looking for your, uh, for your digital identity and biometric provider, you need to look for a couple of things. So one is that they need to be compliant with the different uh, regulations, so GDPR, with the standardization bodies, NIST, IBETA, etc. Uh, there is something real, relatively new in the NIST. So they perform a, a FATE, it's called, face uh, access technology. Uh, so they were doing a lot of tests in terms of uh, digital identity, uh, impersonation attacks, presentations attacks. So we are ranked number one on this one as well. So we are fully protected against this type of attacks. Uh, and also the credentials, right? So what they are doing. So are they providing face, voice? Which are the credentials? Which are the markets that they are working? Where, are, where they are present, right? So you need to look for this as well. And yes, so just to finalize, so we know the race is on, so we are fighting against the, the experts uh, on, the, on the attacks, but the, we are also an experts, so the race is on. We are, um, we are leading the race at the moment, uh, but we are not just waiting uh, for see what is happening. But of course, there is no silver bullet, right? So we need to work, we need to continue enhancing our, our algorithms, uh, our technology, because there is no silver bullet to, to win this, uh, this fight. But at the end, we're going to be successful, right? So uh, we know we have the experience. We have 30 years in the market. And yeah, even if they have good algorithms, even if they are trying to get access to uh, our systems, we're going to be uh, successful. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Enrique. Great presentation. Yeah, please stay here on the stage. And now we will have a panel discussion. And I also invite uh, Pavel Yashevsky, BNP Paribas, Poland, and Wojtek Widenka, ING Bank, Shlonsky, Poland, to that stage. OK. So we know now how we should sit. <laughs> and 
Patrick. Here, yes. <laughs> all right, all right. So um, let's start this panel discussion. Wojciech and Pavel, from you, please present shortly what are you in right now in your banks, and then let's start because we heard from Victor and Enrique what they're doing and what they're in. So yeah, please tell us about yourself. Okay, thank you for the invitation. I'm, my name is Wojtek Widenka and I'm responsible for client onboarding in business banking in ING Bank Śląski. It means that I am in um, business area, I'm responsible for creating process for process management of onboarding, everything connected with CDD review and somehow I usually, I usually say that I'm translator between KYC and compliance requirement into the business area, it means uh, how to deal with the balance between the requirements of clients and requirements of KYC and compliance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello, so my name is Paweł Jaszewski. I'm head of customer lifecycle tribe in BNP Paribas Bank Polska uh, for the SME corporate banking market. And in fact, my role is very similar to, to the one that Wojciech said. So I'm responsible for all the customer related journeys like onboarding, KYC, after sales and, and the CRM area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. We had a question from the audience to Victor. Do you have it still, or okay, the person is out? So let's let's then uh, wait till the, um, the the end of the panel. So let's start. Uh, what take from you? My question, first question will be to you, as you are uh, yes engaged in digital onboarding of business customers. And IG Bank was one of the first who implemented digital customer onboarding for all the segments and business customers uh, as well. Uh, please tell us how this process has evolved during last years. Okay, so short version could be <laughs> like follows. First of all, there was idea of digital onboarding and creating the first application form. Then we step by step expanded the, the, the form into um, additional um, legal forms, additional features. Um, big milestone was implementation of uh, identification by selfies of video verification. Mm -hmm. um, of course, in the meantime, a lot of KYC requirements to be implemented, to be to be covered by, by this process. And now we have 40% of, of um, share in uh, digital onboarding of our SME clients. 40%, so 40% yeah, of SMEs you onboard yeah, digitally? Yeah, we online, so completely digital way. Mm -hmm. um, and the challenge for now is to somehow mm, aware the companies make aware make companies mm -hmm. aware of of such process because mm -hmm. I think that uh, mentally uh, a lot of companies think that the only way is onboarding via via the uh, the branch. The branch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we started this adventure with the, on, the digital onboarding in 2017, I suppose. Uh, we uh, realized that. Uh, Mm, model of of banking by clients uh, had been changing. It means that they are able, they wanted to buy the, the products uh, in online banking directly. So we asked ourselves why we uh, shouldn't change the, the onboarding process as well. Mm -hmm. And we created the first application for, for the, mm, the easiest uh, cases and started the, 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 the onboarding in this way. So then, step by step, we expanded by another features, by another legal forms. Um, in 2020, we uh, implemented the, uh, the module of video verification, so implementation uh, identification via selfie. And that's all, yeah? And now we are, as I said, 40% of our clients uh, do it uh, mm -hmm. themselves. What is the target for next year? The target is higher and higher <laughs> to be at, at I think that uh, during a few years we would like to uh, reach, uh, I don't know, even 70, 80% of, of completely online, online uh, process. Mm -hmm. And uh, how the process looks like today? Um, on the website, the client is able to uh, fulfill the, the application form, uh, receive the access to the online banking system, um, sign the agreement uh, digitally, do the video verification, so do the selfie, and uh, if everything is okay, we um, 
give uh, him access to the to the account, and this that's all. And I said uh, we tried our our strategies to guide uh, clients into this process in every channel. So of course on the website you can easily find you, you can easily um, able to find the, the the button start the process of mm -hmm. onboarding by the account. But if you call the, the contact center or if you came into the, to the branch, we will guide you to this, this process to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And even if you, uh, in some cases, uh, use the advisor in branch in traditional way to onboard, to, to, to open the account, we use the same application form. It means that even if um, the application is fulfilled at the desk with the advisor, you sign the agreement online. Okay. So this is still this, the same, the same, the same approach. Um, it looks easy, but it's not, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of. This is about, uh, I think, continuous improvement of this process. Uh, we need to cover all KYC requirements. When we started this uh, this journey in uh, in uh, 2017, KYC, I think, was at the very early stage, we could say. Mm -hmm. And now the uh, the requirements from this side is uh, much more complex, much more sophisticated, and we need to um, answer all, all those requirements. Um, last year we decided to change a bit this form and to make it more dynamic. It means that depending on different kinds of legal form, different kinds of of characteristic of the clients, the the questions we ask are different. It uh, gave us a um, possibility of uh, do a lot of checks automatically mm -hmm. and uh, keep it on track from the client perspective also because expectations from clients are still Hi. the same. Hi. Open open my account very quickly. <laughs> and yes. uh, we need to balance between those, those two words and find the, the best solution. So our... Um, our target is also our aim is is, uh, is to make the, the decision process as much uh, automatic as is possible, and uh, open the account as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. I think we're also quite successful because, uh, from the perspective of SME, we open we currently are uh, able to open about 50% uh, of our uh, SME. Um, for for SME uh, in within, within one day, mm -hmm. and for self-employed even is above ninety percent of, okay. of our production. So okay. I think quite nice mm -hmm. process yeah. completely digitally mm -hmm. end to end. Okay, thank you, Pavel. What are your challenges and successes in the digital onboarding? Okay, so maybe uh, I'll start with, uh, with the thesis that you know the, the SME market is very differentiated. So we have a completely different types of, of customers yes. there, and the challenges differ by by this segment. So to start with the with the smallest ones, I mean, sole uh, proprietorships, individual customers, more or less, it's like the onboarding of an uh, individual person, yeah, or even uh, general partnerships. So there, the, the devil lies in, uh, in in technicalities. What what Victor said, you have to build a frictionless process, which is quite easy, uh, where the abandon rate is low. But the difficulty here lies in. In, in this, let's say, in this trade-off between how secure you make it from 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 a technical perspective and how frictional it is, especially taking into consideration our regulatory requirements in terms of remote onboarding, which are very specific. Yeah? For example, in Poland, if you want to be 100 compliant, you don't have to check how thick the the document is, whether it's not multi-layer, and you have to check the reflexes and things like that. Yeah? So. And what Victor said, the longer it takes, the yeah. abandon rate is, uh, is higher. So in this segment, I would say it's, it's much, uh, the biggest issue is this, is this frictionless process and the way that you design it. Uh, the other part of this, of this segment are kind of traditional uh, customers, traditional sectors. For example, we as BNP Paribas uh, are, are quite strong in the agricultural sector. And we have a lot of SME customers in, in smaller towns, in smaller cities. And for those customers, in fact, uh, they do not need digital onboarding. They would love to meet with the relationship manager, drink coffee with him, um, you know, uh, know this person. And even if we get, give them, you know, the, uh, the documentation in, in the PDF, they tend to print it and put it into, into, the, into the shelf. Yeah? So, so, so there, it's, it's kind of change management. It's, it's changing the attitude, what, what, what Wojtek said, trying to convince them that they can shoot, it's safe, it's okay. And in fact, for those customers, it is 
we as a bank who are driving this change because cons consumers, uh, the customers do not want to change. We want them to change because the traditional boarding process mm -hmm. is extremely costly, frankly speaking. And mm -hmm. of course, it's error prone because when you do it in branch and you, you can make a lot, of, a lot of mistakes. So it is something that we are working on and trying to change the, uh, the, the customer habits. And then when we look at the, at the bigger SMEs, because I'm responsible also for the, for the corporate banking, mid-corporates and, 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 and the medium co uh, companies, uh, in this case, the, the, the challenge lays again in a completely different area. I would say it is KYC, what again Wojtek said a second ago. Because checking the identity of, of, the, of, of the persons who are entitled to represent the company it's quite easy. Okay, maybe it's not that easy as for, for the lowest segment because you can have two or three people that need to be verified and they need to, to sign the agreement. So it, again, takes longer. But then uh, the biggest issues go to all the, the KYC requirements, especially uh, the ones connected with the UBO uh, identification because to do it, we very often need a lot of documents. Sometimes in the case is easy, you can just look at the register when it's uh, 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 um, a private limited company, so Polish spoke as well, something like it is mm -hmm. easy. But when it is not easy, we need to ask the customer for a, a lot of uh, documents, like you know, uh, the company status, uh, uh, the company agreement, the establishing act, mm -hmm. some uh, financial reports and so on. And we need to do kind of, you know, not the quantity, but quality assessment. And, and this takes time. So for me here, the, the biggest challenge is, uh, is the KYC related things, not the technology itself. But again, mm -hmm. it very, uh, differs per, per segment. Mm -hmm. How to motivate customers to onboard digital? This is the question to all of you, if you have this. How did you push your first customers to onboard digitally when you started this process in your banks? Frankly speaking, mm -hmm. we we created the KPIs for the relationship managers. Okay. So uh, of, of course, try to talk with the customers and, and build a solution that we were quite certain uh, after the test that it will it, it will work and it is good and convenient. But again, that was not enough. So my first example was that when we created our first application, after one year, uh, the usage, for example, in the corporate segment was like 70 percent because those bigger companies tend to you know work differently. And adoption was much quicker for, for them. But when you looked uh, at, the, at the SMEs, it was very low because we have a number of uh, branches, a uh, few hundred salespeople, and they, you know, also the relationship managers uh, were taught to bank in this way, to mm -hmm. meet with the customers, uh, uh, grab a coffee, sell something uh, during this visit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was a change that went from the headquarter through relationship manager because he is you know, involved in this, uh, in this onboarding to the customer, yeah? Customer is external party, you know, cannot, mm -hmm. uh, before he onboards, you have very difficult, uh, very limited possibilities to change his behavior. Mm -hmm. You can do it by, by this point of contact, which is, in our case, relationship manager, because uh, I'm not responsible for the smallest, I mean, micro customers, where, where there's the, the kind of mass onboarding. In our case, always there's a relationship manager involved, where it's, mm -hmm. a, a, I said, central, remote relationship manager, or one in a branch, but still, it's like, people, mm. person, Human person touch. contact and trying mm -hmm. to convince the customer to do it. And if you don't do it, uh, your sales goals won't be, uh, 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 won't be checked. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You will not uh, get, get the bonus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that currently we are using also marketing campaign to say uh, it's in, in online or in television that you are able to do it yourself in in the web on during, uh, via website. However, yeah, I agree. Branches means uh, relationship managers are very important in this. As I as I said before, uh, clients who are not. Um, um, don't don't have a fixed appointment with the advisor and mm -hmm. just came came into the to the branch are asked to do it your uh, themselves yeah and this is the this is the this is the way um, and if uh, relationship managers see, see the value of such process it means um, less work for them uh, and customer experience a good uh, process uh, for clients. Uh, they they j just uh, push client to, to do it uh, themselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this is this is the only way I think. Uh, I, I I don't see any any other way to to mm -hmm. uh, to convince client to, to use this this uh, this solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Victor and Ricky, do you have some observations on that? Yeah, I think well, most 
both of our presentations covered it. So obviously designing seamless experience and then the word of mouth in the industry will follow. Uh, but you can also boost the on-site experience with the digital services. That's why we integrate our solutions also in kiosks, mm -hmm. in branches. So the customer comes in, they are recognized by a kiosk, then they are redirected to, to the consultant mm -hmm. because they expect some kind of consulting, concierge almost, uh, because it's a business client, they want to be treated mm -hmm. in a different way. But you can have this wow effect on a client, you know, wow, this is really 21st century. Mm -hmm. And you know, banking doesn't have to be idle. It can, mm -hmm. be, it can be exciting. So I think a lot of institutions also have these bonuses on us for a sign up. This has some other, in, uh, you know, fraud indicators. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's also you know based on marketing. Uh, also one way to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Also the experience. Uh, so you go to the branch. Uh, you get the kiosk. So you can onboard yourself uh, by yourself, right? So, this is a good experience, but also what we've seen is the reduce of fraud. Uh, because you may have someone in the bank that is your friend, and yeah. then he can help you to open the bank account. We've seen this in several markets, uh, that they are uh, implementing the same experience that you have with the phone, but in the branch. And basically, this is to reduce the fraud, uh, not in this part of the world, but in several others. This is what they are doing. So it's exactly the same. Uh, mm -hmm. So you get the phone, you present your document, uh, verify that the document is real and authentic, and then you do the matching between the person from the document against the person who is in front of the, of the camera. It's exactly the same process, uh, but it's more secure because the other thing is that you may have an identical twin, or you may have someone that is alike mm -hmm. to you, and even if you go to the branch, uh, if they are uh, presenting a document, you have the teller and is checking that the person is the same as the one who is claiming to be. They can go through with our technology mm -hmm. uh, in general. So we are able to verify that if it's, even if this is an identical twin, it's not going to go through, right? So this is what we are promoting as well. That is not only for, uh, for the usage and for the friendliness, but also for enhancing the security. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And oh, sorry, if I can comment on that, I, I, I fully agree with you. So, uh, for example, when you have the regulator, the regulator says you have to be very, you know, uh, vigilant when doing remote onboarding. You have to check everything. But when you look at our statistic and market statistic, the most frauds take place in the branch. It's mm -hmm. much easier to uh, to to, uh, to take a, uh, right. a fake ID and open an account in branch because you know, it's, it's only yeah. person. Human factor. Right? It's only human factor. It will never be able to verify the document as good as, mm -hmm. uh, as, the, as the solution. But of course, what, what you can do is support this process by, uh, by help, helping him to, to check the document. Of course, he's a human factor, but again, he also can be bribed uh, or paid, and mm -hmm. such cases also happen, yeah. which cannot happen with the machine. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so maybe if I can sum summarize, you want the human factor for consulting and the service, but you, want, you don't want the responsibility and security based on a human, because again, can be tired, bribed, yes. you know, yes. it's late, they want to close everything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think also, I would add one, one more thing. I think that, that easier is um, uh, um, have the fake identity for private individuals than for company, because uh, behind the scene is also verification of registers yes. and uh, if the company exists, what is the what is the, com the company characteristic, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et and it's much easier mm -hmm. just to, just to go to the process of onboarding for private individuals and I'm the, I'm a completely different person. And this is, I think, something which should be t uh, taken into consideration. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we have one example actually in Spain. Uh, we are working with one of the largest banks there. And they ask us to uh, include this type of uh, digital onboarding uh, in the branch. Uh, because there are a couple of areas in Spain that they are not really safe. Uh, it's like Latin America in some cases. And then the, the people at the, uh, uh, the tellers, they were pushed to open the bank accounts. So they were threat. Mm -hmm. If they don't open the bank account, something may happen. So they say, the banks say, uh, we need to implement this type of solution because even if they go with a paper mask or with a video, so mm -hmm. there is an excuse from the teller to say, I cannot onboard this person because he's not telling me that this is a real person because mm -hmm. they go 
with uh, you know with mask or with paper photograph and then they are pushing uh, the bank to open the bank account mm -hmm. so they say uh, they implement this technology and now they see a reduce on the on the accounts that they are opening in the branches mm -hmm. uh, because they reduce the fraud like 99 percent because mm -hmm. now they need to go through all the lightning detection the matching as well so now they are really happy with this type of technology so mm -hmm. yeah so you are also protecting mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. what is actually the recommendation from both of you as uh, representatives of tech companies what is the step-by-step -step procedure to actually minimize frauds and and deep fakes maybe even not only for the banks, but also for SMEs, what they can do to actually l minimize the influence of fraud and deepfakes on their businesses? You well, yeah, I mean, the, the onboarding and authentication is a sum of many small parts. So obviously when you register, you have to provide the ID. So obviously you need to check whether it's a real ID, the edges, whether there's no uh, photo on it, you know, uh, copy pasted photo. And the holograms, all the security features around the uh, physical documents. Mm -hmm. The NFC provides the highest security uh, for physical documents. Uh, then also EID is the is the is the answer here. Uh, but people can also present photos of a document in, in front of the camera. So it's it's called you know presentation attack in, uh, in terms of in terms of the document. And the biometrical part. Uh, liveness is really crucial here because, firstly, you prove that it's a live person. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure it's not a deep fake, it's not a photo of high resolution. But next to the presentation attacks, we have also injection attacks. So fraudsters can uh, try to outsmart the device, the the the, the app, that uh, it's you know the the video comes from the camera when it's actually injected into the mm -hmm. phone. So uh, this is another threat next to presentation attacks where liveness is uh, you know comes handy and passive liveness uh, in our opinion is really the happy medium between security and user experience because it's quick mm -hmm. it's much safer it's security by obscurity so fraudsters don't know what the, you are looking for in the liveness test because if you have ask people to move their heads yeah. or wink or uh, at some point the fraudster can get it right and with masks it's easy to 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 spoof with masks so this is the onboarding one, there is a, but there is a lot of frauds uh, later, after the account opening, so uh, Mule accounts. How do you authenticate users half a year later? You know, mm -hmm. Do you prompt them to, to send a SMS sent to the phone? No, it's not really a verification. It's, it's, only, uh, you know, it's only checking if you have transmission access to the SMS. Mm -hmm. So really biometrics then, whether face, facial biometrics or voice, Multi-factor authentication is really important, so you know we eliminate mail accounts or fake identities or, and everything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to follow the process, right? So you need to go uh, verify the document is real and authentic. This is step number one. Uh, there are something very uh, important as well. So your system should be able to support using mobile phones but also a web camera. So you can open the account using any kind of browser uh, because this is going to expand the, the, the audience, right? So there are people that they don't have mobile phones that they prefer to open the, the laptop and open the, the camera and do the onboarding. So this is also important that you uh, have the uh, flexibility to open bank accounts using cameras uh, from any kind of device. Uh, and the other thing is that you need to have a strong uh, provider for EKYC. So you do the digital onboarding, you do the verification, the biometrics, but what happened afterwards? So you need to verify that this person is not in any of the watch lists. Mm -hmm. So this is the second step after you do the biometric and the digital onboarding. And this is also running for uh, EKYB, so uh, know your business, right? Mm -hmm. Because in uh, EKYB, so it, well, you can open a, an account for business, but it doesn't need to be linked to a person. So you don't need to run the live detection, the biometrics, because this is for business. But you can run all these background checks. So you need to be sure that the person is not in any of the watch lists around the world. So you also need a very strong provider for the EKYB. Right? Mm -hmm. That is giving you the certainty that eventually, once that all the transactions are happening, mm -hmm. you as a bank, you are not going to have any issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. Do we have some questions from the audience? Yes. Can we have a microphone? 
here at the end of the room. <laughs> Thank you for the fantastic presentations. I was just curious, how, you, how do you guys plan to integrate with the uh, the European Union's uh, move to have self-sovereign identities in their wallets? So, in short, because it's still you know ahead of us, as Facebook, we just launched the digital uh, identity wallet at Money 2020 in Las Vegas. So we will be adjusting to the you know to the European leg regulation, and if it's then open to uh, to the providers in Europe, we will we want to be part of this. Yeah, there is a lot of uh, discussion happening now uh, at high level uh, within the regulation. Uh, finally, they released uh, the draft agreement uh, for the EI, this is, well, this is how it's called, and you have all the different uh, levels how you can get access to this type of EI, right? So this is a self-sovereign uh, self uh, digital identity, but for us as a biometric company, what it means is that they're going to store the biometrics in a certain area where everyone can have access to this. So it's not going to be centralized. So if you uh, want to open a bank account, so coming to, uh, to the context here, you want to open a bank account uh, in Poland. So you go and then you call this and then you can open the bank account. The call is going to go from the bank directly. So it's not going to go through the digital identity provider. So it's going to go to this uh, sales uh, sovereignty uh, uh, module, and then they can open the bank account. So this is the beauty of this. If I want to open a bank account from Portugal as well, so it's going to be the same process. So it's expanding the possibilities for companies like us, biometric companies, digital identity, but also to the banks, because it's, it's going to be like the, the blockchain for digital identity. And Europe is one of the leaders in this. So everything what is happening here with the regulation for EIDAS is, uh, being, uh, is going to be replicated in the States, is going to be replicated in Australia as well, all over the world. So uh, we are so excited about this. It's not finalized yet, so we expect to to take part maybe in 2024, 2025, because there is a lot of things happening. And the other complex thing is the local regulation. So this is for the whole European Union, but then you have a specific regulation from Germany as well. This is the most complex, as you may know. This is very complex uh, in Germany, also uh, France as well. They have their own local regulation. So they need to make the changes during 2024 to be aligned to this regulation in 2025 onwards. Mm -hmm. Do we have another questions? Okay, so then then be the the last question for the panel to each of you. Um, as we our previous panel was about the AI and taking into account the very fast development of new technologies, how would you imagine the um, customer digital onboarding in the next five ten years? Maybe I'll start, but I'll start with, with something a bit different. I, I believe that uh, although uh, AI will, will change a lot of things, and the discussion was very good, at, uh, especially at you know, generating documents, generating answers to, to the claims, or, or supporting, supporting uh, bank employees, and what fact, in fact this is today what, what, what is the strongest, uh, uh, this is the strongest area. Uh, but in terms of onboarding, I would say the crucial uh, the, the crucial obstacles lay not in technology today. They lay in the regulation. They lay into the the, the KYC. Uh, they lay into the lack of interoperability. And what was tackled uh, a second ago, I would love to see the initiative of European Commission of European uh, I, I Identity to to go full live, fully fledged. That's it's, it's with a beard already. It started in 2019. We have 2024. Mm -hmm. And still, for the last it's four or five years. Sorry, I'm not that good at counting, but it's it's quite long. Yeah? And 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 the vision is great that any individual person in the European Union or any company will have its digital footprint and identity and can be very easily reusable among among countries. But mm -hmm. still, the challenge is even if it will be applicable, whether whether local regulation will not kill it. Let's take a, a local example of Polish market. Mm -hmm. We have MDOVUT, which is uh, yeah. Uh, a digital identity, but yes. you cannot use it online for opening uh, banking accounts. So it's like hilarious. Uh, 
you can use the digital identity to identify yourself in yes. a branch to open the relation in a branch, but mm -hmm. you cannot do it through the website. So you can use it to, to gather the data uh, of this document, but still you have to perform, for example, at the very top the, via the open metrics. Mm -hmm. So I would love the regulation to, to be changed and, and this uh, interoperable e-identity to be out, because in more and more cases, for example, what we see in SME market, uh, many representatives of these companies' owners are not Poles anymore. Then from France, Germany, Ukraine, and, and so on, and we still need to find solutions for, for, for them to work. Of course, mm -hmm. you can do it via, via the metrics, but still you have to earn, learn, uh, uh, be able to learn the engine to recognize all those types of documents. Uh, yes. And, and, and it's a challenge. Of course, it's, mm -hmm. it's possible, but it's not interoperable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I think that, uh, that uh, in the future, the w uh, few things. I think the first of all, uh, awareness of KYC issues between clients. Yeah, because I see that currently not all clients uh, recognize the, the, the issue of KYC, don't understand why we ask so many questions, don't, don't understand why the process is so complicated. Um, and this is not operational process anymore. Yeah? It, it was a few years ago that opening the account just was just, just like that. Yeah? And now this is a regular decision process, exactly the same from, from my perspective as a, as a lending one. Yeah? So if you, uh, and clients also, uh, um, it, it, uh, it happens that the clients ask, why do you ask so many questions? I don't want money, f money from you. I, I just want to open the account. And mm -hmm. this, is, this is the first thing. I think awareness of the KYC issues from the client. that It will be easier for us and for clients to, to, to cooperate in, in KYC issues. This is the second one, AI, of course. I think that this is, this is something uh, which uh, will be used for sure in KYC processes and in onboarding as well. Mm, uh, but... Uh, I think that what is important from bank perspective, we need to be smarter than crimi criminal cri criminals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and I think that that people who want to cheat us uh, will be smarter and smarter, and we will, we will step ahead. And this is a very uh, tricky issue. And I think that those regula regulations, uh, 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 which Pavo mentioned, is ver are very important in the future, just to be sure that all banks, maybe even uh, all over the, the world will be treat clients in the same way, and the solution between banks will be uh, common. It means that uh, that we will use the same database, we will use the same the same questions. So clients will will see that that we are that the banking system is uh, one big um, thing, not not just just uh, many many small banks and, and different uh, approach to, to the clients in KYC area. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think with the booming of uh, artificial intelligence, so it's going to be uh, easy and it's going to be a benefit for everyone, for uh, accounts, for new clients, for existing clients. Uh, there is a threat, of course, because uh, AI is growing. We have bad guys as well. They are learning more. But I think we have also the good guys that we are trying to help the banks. So you see the new banks that they are taking the challenge, that they are taking the risk, and you see all the benefit that they are having. They are getting, getting more and more customers. But now we are bringing this to the more corporate banks. So I think with the integration of AI, machine learning, deep learning, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so it's going to be easy and more secure also for the user experience and also for the regulation as well to, to be sure that this is according to what they are expecting. So I, for me, I see this has uh, exciting times, mm -hmm. uh, especially with all this AI booming, because this is going to be very helpful for everyone, right, in the financial ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think Wojtek uh, made, made a good point about data standardization, because, uh, you know, we can have a, a nice technology, but then you have a business operating in EU based on the uh, licensing passport, but how do I verify this person in Poland, Romania, uh, you know, uh, Czech Republic, Italy, because the uh, databases can be different and they might cover 50% in one country, in other 90%. Uh, so what do you do with the, with the rest? Uh, that's a lot of manual work. So I think that's a lot of, uh, you know, effort on the national level or maybe EU standardization. Uh, in terms of AI, it's, it's already here. So, uh, you know, I'm 
five years ahead. I know we will be flying to the moon probably. <laughs> uh, and uh, there's a lot to be done on the authentication side. You know what happens later during the uh, life cycle of a, of a customer. Uh, and you know digital ID schemes. I think uh, this mm -hmm. will this will develop. Obviously, then the question is, what is the adoption and what is the trust in these kind of services? Because we can see success stories of EIDs in Poland and Ukraine, but these are actually ex exceptions on the European level. Uh, so, you know, other schemes didn't really uh, pick up. So, we'll see what's, what happens with the, with the EU scheme, you know, the, the regional one, uh, whether it establishes trust and people, may, they can use uh, self-sovereign identities. So, you know, also, what is the data management behind this? Can they trust it and uh, are they willing to use it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you to my panel. Pavel, Wojtek, Enrique and Victor. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. Conference and SME Banking Awards on 29th and 30th of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using Partner Hub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. Partner Hub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for Beyond Banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. Partner Hub your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXeed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper-intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements, and workflow management. AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, 
What would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings. This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. Conference and SME Banking Awards on 29th and 30th of November.
Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using Partner Hub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. Partner Hub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for Beyond Banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. Partner Hub, your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXEED's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements and workflow management, AI powered smart forms, straight through processing, unified access across downstream applications and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. Conference and SME Banking Awards on 29th and 30th of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using Partner Hub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. Partner Hub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for Beyond Banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. Partner Hub your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iExceed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper-intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements, and workflow management. AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. Conference and SME Banking Awards on 29th and 30th of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using Partner Hub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. Partner Hub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for beyond banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. Partner Hub your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iExceed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper-intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements, and workflow management. AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
All right, we are back on stage, and uh, the next panel discussion will be about uh, the topic of the ecosystems for SME customers. And first, we will have two presentations, and afterwards, the discussion. So let me invite the first speaker, Machi Salata. Komar, you are welcome. Hello, everybody. Very nice to meet you. I hope you had a good coffee. Uh, my name is Maciej Sawata. I'm from Komarch, which is a company we has headquarters here in Krakow. We have more than 7,000 employees, and we serve verticals such as banking, such as telecoms, such as services. But uh, the topic of today's presentation will be about building of an SME ecosystem. And I have a practical case study that I wanted to talk with you about. But before I do that, uh, I wanted to ask you all a question. Do you know who is the sponsor of today's talk? In other words, without whom we wouldn't necessarily be talking about SME ecosystems. And I don't mean that by Comarch or I don't mean Partner Hub, but the sponsor of actual of today's talk is the European Commission. You see, without the European Commission, we wouldn't be meeting here, right? Because sometimes innovation comes from truly unexpected places. It's like with this joke that we had a couple of years ago, right? Who led your digital transformation? Was it the CEO, CIO, or was it COVID-19? Still, innovation can come from regulators as well, not only from such phenomena as a pandemic. So this all started in 2019. And this is how you can see the 14th of September from the perspective of banks. They were essentially being broken into. They had to share their data. They had to open up their APIs to new competitors, to new partners. And what it led to was a significant change in how the business models related to APIs were evolving from that point on. Because we can see that this is the fundamental point where we decided that investing into an SME ecosystem would be something that would truly benefit the company. And the first chapter was about the proliferation of APIs. Because PSD2, it opened banks, it opened the marketplace in many ways. Banks were no longer thinking about just being the suppliers of banking products or services. Now they had much more to gain into providing like marketplaces, into providing single services, or complete processes in a bank as a service fashion. And we can see that there was this big shift in the industry, right? The first wave of digitalization was mostly about banks providing point solutions that were not necessarily talking together. And now, it's all about composable solutions. So being able to become what we now call a composable business. A composable business is a business where you not necessarily have those silos that are limiting you, but a business where you can easily create new capabilities using APIs by connecting features together. And for that, we thought, of course, what would you need to build such an ecosystem? A new kind of digital platform was needed. In our vision, it was connected, well, it was actually connecting three forces that are driving digitalization. So it was the bank's IT who wanted to take more and more responsibility. They were venturing into application development, becoming essentially fintech by themselves. Then we have fintech solutions that can be integrated into such ecosystems. And we have a part that is played by software vendors such as ourselves, who are able to contribute some pieces to this puzzle. And if you want to create such an ecosystem, what you do, what you need, is a digital platform. And we thought to ourselves, OK, we want to build a digital platform that would be, of course, using the newest technologies. right? It should be completely cloud native. It should be based on microservices, have automation in form of DevOps processes, containers, etc. So this was necessarily because those technologies, those architectural paradigms were driving innovation. But what it also needed to be, in our mind, was that it should be like an operating system. Now, every one of you has an operating system, at least one of you, in your phone. And uh, this role of the operating systems is to provide the general framework on which solutions, such as an ecosystem, can be built. So providing things like user interface, like file storage, communication, security, configuration, ability to access notifications, and most importantly, running business applications. This is what we thought would be the great foundation for an SME ecosystem. And we created such a platform, which would be the foundation of the, of, the, of the solution that we built on top of that. As you can see, it contains many elements that are truly basic building blocks, but are always necessary when you are introducing such a platform. Starting with identity and access management, ability to access the storage, ability to integrate with any other solutions. This was the idea that was driving us to build such a platform. 
And on this platform, we decided that we want to focus on providing some ready-made business features. Some of them were universal. Some of them were related strictly to SME corporate banking. Some of them were related to loan origination. And there was, of course, space to build many more. Now, what we constructed because of it was, uh, was an ecosystem that we created thanks to this foundation that we have laid. But the ecosystem, it was created in, I would say, more of an unusual way. Because we saw that SME clients, they have a lot of needs. They want to, they are just working like a big corporation, but have much fewer staff. So they always need to, for example, worry about uh, leasing, factoring. They want to access the, all of those kinds of products, but often it's very difficult for them to contact those multiple institutions. We wanted to harmonize that. And uh, we as Comar, there is also one more interesting fact that led, led us to the creation of an ecosystem. We as Comar are one of the leading vendors of ERP systems in Poland. As you can see, our market share is quite big. So we wanted to leverage that in order to be able to deliver solutions to SME clients, but in a little bit, a little different way. What we wanted is we wanted to change the perspective. Instead, for example, of a bank being in the center of an ecosystem, we wanted to create an ecosystem around the invoice. Because invoice is everywhere, right? This is the lifeblood of the economy. Every business that is working with other businesses, they are exchanging invoices, they're exchanging financial data, they are paying for those invoices. So we wanted to create an ecosystem around invoice. And to enrich this invoice with additional value-added services. What happened? is that we also wanted to cover multiple layers of needs of the clients, right? First of them, starting with the basics, of course, the system had to be secure. It had to provide clarity in making decisions, which often means aggregating data from multiple sources so that the clients would be able to see, for example, the whole financial situation. Next, it was utilization of different kinds of functionalities in order to fulfill clients' goals. So being able to take action using the information that we have gathered from all of those multiple sources. And finally, it was about proactive acting. So even if a client hasn't thought about the solution that he might need, the system would be able to intuitively show this solution as solving one of the problems that the client might not even be aware of at this particular point. So this is how we wanted to ensure client engagement, and this is how Apfino was born. This is the ecosystem that we have created. Now, the role of Apfino is that it was supposed to be this fully-fledged fintech that would uh, work, that would provide financial services to the users of the existing ERP systems that we've had. On top of that, of course, it had to be fully cloud-native, and it was, it was necessary to exchange all of this information between the ERP system and the platform to be able to offer those additional value-added services. Now, what we achieved was a completely two-way integration. First of all, thanks to the license that we acquired for the FinTech, right, we were able to aggregate data from banks, for example, in order to show the whole financial situation. But at the same time, by connecting the ERP systems with the FinTech ecosystem, we were able to create financial systems completely embedded inside of the ERP systems as well. So you no longer had to log into a separate platform, but straight from the ERP system, you could ask, for example, for financing, you could ask for factoring services, you could ask for any number of additional value-added services. But still, the invoice was at the center of attention. Invoice was at the center of this business case. So based on the invoice, you would have much more information about the client. For example, for factoring, based on multiple invoices, you would be know who is the receiving party, the sending party, and based on this, you would be able to better calculate the risk that is associated with the transaction. And the same goes for other aspects, like, for example, verification of a business partner, ability to aggregate data based on PSD2, etc. So an invoice essentially enabled this revolution that allow the clients to access their whole financial ecosystem, but with much less risk involved from the institutions that were, for example, granting credit. Now, we have many more integrations. We started this in 2021. Now we have many more integrations that are related to this platform itself, right? Of course, the platform is focused on Poland. That's why the integrations here are focused on Poland as well. We have integrations with credit bureaus, we have integrations with uh, financing institutions, with debt collectors, etc. So many services for the clients to choose from. Now, 
Affino right now. What it offers is convenient onboarding, right? Powerful dashboard to visualize all of the data so that the clients can make better decisions. Account aggregation, data from multiple sources, multiple banks at once. Then we have invoices that are, of course, the source of the information, the core of the platform. And from this data, from all of this data, we are able to uh, provide some additional hints to the clients. Like, for example, based on the invoice that was entered that was synchronized with VRP system, we know which ones are eligible for easy financing because, for example, of very low risk of the counterparty. And uh, what we wanted to do, right, since we are a software company, we wanted, uh, we are not, uh, let's say, expanding this business. We don't have such a big ERP clients base in other countries. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to productize it so that institutions in other countries can also benefit from the technology that we developed. And we decided to use this approach that we call buy plus build. Buy meaning that you can choose the predefined elements that are part of the platform that would accelerate your time to market, but at the same time with tools that you could use in order to expand the platform by yourself, using your own IT, using a partner that you have. This is all possible thanks to the architecture that allows for this embedding of business modules that uh, is based on microservices and micro frontends, has those ready-made DevOps processes for automation of IT tasks. And of course, it is complemented by consulting that we offer based on the experience that we've had. So necessarily, what we have created is an open platform, right, that has this core on top of which we have built those modules, right? Some of them are universal, like chat and inbox for communication. Some of them are specific to corporate and SME banking, like, for example, supporting uh, account aggregation services, supporting uh, different kinds of payments, factoring, etc. Some of them are related to loan origination processes, which you can use if you want to deploy such kind of a solution by yourself. But essentially, the idea here was that we are building the platform that would serve as this foundation, as this very good starting point for quick time to market, with the ability to be extended. Because what we focused on the most, I would say, uh, in terms of building some external tools, was developer experience. And this is something that is very important. As many institutions are adopting and growing their IT workforces, it's very important that uh, the programmers, the developers, have access to full documentation. They have access to training tasks so they can quickly be onboarded on the platform. That they have access to experts that are available for consultations. But also, I think it's one of the more important, most important things, they have access to source code. So even if we have those building blocks that can be deployed readily, we are not stripping the institutions that want to adopt our software from access to the source code so that they are able to engage their workforce even further so that they can extend the platform by themselves. And uh, based on that, uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted Comar Open Platform to become this backbone which clients could use to integrate with the legacy solutions that they have, but at the same time, they would be building those new capabilities on top of that, integrating other partners to build a truly functional ecosystem. And what were the key learnings that we have encountered along the way? First of all, uh, the regulations, right? Appification of banking industry will continue. We are sure of that. We see PSD3, we see PSR, we see open finance. All of those directives will mean that access to data will be democratized. All of the players will be affected, starting with clients who will have better services, better control over the data, right? This was something that was mentioned in the first panel. In Europe, we value data privacy very highly. So those regulations will also work on that. There will also be impact on other players, like third parties within the marketplace. Those who survive, they will grow stronger. Those who have good offering will, be, will become bigger on the market. And finally, of course, it will have impact on banks, who will be brought to more of this role of utility, right? Their services will not longer be offered under their brand. But still, there will be more and more usage of banking services, even if they are working underneath. Second thing that we have learned, right? Choosing the right technologies in architecture, this is a crucial point, right? Because we've been experimenting with different technologies over the years, and we found that uh, it is often the case that, for example, some technologies are hype, like microservices, right? You think about it, then you see, uh, if you implement one microservice, in the short term, it's not going to bring you any value. But in the long term, if you commit yourself to this kind of a transformation, and at some point, for those who have, who have seen Oppenheimer, you reach this critical mass, then you will have the ability to actually 
use those microservices in an agile way. When you have APIs exposed, then you will be able to connect them, and you will be surprised how many things you can create very easily thanks to the architecture that you have built, let's say, over two, three years. And the third part is about uh, partnerships. Uh, when building this ecosystem, right? Partnerships for us were crucial because we were not able to cover all areas of business. And if you want to partner with a tech company, there are also some things that you need to consider, right? Some tech companies will offer you a platform for application deployment. Some companies will offer you uh, some tools to build applications. Some will offer you some pre-packaged solution that you can either deploy or leave. But when creating an ecosystem, you need all three. Basically, you need to concentrate on all of those areas you want, if, you want to create, if you want to create an ecosystem successfully. And uh, let me tell you, we've gained a lot of experience when it comes to working with clients, how we can productize the solutions. So if you want to talk, of us, uh, talk to us, we are right here at the booth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maciej. Please also think about questions for the panel discussion. And next presentation, Katarin Kauzli, Partner Hub. You're welcome. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Katarin Kauzli. Uh, I am a co-founder of Partner Hub. I'm very happy to be with you here today. Just a couple of words about Partner Hub, because after that, I won't be talking about Partner Hub, but all about ecosystems. So Partner Hub enables banks and financial service providers to orchestrate and participate in open finance and open data ecosystems by integrating financial services and the invoicing. Uh, it's a little bit high level, but how we do it, we support the following use cases. So we have a white label SME invoicing uh, technology, which can be embedded into online or mobile banking. This means that you can package together an online invoicing solution and all the banking features that you uh, want to do, and you can do it under your own brand. Uh, we can uh, provide is invoice presentment services for retail and SME customers as a technology, and also the integration of invoicing and request to pay and the technical layer to flexibly manage invoice data. I'm very happy that uh, Maciej uh, also mentioned the use case of invoicing because we also believe that invoicing is like the you know, fireplace where you need to start and where you need to start thinking about your customers and your use cases. So you know, if you hear the invoice, if you hear the word invoice, all the regulations are coming, you need to start thinking about the use cases that are related to invoices. Uh, I'm sure you have uh, all heard like the buzzwords that SMEs have been underserved by banks, but I also think that is uh, interesting to see some figures what this actually means. Uh, according to a couple of studies, 47% of SMEs believe that their bank does not really try to understand their challenges and needs. Uh, this also translates to the excess of finance. Uh, only 14% uh, of total SME financing needs are met uh, globally. So if you think of it as an opportunity, this is a huge uh, opportunity to give more financing for SMEs. And uh, we made a study and an estimation, so just by using invoicing, we think that you can easily double this number. So just uh, think about what would happen if you could double your SME financing volumes, which means doubling your SME financing revenues. And uh, what does uh, the future imply? Uh, is that uh, the world is changing. Uh, technology enables new use cases. You could see the uh, use case about uh, uh, the Comarch ecosystem, setting up the Comarch ecosystems. And uh, the setting up of ecosystems is enabled by you know, connecting solutions, connecting technologies together. And uh, it is estimated that 70% of the economic uh, output uh, growth will be created by ecosystems in the future. So this is something that you also need to start thinking about. And SMEs 
are also best served with SME ecosystems. So SME ecosystems will also emerge, and banks uh, or you can uh, think about you know, how you want to uh, be present in this playground. So SMEs will expect a fully integrated platform. You could see a technology platform in the Machai's presentation also, where you don't only uh, access, have access uh, to financial services and products, but all the services uh, they need to run their businesses. So what are these priorities? Growing the business, talent acquisition, supply chain management, management cash flow and taking care of administrative tasks. What is important, that the SMEs really uh, want to have it, more than 50% of SME customers said in a study that they would like to have to an access uh, to such a platform because they feel that it would really uh, make their life easier. 22% uh, uh, of SMEs thought that they would be uh, willing to have access uh, to such a pl platform through a bank, so I think this is a good sign. But what is an even better sign that 70% said that they would actually pay for it. Uh, so, you know, I think it's coming. It's not today, not tomorrow, but you need to start thinking about it. And how banks can... Uh, uh, be, part, be part of such ecosystems, they can be either uh, ecosystem orchestrators or if they provide uh, embedded finance services, they can be participants in such ecosystems. But yeah, let's go back to the other fireplace, to the definition, what is a business ecosystem? A business ecosystem uh, definition, there are two definitions here, is a purposeful business arrangement between two or more entities to create uh, and share collective value for a common set of customers. Another definition is that a complex and connected community of interacting uh, digital and physical business organisms. So what these uh, uh, definitions mean, that actually serving the customer will not be along the value propositions of separate companies, but around the whole needs or whole set of needs uh, for uh, the customer. And I am referring back to the previous presentation again, you collect a set of businesses and you integrate uh, with those businesses. So that is how an ecosystem works. Uh, in the ecosystem, you can have an orchestrator and you can have participants. In the previous example, Comarch is the uh, orchestrator and all the other businesses are the, uh, are the participants of the ecosystem. And uh, it will be a food for thought what to do with it. Uh, when we are talking about ecosystems, uh, it will be also important that you, know, you can present your brand to your customers. So you should own the customers, and this will define, or this will be a decisive fact, uh, what role you want to play in an ecosystem. It will be also important that you know, ecosystems will coexist with each other, and you will need to choose how to play uh, within each ecosystem. Uh, and uh, what are what kind of ecosystems they are? There are closed and open ecosystems. Currently, we are seeing uh, more examples of closed ecosystems because where we are now today is that uh, there is an ecosystem orchestrator. You can think about Booking.com if you want to book. I don't know. Uh, uh, a hotel somewhere, then you can book it on booking.com, but in the same platform you can buy your uh, airplane ticket and you can arrange for a taxi when you arrive. So it's like, you know, uh, the whole thing is arranged uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the platform for your needs. But the thing is that there is a single ecosystem orchestrator. In this example, Booking.com is the orchestrator, but all other services are integrated to uh, Booking.com's APIs. So it's, you know, they are pushing that, okay, they are looking for the partners, they are uh, 
publishing their APIs, and all the partners need to integrate uh, to them. Uh, this implies the fact that uh, these ecosystems are limited in size because the number of integrations that you can carry out uh, are limited because all the integrations are very costly. But these are the ecosystems that, you know, that are enabled today and that are present today in our lives. What will change in the future is that uh, open, net, open ecosystems will emerge, but this will also uh, need some regulation and some you know, regulation slash uh, consensus over, over data structures and how to connect with each other. So in open ecosystems, there will be open protocols, and these protocols, if uh, business participants impl implement these uh, protocols, then no separate integrations will be needed. This will imply that everyone can connect to everyone. So for example, if I am a booking.com customer for the hotel, uh, I don't know, for the hotel uh, reservation, and I am booking my airplane ticket on Kiwi.com, I can connect the two things together, and I will be able to, I don't know, I will be able to arrange a taxi from, I don't know, booking.com uh, and, and connect it to the Kiwi.com platform. So, and I will be able to get a receipt, I don't know, from a third platform. So this would be the implication that if everyone can talk to everyone, then the whole world basically opens up. Uh, this, uh, this figure is just a good uh, representation how ecosystems are evolving. Uh, also, much I mentioned the fact that you know, we are coming from open banking, we are going to open finance, where not only payments uh, are opened up and payments interfaces are opened up in a bank, but all financial products will be available uh, for use for, for third parties. And we are going to an open ecosystem where uh, people or companies can share their data related to energy, telecom, government data, and so on, and so on. So this is how ecosystems will grow in functionality and also richness for the services for the customers, be that uh, consumers or business customers. Uh, I uh, collected a couple of ecosystems uh, that are present today in the banking world. So, uh, for example, Starling Bank uh, provides uh, pension services, insurance services, also, they also provide invoicing, they provide uh, loyalty services. So, these are, this is a closed ecosystem where Starling Bank uh, is an ecosystem orchestrator. Another uh, example is one of my favorites, is ICICI Bank from India. They also provide uh, finance and accounting services through Zoho, also invoicing services for Zoho. They also integrated online marketplace players, office management, HR solutions. So they are really trying to collect all, uh, all uh, services that an SME would need. So this is also, an, but it is not open yet, so this is a closed ecosystem. And, uh, and finally, the other end, when the bank acts not as an ecosystem orchestrator, but an embedded uh, finance provider, I brought the example of BBVA, where they publish their APIs, all third parties, fintechs, uh, other service providers can uh, use their APIs, consume their APIs, and, uh, and uh, use, it, uh, use the banking services embedded into their own solutions. Uh, and finally, the example for the open, open ecosystems, uh, India is a, is a pioneer on building an open uh, public digital infrastructure. So they put together an open ecosystem based on open protocols when there is an identity layer, a payment layer, also 
uh, text data can be uh, shared uh, with third parties through account aggregators, and now they put together uh, a, uh, a layer for credit credit access and also uh, for e-commerce. So this is where India is already there. I think the same approach will come uh, in other countries as well, because the EU has all, also the same uh, approach with the e-identity layer, with the invoicing regulation, the PSD3 uh, regulations. So I think everyone and the world will head into this direction. I think the conclusion is that uh, you know, ecosystems are coming. You need to start to think about how you will be part of these emerging ecosystems. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katalin. And uh, now, um, yeah, Katalin, please be back on the stage. I invite Maciej. Um, Nelson Woodson, CEO and co-founder at Ascada, and Filip Jaskua, head of SME uh, at Santander Bank Polska. Please welcome on the stage. Jesteśmy tak w kadrze, tak? So yeah, now we know how we should be seated. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, let me start this panel discussion for, um, from the question to you, Filip. As you are the only representative of the bank in that panel. So please share with us what is your experience uh, in building SME ecosystems in Santander Bank Polska, because uh, uh, you are the bank who has really a lot of value added services for SMEs. Uh, you cooperate with the partners with that for that as well. So tell us how you do it. Yes, yes, we do. Um, I'm not sure how much time do we have because I have like a, a lot of stories of a failures that we have made building the, what we don't call it yet, yet ecosystem for the SMEs because um, it's very difficult. You know, if, you, if we talk about the experience we have, it's like, of course we know what our customer need. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We have researched them, surveyed them. They told us what their need. But the problem is that you also need to use them for a design of the solution. And that's not even uh, halfway through, you know? Uh, because even if you use them to design, you need to actually practically know and understand when they need a particular service or product of your partner. And it is still not yet a finished project. Mm -hmm. Then, if you already have a couple of partners, you need to be very powerful of communicating to your customers that you have a services that are not banking solutions. Mm -hmm. Because normally what the customer do, the banking customer do, is like they go into the website or internet banking or mobile banking, and they do transfers, they open deposits, uh, they exchange uh, uh, affixes, uh, they take loan, but they never do accounting, they never issue an invoice there, they don't think the bank is actually provider of such solutions. So if you have advisors, use them, because they actually can actually even triple the number of customers they will start to use the solution. So I believe there's, there's no particular good example of a bank, even myself, the Santander, of a good properly working ecosystem that giving profits to the bank. Okay, you, you profit with the NPS, that will help you with the acquisition, but there's no revenue out of that yet. So someone that will get it right would be like a, a Tesla of a banking and will benefit very much of, uh, of having such ecosystem. So I believe um, if you even have a number of customers that are already really well communicated, you, if, you, if you have like a well, perfectly designed uh, process of getting this um, solution to the customer, you need to also have a f fully powerful CRM that will actually provide the solution in the right time, in the right mm -hmm. place, in your app or web. And then also you need to ver very much focus on the customer consent. Mm -hmm. 
because mm -hmm. if you don't have a consent, you cannot offer them anything. And that is actually the biggest challenge I think the banks have right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I, uh, let's start the discussion, yes, about the, how the ecosystems could look like for SMEs. I really fancy and like the idea that you much presented and Katar and you continue uh, on the um, starting the ecosystem from the e invoicing functionality. So maybe this is, this is the answer. So the ecosystem should start from the business services, as you, Philip, said that the customers do not expect them from the banks. But the customers, you know, are logging into the online and mobile banking to do the transaction because banks then teach to do so. And if you really look, because we discussed during this during the networking yesterday here, if we start, if we think on where the need for the finance uh, is happening, what is the event for the need, for example, for a factoring, is actually the issue, the invoice. So the process starts and the need arises when the invoice is issued, not step further so the customer should think uh, and uh, to which factor I should apply and then you know and then it could be not you and then this is gap between when I need this invoice the event the moment is when I issue it and then the factor whom I choose to apply because I also mentioned that here in Poland we have 10 factors offering micro factoring fully online plus two partial lines so 12 providers, which I will not rem remember as an SME really by heart and will not check all 12 offers. So I will just remember one, two maybe, and check the offers. And if, it was, if the process starts not from invoicing and it is not embedded into my existing you know, ecosystem or invoicing platform, this is no way that another digital platform for anything, for any digital banking or non-banking services has, you know, uh, has a chance to be successful because there's becoming too many of them and SMEs don't have time to check all the offers on the market. So what, what actually all of you, banks and tech companies, should do to create these ecosystems, to think it from the side of an SME customer and from your example, to start this ecosystem from the e invoicing tool, which is becoming obligatory in the European Union countries anyway. So this is a must have for business customers. What should be done? Yeah. What are the steps from what to start? I think it all starts with the user experience, because this is something that big tech companies have already mastered, companies like uh, Facebook, companies uh, like uh, Google, and like Booking even, right? Mm -hmm. The user experience is something that actually drives the users to use the service, right? So like Philip said, if they don't know about the service, they will yeah. certainly not use it. So it's about uh, providing information that such a capability is, uh, is available at a time that is uh, opportune for the client. So, for example, if the client is maybe uh, his finances are low, right, his liquidity is mm -hmm. uh, subpar, then uh, the bank may say, okay, but here, you have registered several invoices with us. Maybe you would like to discount them to improve your liquidity, right? So it's about providing an experience that would be there for a SME client that instead of just you know, showing, okay, this is the dashboard, these are the products, you can apply for them, there are dozens from which you can choose. Instead, it will be more like uh, suggesting solutions. So mm -hmm. a client, uh, for example, the system could detect that uh, a counterparty right, has been paying late for the last three months. Mm -hmm. And based on this, the system could suggest, okay, maybe you should uh, use, the, 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 use the invoice discounting to improve your liquidity. Maybe you should do something about uh, the counterparty. Maybe you should remind him about the, uh, the debts that he has, right? Or maybe you should use a, a debt collection agency in order to get at least some of the money back, right? It's about uh, providing this, uh, this kind of experience that will actually allow uh, that will allow the users to access the services so that they will gravitate towards those right mm -hmm. it's not about offering a solution okay for this we are offering you this you have to pay that much and go away it's rather okay there is a problem that we can solve right and for that you actually need an institution of trust. And I think banks are naturally such institutions, right? Because they have been so for centuries. And if a bank, for example, were to suggest a, a solution to a company, the company would be much more likely to accept it. 
instead of, for example, having to do like all of the research by mm -hmm. themselves, right? Yeah, like like yeah. you said, right? Dozen companies, how to compare them, right? This is too much complexity. Mm -hmm. An SME business owner doesn't have time for that, yeah. right? So it's about simplicity and user experience in my mm -hmm. view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from Whatever. my side, yeah, from my side, I agree with the user experience. I would add the word seamless. So, mm -hmm. you know, definitely the seamless and the accessibility of the product. So for SMEs, I think not the pricing is mm -hmm. important, but, you know, the opportunity is there. So, yeah, I am issuing the invoice. I want to finance it right now. I don't care about really the price. Mm -hmm. I just want to get the money first. Mm -hmm. At least I think a lot of SMEs are not... Uh, price sensitive mm -hmm. but if they have the product they yeah. you know they will use it and they can use it so yeah product should be there in the ecosystem and the integrations are important because you know if you have to log in into you know two separate platforms then mm -hmm. then it's yeah. over then you won't necessarily do it in this in that ecosystem so mm -hmm. i think uh, this is important and from the bank's side the orchestration part so yeah how you choose your uh, partners mm -hmm. how you can cooperate with those partners and what will be the rules for you know playing together mm -hmm. so that everyone is you know happy in the end mm -hmm. um some things i'd add to that um Ecosystem inherently means one party doesn't want to do everything, right? That, you know, yes. that, that's the basic point of this, right? I, I want to do one bit and you want to do another bit and they want to do another bit. For that to operate successfully, um, data standards, you know, uh, you, we're still a long way off, but they're evolving and developing. And I think open banking and building on open banking as a data standard for sharing payment instructions, et cetera, et cetera, could become a critical part of building these ecosystems. Um, I, I'm loath to say that I think the banks need to take responsibility for this, okay? I, I don't think the banks need to take responsibility for this, but they do need to be able to expose and make data open so that... Um, when there's a customer need, it is simple to fulfill, and it isn't necessarily the bank's obligation mm -hmm. to fulfill it. So um, an invoice or invoice discounting is a reasonable example of this. I, I'm going to speak from a UK perspective, that's all, or Western Europe, that's pre prevalently where we operate currently. We all use accounting systems. Okay, for our invoicing. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be amazing if the accounting system and my banking system were better integrated. Um, but if I wanted to do in invoice discounting, I'd really want my accounting system to say, hey, there's an opportunity here for you to borrow some money against this invoice that you've just raised. And it might be the bank that I bank with that's prepared to do that, but it might well be a very, very specialist lender who deeply understands my business, the kind of clients that mm. I operate with, and the risk profile that doing some sort of lending against that criteria is. So for me, I think um, we shouldn't... What we shouldn't do is push it on any one party to build the ecosystem. What we should try to do is work together to build open data standards so that uh, inherently those that want to play and fill little gaps in a supply chain finance or any other aspect of, of running a business can step in and the data is available mm -hmm. in a secure way, in a controlled way to allow these ecosystem plays to actually exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not, not much to add, actually. <laughs> uh, I would agree with everything you said here. Um, I would add maybe two things. Uh, the, fir the first will be the, the real partnership in between the banks and the, the, the partners, mm -hmm. the fintechs, the startups. And I mean, often banks actually try to integrate and forget. That will be the, mm -hmm. the regular strategy. So, and they, they think they will gain some revenues out mm -hmm. of that. So actually, we would need focus more on helping fintechs and startups to understand how complex banking business is and how to fit in with the service or solution they have for the customers. That would be the first thing. And the second thing I will be, uh, there will be, if someone will ask me how the mobile banking should look like, I would say I would revert it. I would say the banking is a commodity. So we like a, we are like a, I don't know, and and energy in a socket. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I would say the first and the most important thing on the mobile banking app should be 
button, issue an invoice. That's the start uh, for the banks. And no one has it on the market. At yes. least I don't yes. know anyone of having it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So business services and then the banking services are underneath. We, yeah. we're, um, interestingly, we're seeing a trend developing in the UK that as data is being shared, there are banks that, that, that their aspiration now is that you don't need to use their interface because your accounting system and your HR system and your payroll system will drive the payments that run your business. And actually, online banking is there for you to check stuff, and it might be there to authorize stuff, but all of those transactions are being originated from external systems. And the bank's role is smaller, not greater. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I think, right, this is the proliferation again of embedded finance, right? Yeah. Banks are providing the services the clients don't know the, the brand of the bank that is providing those services, but the service is there and the revenue is there. I think this is the important part, right? Yeah, I think fundamentally a, a bank is a regulated entity with the authorization and rights to do certain types of transactions. This is what they should double down on and making those transactions available to as wide an audience as possible is how you grow that. Trying to be an accounting system or an HR system or a payroll system is a different type of business, right? I, yeah. I, 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 you know, concentrate, do it's the things you do model. really well and yeah. you are uniquely positioned to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like the turning the lemons of PSD2 into lemonade, right? right. <laughs> yeah, but I think there can be different strategies around it because, you know, a bank does not want to be necessarily unseen. It still wants to keep the customer contact and wants to own the customer. So some banks you know, will have a strategy to provide only embedded services, but some banks want to go out and build an ecosystem. So it's, and there is no good answer, and there is no good answer you know, for, for even within the bank for specific segments or specific services. So in that respect, I think the word, fortunately or unfortunately, will be a, a little bit more difficult because you will have more choices mm -hmm. and you need to think about what you will choose. Mm -hmm. I, think, mm -hmm. I think that's really true. Um, I think it's a market by market play. So um, uh, like all markets, you've got to understand what the customer need is and it isn't the same everywhere. You, you can hop across a border and see a very different customer need and you've got to make a decision as to whether you are the right organization to fulfill that need or you need to work with partners to fulfill that need. There definitely isn't a one size fits all. Um, as we see uh, data interconnectivity being maturing, particularly in Western Europe, we're seeing um, the bank's roles shrink and concentrate on the bit they do and third parties are coming in mm -hmm. and building around the ecosystems. But that doesn't mean that's the right play here. Uh, if that maturity isn't here, then the banks need to step in in order to provide the interconnectivity and ecosystem infrastructure. I think the partnerships are a necessity now. So there is no way you can fulfill the customer needs without, I mean, not partnering and not cooperating. This is not a situation anymore. And your examples actually were that when the banks are the orchestrators of the, of the ecosystems, what do you consider is the best strategy or maybe what are the pros and cons for being an operator uh, or orchestrator or builder of the ecosystem and the main player on that? Or maybe participate, participation in other ecosystems or maybe doing nothing at the moment and wait actually to the open data and this open interoperable ecosystems happen, which will be another story and another business model, right? Yeah, so in our example, or what we, we actually did two such projects in Hungary that you are missing with OTP Bank and the Hungarian bank holding, and we exactly provide this opportunity for everyone all over the world to, you know, to set up your own invoicing service. In this respect, uh, you know, the bank is uh, developing a product for themselves, so it's not, not a classical, I mm -hmm. would say, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem play because they are doing it, you know, under their own brand. They don't partner with us as like a third party provider, but they're doing themselves in-house. But 
uh, both the banks and the, that we have seen had the vision to create an ecosystem, starting with these, you know, packaging together financial administration services, but they were also were thinking about ERP connections, uh, like choosing an accountant, I don't know, um, when you are starting your enterprise, what are the services that you need? So uh, with one of our banking customers, we see this, that, you know, they already build the invoicing bit and they are starting to tap into other services. So, um, you know, so this is what we have seen. And this, this is also, yeah, it's like more of a little baby, but it's coming and the banks start realizing that they need to do something if they want to keep their customers. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yep. Because this is becoming the differentiator, actually, the, on the market, yes. Because when we have in the region 80% of the banks uh, digitalized or the traditional banking services are available in all online banking applications, at least in mobile banking class, but in all online banking, yes, like, so how the customer should choose the bank, which, how, how to choose if the, all the traditional banking fun functionality is available uh, already in the online banking. So, and this value added services and uh, partnership, partner services, when the SMEs especially do not actually need to search for another provider of this and this and that. This is what they appreciate, and this is becoming what is what differentiates bank uh, uh, at the moment. And and this is a case I can prove it by myself. Being an SME, yes, I did choose a bank because they provided invoicing and online accounting, except banking services. Yeah, well, and this is what I said at the very beginning. Yes. Now, we have this value-added services, and they are helping us with mm -hmm. the acquisition of the customer. The solutions itself, they are not heavily utilized, used by the customers, but they at least uh, help us to acquire customers. So we have done some service analysis, and we know that, and also increases the MPS. But I'm still not sure if the banks should be the orchestrator of the uh, ecosystem. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. If, if someone does it right, as I said, Tesla, bank <laughs> Tesla. Uh, but I think more and more thing about a bank being a, a part of the ecosystem, mm -hmm. not maybe an orchestrator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because being an orchestrator essentially is very difficult, right? You have a lot of risks related to integration with different partners, but at the same time, the control over those partners, right? It's, it's not that great, right? You, they are still like a separate entities. They may go their own ways at some point. So yeah, this is, this is definitely a, a, a risky part. But like you said, right, this being a kind of a halo service that will attract the, the clients your way. Yeah, I, uh, I was thinking about being orchestrator like 10 years ago, five years ago, because, you know, bank are trusted entities. So people trust banks. So I thought, OK, we, customer trust us, so let's try to build an ecosystem. But it tends that after 10 years of be, you know, trying to do it, we, we're still making failures and errors and, mm -hmm. and trying once again, once again, but maybe it's not right way to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, thinking about what you are saying is that, uh, you know, the opening up of the data and standardizing the data will help in this because in this respect, the bank will not be solely responsible for be building a good ecosystem. It can participate or equally participate the ecosystem because like this orchestrator and participant is more true like for the uh, closed ecosystems. If you open up the ecosystems, the role mm -hmm. will definitely change because you know, I can choose whatever accounting service provider, whatever invoicing service provider, whatever bank, whatever payroll solution, whatever e-commerce solution. So yeah, it will be a different uh, landscape. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, but the, this is the good news, the bad news that it will still take time because those data standards are not there yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we've got some of them. Um, so open banking is definitely a push in the right direction, but it's quite limited in its scope at this moment. For the sort of stuff we're talking about here, you'd want to see an awful lot more data added to that. But, you know, to go to a bank, uh, the regulator is mandating uh, across Europe that, that open banking needs to be implemented. And if we broaden the scope of some of those actions and, in, and force those to be implemented as well, I think you'll find the ecosystem will do it itself, right? Accounting systems and HR systems 
systems will go, well, we're going to link into the bank now. And that's better for the bank, right? I, you know, I'm talking to bankers here, and they'll all roll their eyes going, listen, it's hard enough banking SMEs, right? This isn't, this isn't the super most profitable part of my business. And, and putting more pressure on them to do more things for those organizations, you're going to be a lot of resistance. But providing ways of, of sharing data um, and allowing that ecosystem to be created around them, they're still, you know, they're, they're the licensed entity that holds the money. They don't be scared about an ecosystem. They're not coming to take that stuff away from you. You, as a bank, play a critical role in the financial system, transaction monitoring, trans movement of money, regulated entity, super, super important. But there's a whole load of other things that SMEs need and being open and being a for allowing them to act access that data in simple formats, in a simple, secure way, will allow ecosystems mm -hmm. to really thrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there is one thing that Kathleen mentioned in her presentations about BBVA, being the ban of like, this very good catalog of APIs, right? This is something that will actually allow the banks to become the, the go-to bank for integration, right? This is developer experience, because even if you're exposing an API, if the regulator asks you politely to expose the API, uh, the developers still may not know how to consume it, right? How to connect to your bank. And developer experience, like providing those resources, those examples on how to connect, how to use this API, this is something that can really turn the needle in your favor, right? So that uh, this will be actually the bank that is most integrated with, thanks, for mm -hmm. example, to, this, uh, to those great resources that it offers to, to outside developers so that they connect it, they can build ecosystems around it. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree with you. Uh, but you know, this is again uh, a capability that is a non-core banking capability. Yeah. So there will be a lot of effort that needs to be put into it, so that banks can differentiate uh, themselves from each other in in this respect. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. But do you think that these open uh, ecosystems in the future? I don't know whether there is a nearest future or it will take, uh, I don't know, five, ten years to come to that. But if we think uh, on the, these examples of the closed ecosystems, as you, Katalin, brought in your presentation, and then versus the, the one from India with the open uh, ecosystems and the ones that we expect to have as well, if we think on that, then we should uh, say that now this is a good moment for the banks to create closed ecosystems because this is... This is data, which is everything about customers. If you think about that, if a bank as a group has banking, transactional banking, of course, has e-invoicing, has accounting in the ecosystem, maybe have some e-shops, etc. So it means that actually the bank, within all the services it provides, it has on the customer like the full data. The full data, what you can have for a business customers, you have it. And now the questions are: right. Do you do you use it in a proper way to do a really personalized offer? And the answer today for the region is no. Is no because even having all these data gathered, which is an incredible, nobody on the market has it. Nobody, none, any other fintech will never have it. The power of the banks is is that they have customers and they have this customer data and which they kind of should use it, but they don't. And given an example like uh, uh, having, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the, all the data about SMEs, then you can really target with the offer. You should know and predict what is the real need. And this is about data. Not even NRM is capable physically to do it, but the data. Why it's not happening? Because it, it, it should be a really gold for the banks right now. You know, it's actually funny because you have companies that are using data very effectively for marketing, uh, like TikTok, like Instagram, right? They are suggesting you videos, you are spending hours like watching cats, etc., right? Mm -hmm. And this happens because those are really unregulated monopolies, mm -hmm. right? They have access to all of the data. The users are signing like a consent to all of the terms and conditions because they want to access the feature, right? And they are not even reading those. And with banks, it's difficult, right? Because of the regulations, the data privacy, etc. Uh, it's not that easy to use the data without users' consent. I think right, yeah, this is my view on that, right? You know, it's yeah, impossible. But, uh, <laughs> it's impossible. Yeah, but yeah. I'm, for example, I, uh, I'm not asked even uh, from the bank side for any consent recently. I mean, like, really. Why? Yeah, but 
even I'm ready to give a consent. Yeah, but uh, even if so, let's uh, let's assume that you have the consent, right? Then the situation is that within the bank, the data are sitting in different systems. So first, they need to be you know put together, consolidated, and standardized, and then you can you know start mm -hmm. analyzing it and. Besides the consent part, I see this is a you know big problem. This will be you know eased out by system providers such as mm -hmm. SCADA. So yeah, so we are going that way. But you know that those projects require you know a lot of lot of lot mm -hmm. of resources. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is happening. It is happening. Not much, but it is happening. Um, I think uh, Catalina's point is absolutely right. Uh, most banks probably in this room uh, have very fractured data sets that are time consuming and expensive enough just to do their reporting on, let alone try to find opportunities to make more money with those data sets. Um, it, it takes a completely different mindset and way of thinking um, in order to, to really leverage data in that way. And we, we have... Um, we have a, a, a UK client, a UK business, uh, in fact, the UK's fastest growing business who happens to be a bank that does SME banking, uh, which is a pretty cool thing to say at a conference like this. So it is absolutely possible. And I'll quickly run you through a very, very short use case. Um, they came to us wanting to build a current account for SMEs. Uh, they see a big challenge in the UK. It might be one that's reflected here. If you're a very, very small business, you're well served by the banking system because it's essentially a personal account with a business name at the top, right? And if you're a very big corporation with four or 500 people, you're fairly well served. There's big corporate banking platforms. But anyone in between is very, very poorly served. If you've got a finance team of four or five people actually trying to get a banking system that isn't a giant corporate one so that somebody in accounts can set up payments and somebody else can authorize them is really, really difficult. And it was the first challenge they set out to do. As part of that, they recognized that SMEs often have good liquidity, not loads, but they have good liquidity. So they provide a little savings wallet inside this account that earn interest. So we've got a current account here, it's got an overdraft on it, and it's got a savings wallet inside it. And their take up on this product was incredibly good. And they could see people opening these accounts, and it feels really great, but they're not using the accounts for transactions. And when they spotted this, they saw that the, the piece that the SMEs wanted in this case was the savings wallet. They wanted somewhere, a bank, to keep their cash and earn interest, but still have the ability to quickly draw on that liquidity if they needed it. And as soon as they did that, spotted that, they pivoted into launching a deposit account for, for those customers and absolutely exploded. Absolutely exploded. And now what they're doing is working on launching three, six, and nine-month bonds for these customers so that they can lock and lend those funds out to to the other side of their balance sheet, but offer those customers better returns. So it is possible, it can be done, but it requires a very different way of thinking from perhaps traditional banking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. It sounds like a new bank from Brazil, same case, yeah? <laughs> Similar, yeah. Uh, you've asked about those, uh, the, the, the vast majority of data that we use and to provide different offers to the customers, but. You know, you need to remember that the banking is a simple business. Like we do deposits and loans <laughs> and some transactions, and we make money out of it. So what we do, we actually analyze loads of data just to offer a loan. Yes. That's our main purpose. Yes. And that is why we are not yet are really deeply interested in getting into the data that will allow us to help customers with their daily business, like mm -hmm. accounting yeah, or but whatever. I think offering a loan in the very right moment, uh, the customer um, can need it, or offering a factoring at the very right moment. I mean, not calling nine in the morning and, and asking, you know, do you need uh, a loan or factoring to a semi customer? This doesn't work. Like, But when you offer it in the very right moment, this works. And this is all about data. So this is this this is con context and yeah. uh, context. Uh, the right Correct. time and place to, to do it. And this is very actually difficult to do it because we have run several uh, analysis and models mm -hmm. just to build this propensity model for and you know for e accounting or e invoicing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not easy. It's yeah. like the, the conversion rate yeah. is really small yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think the this is where these you know other services could provide a trigger for the right moment. 
They should. Right. They should. Yeah, I think that's exactly the idea of the ecosystem, right? So being able to share that data allows other organizations mm -hmm. to, to leverage that and, and create opportunities mm -hmm. and spot those things that banks might not. I think um, the, the phrase that we've always used is that um, banks are incredibly data rich, but they are very information poor. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> All right. Do we have some questions uh, in the room? Nobody, really. All right. Seems then, like we have covered everything. Yes. It's then, like, then when the, is the dinner, right? The final, yes, the final question for the for the panel will be as the the following. I guess this is all about partnerships, right? So the ecosystems and uh, deliver, delivering any services. Right now, it's all about partnership. What is, in your opinion, um, um, the tips or um, what banks and partners should do to make this partnership successful. Because I do hear um, some you know, voices that after the implementations and all the effort done, the partnerships are not so successful as each of the parties wanting that to be. So what are your recommendations? How the, such partnerships in the area of SME banking could be more successful? I touched that at uh, the very beginning. And I think it's about the partnership is about is about the relationship. Mm -hmm. So you, you cannot, you know, develop, implement, and forget. You need to cooperate. Mm -hmm. And in out of many different solutions that we have provided, I think that one is a good example of a, go a good cooperation. It's like the e-accounting solution that we have for our customers. It's like 10% of our database actually mm -hmm. have integrated the accounting of. In fact, actually, the company mm -hmm. that is com coming from Krakow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, hello, in fact. <laughs> um, and it's, you need to communicate on a, I don't know, maybe not the daily basis, but you, you need to work mm -hmm. on the solutions, improve, improve the way the customer logs into the uh, solution, improve the quality of the solution itself, then also use the partner for for example, education of the customers, because in Poland, like, you know, taxation is like a madness. No one knows how to do it. So, in fact, it's actually a provider of a, of a, of a, of a, of a educational uh, mm -hmm. webinars um, or, or mm -hmm. content that we provide to the customers. And they also actually uh, assist our customers during the opening a company. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So they are actually they are, they are there to, to help customers to, to open their first company. And I believe that that kind of a cooperation is a real partnership. Yeah. On the other hand, I have like a solution which is called eHealth. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have done some integration. We provided this, let's say, eHealth solution to the customers, but no one cares. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Both sides. Yeah. So, and there is no conversion because the communication mm -hmm. is poor. The the solution is not you know uh, developed. Is not changed. The customer are actually not. Uh, asked about uh, the way they, they, they understand the product and they, they, if they like it or not. So the partnerships about the relationship and, uh, and communication and uh, constant improvement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think uh, like all relationships, it's openness, it's trust and transparency. Um, and, and both both sides of the table should be able to express clearly what they want to get out of it. Mm -hmm. okay, we're, we're both going yes. to invest in this. My hope is I'm going to get this. What are your hopes that you're going to get out of that? How are we going to get back around this table and revisit that if either one of us isn't getting what we want out of this? And how do we work together to make sure that mutually we're both benefiting? Mm -hmm. All relationships work like that. All partnerships. I don't think it's got. I don't think banking has anything special or magical about it uh, than any other business in that capacity. Um, our the greatest partners that we work with. It, it's an incredibly clear, transparent relationship where we're very clear about what we expect to do and get from this. Mm -hmm. They're very clear about what they expect to do and get from it as well. And we try to make sure they achieve their goals and they try to make sure we achieve ours. I think all partnerships built on that will be successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, like not relying on single partnerships in one area would also be a success factor because if you, you know, I can only use this solution or mm -hmm. that solution, 
uh, I won't necessarily use that. Mm -hmm. But you know, if I can, if you know, the ecosystem can cover 50, 60 percent market share on a single use case, then it would definitely have the probability of using mm -hmm. one of the services. So I think like not relying on a single mm -hmm. partner, um, yeah, that would be that would be an mm -hmm. um, important thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think this all comes down to having like a common business case, right? Yeah. If you want to partner up, both of you should uh, invest into the relationship basing on, on numbers, right? So for example, let's say we'll cover this much of the market, out of this we'll have this much profit. And uh, this is what will bring the, the cooperation together, right? This is what will uh, allow the cooperation to be successful so that everybody knows what they are getting out of it. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because you don't do the partnership for the other sake, yeah. but yeah. For, a, or for your own, yes. you know, interest. Yes. yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the panel. Philip, Nelson, Katalin, and Martin. Thank, Thank you, you very Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you. And we are back in one hour. We have a lunch break. Thank you. <laughs> this year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. Conference and SME Banking Awards on 29th and 30th of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using PartnerHub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. PartnerHub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for Beyond Banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. Partner Hub, your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXeed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper-intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements, and workflow management, AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, 
unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings. This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. Conference and SME Banking Awards on 29th and 30th of November.
Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using PartnerHub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. PartnerHub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for Beyond Banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. Partner Hub, your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXeed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements and workflow management, AI powered smart forms, straight through processing, unified access across downstream applications and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
This year, we invite you to Kraków. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your beyond banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using PartnerHub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive beyond banking offer. PartnerHub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for beyond banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. Partner Hub, your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXeed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omnichannel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper-intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements, and workflow management, AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. Conference and SME Banking Awards on 29th and 30th of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using Partner Hub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. Partner Hub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for beyond banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. 
For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. Partner Hub, your partner for beyond banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXeed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements and workflow management, AI powered smart forms, straight through processing, unified access across downstream applications and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your beyond banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using PartnerHub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive beyond banking offer. PartnerHub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for beyond banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. Partner Hub, your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXeed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omnichannel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper-intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements, and workflow management, AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. Conference and SME Banking Awards on 29th and 30th of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using Partner Hub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. Partner Hub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for beyond banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. Partner Hub your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXeed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper-intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements, and workflow management. AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using PartnerHub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. PartnerHub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for beyond banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. PartnerHub your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXeed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper-intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements, and workflow management. AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using PartnerHub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. PartnerHub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for Beyond Banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. PartnerHub your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iExceed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, Omnichannel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate backend systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots, and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements, and workflow management. AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings. Yes, hello everyone and we are back. 
uh, now we will have the panel discussion on the topic of the digital factoring, and we start with uh, two presentations and then the discussion itself. So, and the first presentation, Federica Wellenberg-Meyer, FCOM. You are welcome. Hi, everyone. Can we, is it on? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, where's my presentation? Here. Um, a few months is it now already, um, that in our own company we did a symposium. Um, and in that symposium I asked the question, um, of course, regarding our industry, wouldn't it be nice if? So, if I ask you, if you had a wish, wouldn't it be a nice if? Karen, I have to take you as the first one. If he had a Ferrari. Okay, this is important for the factoring industry. No, come on. <laughs> this is for you. Full digital processing. Uh -huh. One click. Okay. In one, one second. One click, one second. One click, one second. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. One, one more. Wouldn't it be nice if, please? I know it's after lunch and it's difficult. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if? Olga. Come on, yeah, but factoring. <laughs> if you don't have fraud, very nice. Wouldn't it be nice if? If we have a good lead generator. Good lead generator. Wouldn't it be nice if? Ivan. Come on. Out of your gut. Don't think. If you knew, if you knew the rates straight away, ah, uh -huh. okay, okay. Wouldn't it be nice if? So we asked that question to um, to our clients in our symposium, uh, as I said before, and here's the answer. This is not the answer. Uh, the answer was basically, wouldn't it be nice if we could predict? Wouldn't it be nice if we could predict um, the future in business? I don't know if I want to know what will happen to me tomorrow, um, but uh, wouldn't it be nice if we knew, and uh, I take your, uh, your, your idea, um, wouldn't it be nice if we knew when there was going to happen fraud or who from where it would happen, right? Um, because this is an inherent part of our industry. So um, we came up uh, with this idea a few years ago. Um, it was one of our clusters that we thought of. And uh, we said, wouldn't it be nice if we could look into the glass bulb and it would tell us what will happen? Um, obviously, that is not easy to do, um, but it's becoming easier to do nowadays. Um, because now we have a lot of data, we have a lot of computing power, and all of that together allows us to make predictions into the future. Computing power, data, and of, co and of course, good programmers. So we came up with something like this. Uh, that was going to give us answers on if we're having good customers or not so good customers in our ecosystem. Um, yesterday in our workshop, um, we were talking about how large is an ecosystem in a particular factors environment. And if you, if you said, just for the sake of saying something, 200 clients and each of them 200 clients, so we have 200 by 200 companies in that ecosystem, right? And if you have larger ones, well, then you have many more. So we're talking large ecosystems, a lot of companies, a lot of data, a lot of interactions between customers and debtors, debtors um, amongst each other, customers with customers, looking something like this. And, um, and this system um, is a live system. This is a picture. But the picture, if, if it was a living thing, and we have to think about a living thing here, uh, that changes by the second, because there are interactions happening all the time, between them, between each other, then you could probably anticipate what's going to happen. Um, so what we said is, um, let's look at that, and uh, let's, uh, let's see what, what could happen in, 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 a, in, a, in a given system. So we asked our customers, uh, what would be nice to know? You know? Wouldn't it be nice if? And they, and they gave us all these answers. Um, Data security, competition, privacy, no Ferrari in here, but uh, 
diversification of services, credit risk, etc., risk management, client relationship, and so on. So we thought, okay, um, out of those um, wishful thinking, uh, wouldn't it be nice if, um, we could cover a bunch of them with, um, um, with uh, our analysis and predictive modeling in, um, if you were doing, uh, if you were using machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we could cover late payment, fraud and non-payment, risk management, and credit risk. <clears throat> okay. So we thought, how do we get from the wish to the reality? And um, from the wish to the reality, we said we have to have machine learning approaches. What does that mean? Machine learning is, is a subset of artificial intelligence. Um, and I don't want to go in deep or in detail what it's all about. I just want to give you some ideas on how that works um, in general. And um, it starts all over with so-called unsupervised learning. Unsupervised. Did I say that? Yeah. Um, unsupervised learning in the sense of um, you have just a lot of data. You put that into, into a tool, and the tool will tell you there's correlation, whether that makes sense or not. You know, like, uh, um, are more young boys being born when the sun or when the moon is out there, or vice versa, girls? Um, the machine would tell you, yeah, there is a correlation. And if you believe that, well, then it may be true or may not be true. So unsupervised learning. Um, then we come into supervised learning, and uh, um, what we do, do, do here is we start learning um, about fraud detection, image classification, customer retention, forecasting, and prediction, um, because we're giving the machine already hints on what makes sense on what the machine is detecting. Okay? Um, and last but not least, um, reinforcement learning, uh, when the machine starts learning not only by our own input, but because the machine is also detecting itself and creating algorithms to learn when something is going in the wrong direction or whatever <coughs> we want to detect. So from unsupervised learning to supervised learning to reinforcement learning. What do we want it to achieve? How do we work today? In uh, conventional risk management, what do we do? We read financial statements and uh, credit agency scores. We have payment behavior, industry analysis, market trends, and so on and so forth. So this is what happens today in 99.9% .9 of the cases. So we rely at the end of the day on history, on the past, much less on the present, present meaning what's happening right now, um, and less on what could happen in the future. Um, so what we're doing here is we really rely on financial st statements that could be one year old, two years old sometimes, um, or credit agency scores. We know what happened when you rely on those. Um, it can be the last time or the last time that you made, um, made a deal with someone. Lehman case, right? Triple A one day, bankrupt the next day. So payment behaviors, industry analysis, market trends. So what do we want to do with machine learning with what we saw before? Uh, we process big data, and data nowadays is a lot of data. Um, some, in the 1940s, when all this artificial intelligence began with um, Alan Turing as the father of, um, we're processing zero data, digitally or electronically. So we started in the 1940s. Um, nowadays, we're processing around 800 zettabytes, and that is a lot of data. If you look into your device, how much a zettabyte is all about. Um, and also, the computing power has increased dramatically. Um, when I studied artificial intelligence in the 1980s, um, we were able to do some computing. Um, and uh, list programming was out there during that period of time. And then artificial intelligence became dormant. And it wasn't really until computer power came up again, and, uh, and the data was available, that we started working with it. So process big data, and, and that allows us to detect, um, well, complex patterns, uh, in the sense that uh, maybe something that we wouldn't detect at the very beginning that has a correlation, 
and detect patterns. Adopt to market changes. This is very interesting because um, someone was asking me, Federico, are you also uh, including um, information from third party providers out there, you know, that read what's happening out there in the world, the news, um, internet, etc.? And I said, uh, no, not really. We're not doing that right now. Um, but you know, perhaps it's not even necessary. Um, because if the system is working well, the system is detecting that through the numbers that are coming in into the system. So uh, yeah, you could probably use third-party information that's not in your, in your ecosystem, but your ecosystem is the one that's mattering to you. And that's the one that will give you the answers. Um, and it will adapt to market changes. Automate data task and reduce bias. Um, reducing bias means um, you're really um, off to what you consider, I believe that, or my gut feels <coughs> are telling me the following. Um, so it's much better when you rely on, on real data that's happening. It's like reading your own vital systems instead of, uh, instead of looking at the mirror and saying, ah, yeah, I'm good. But maybe something is happening inside yourself that's not so good. So, Look at the numbers, look at what's changing, and take the consequences or drive out what is necessary for that. So this is out, convention is out, and of course, this is in, right? Um, so how do, we, how do we work when we work with machine learning? We have to go through, uh, or with predictive analysis processes. At the very beginning, what we do is we define a project, um, and then, second, we do the data collection. Data collection is a, not so an easy thing to do. Uh, we have been now working with a client in doing a beta testing, and <laughs> this has been taking us ages to get the real data that we need for doing our testing of our algorithm. So data collection, then the data analysis, cleaning of the data, of course, all that stuff, and then data analysis, which is an inherent part of machine learning. Then get the statistics out of the data that you have inside your, um, in your, in your ecosystem, um, and then you start modeling. So what are all these numbers? Um, and I'm not saying taking a picture, because what you saw at the beginning is just a picture. That's the instant um, situation of something that's happening at a particular moment. Boom. That could be good, could be bad, could be middle, you don't know. Um, it's like the pictures that we take when we take pictures. Um, and uh, more importantly is what is happening in the, uh, let's say, in the transitions, in, uh, in the dynamic. So what's happening basically every moment and what could probably be tomorrow. So modeling is important and, uh, and then you deploy it, of course. I'm probably running out of time. Um, one more to go. Let's try if we can get this done. Um, why don't you try to um, hit? Oh, good, very well, excellent, thank you. Um, so this is um, this is a model that we have right now um, with uh, some dummy data, um, and of course this is not a complete ecosystem. One of the th <laughs> things that we have discovered also is this was a concept. And, uh, and then after we figured, oh my God, with all these data that we have from our client, test client, we're talking really a lot of companies, um, it wouldn't look like this. So um, this is like um, just a little um, maquette, if you like so, on what it could be. So the green thumbs up means that you have uh, that you can rely on that client, nothing is going to happen. So if we click on, on a green thumb up, let's say which one we tick. Let's say if it works. OK, if, it, um, if we could do that, um, then you would see uh, on clicking on a particular green thumbs up, you would see all the dependencies that that client has with its debtors and perhaps even with um, other clients, which also can be the case. Uh, which industry it is in, which geography it's playing, and, uh, and why it is not good at the moment. Because perhaps there are some debtors in its particular ecosystem, like in this one, in the red one, uh, that are showing some developments. 
signs uh, that are possibly scary. Um, what could that be? Um, yesterday in the workshop, we talked about it. Um, if you always have a client that's paying late, but pays, that's not bad. He's paying a lot of money to you. Vis-a-vis um, -vis another one um, that's always paying punctual and suddenly starts paying late. So um, that's the one that you want to look at, right? Um, and perhaps in the ecosystem that you've got with the uh, hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of companies and invoices, etc., et you don't see that happening. Um, so in here, you detect changes, behavioral changes. Uh, and payment, um, payment um, delays is one of them, a very obvious one. There are a number of other ones that are detected and put into, into the whole system, into the model. Um, and that's why the system will tell you every day, every moment, at any time, 24 by 7, what's happening in your system. AI using, or AI and machine learning um, you, for predictive analysis. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions? I don't know if I, if yeah. I have time. Thank you very much, Federico. Now we will have a next presentation, and after that, panel discussion. Karol Lischinski, Komar, welcome. <coughs> doesn't work. Oh. Welcome, everyone. My name is Karol Leszczyński. Uh, I'm product development manager of Comarch Factoring Platform. Uh, before I start my presentation, uh, I have a question for you. Please raise your hand. Who knows Comar? Oh, so it's good. Uh, just a quick uh, reminder. We are a com company based here in Poland. Mm, we are uh, funded in 1993 by Professor Janusz Filipak and his wife, uh, Elżbieta Filipak. At the time, it was one room at the uni university with 13 students. I think some of those students still work in our company, but I assume they are no longer students. But the time has changed. Uh, 30 years later, in 2023, uh, we have almost 7,000 employees. Uh, I have pleasure to work in the financial sector. Uh, I'm responsible for factoring, but of course we have also other banking products like uh, COP, Apfino, uh, insurance, wealth management, and other sectors like healthcare, uh, telco, telecommunication, um, Internet of Things, airlines. So. Today, I would like to speak with you about um, the questions, about some tools uh, and knowledge I can give you before uh, choosing the right vendor, the right partner. What questions you should ask me before making a final decision? And the first question should be, if the vendor provides you the fresh technology, the newest technology, and what's our approach? What are, what's our answer for this? My answer is to use microservices. What does it mean? Let's imagine that factoring um, agreement, factoring product has some modules, like agreements, like contractors, like um, payments, like re reconciliation. In microservices approach, it means that if our programmers, our developers are improving agreement module, for instance, uh, it, mean, it means that it will not affect the other modules. Uh, of course, these modules are separate entities. Are, they are cooperating with each other. But a uh, few years ago, with the monolithic, um, monolithic uh, systems, it wasn't as clear for us. The next time, uh, the next uh, very important question is, how do you provide the newest UX? How do you cooperate with end users? And from my point of view, um, cooperation with the end user is very important because, uh, so what we are doing, what's our answer for this? Um, we have Comar UX Lab. Uh, it means that we are creating a preset task for the end users, and they are doing this task in our system. 
and we really have a nice feedbacks about this uh, about this system. So I think it's really really worth to uh, to use uh, UX tests and to cooperate closely with the end user. High performance infrastructure. The question should be asked that if my key business grows up, are you able to provide me the right infrastructure? And of course, the cloud-based infrastructure is the answer here, because if your company is ex experiencing a high level of growth, you should consider a cloud um, uh, infrastructure, because scalability helps you to power up the system when your brand processing data increases. And of course, when the, there is a decline in your business, it can scale down, so it means that you will have lower costs. How long product should be delivered to me? Uh, are the timelines re realistic? So, from my point of view, the implementation should take from six to nine months. Of course, it depends um, of the scope of the work, of the adjustment, customer requests, uh, but the times when implementation took three, four or five years are ended. It will never happen again. A fortress expansion with new features. Which methodology we should take? And the answer from my point of view is the Agile. Uh, it means that we are working in two-week sprints so our programmers are developing new features, are improving existing features, and after two weeks, we are providing them to our clients. And cyclical releases. How I will know what will happen in my system in the future? So the answer for this is a release plan. So we are preparing, what we are doing, we are preparing a release plan for 2024 right now. So our clients will exactly know what they will receive in each quarter. Of course, please remember we are also flexible. So it means that if you want to change some feature to have another feature, we are able to do that. Does your vendor has tools to support your implementation, how they will do that. From in our approach, in Comarch approach, we should divide the implementation in two phases. In phase one, we are delivering you a ready-to-go product. It means that your end users are able to put invoices into the system, improve their liquidity, and the factors employees are able to, to help uh, your clients to deal with the system. So it means that you can earn money. Uh, the second thing, we are of course preparing the most important adjustments, the blocking adjustment, the CRs that in the first phase of the implementation you should have in your system. Of course we are doing branding, we are doing trainings for the end customers and for factor employees. We are also providing migration of the data and all the necessary integrations. And after that, when you have go live system, there is a second phase of the implementation when we are preparing you extra features, that additional uh, customer request that you could leave without at the beginning of the implementation. Of course, optional integrations and additional products. And the next question is how we can help you with data migration. How we can migrate your clients? And the most common situations are, do, uh, are two uh, things. The first one is the big bank. It means that we are providing all the clients to the new system. So just imagine a situation that uh, on Friday your clients will put the invoices into the system, track all the necessary reports, and on Monday, they will wake up with the new system. So this is the big bank. Uh, the other one is friends and family. What does it mean? Uh, we are putting into the system, for example, 30% of your existing clients and all the new clients in this case. So you can also collect a positive feedback from the client, the feedback for the clients that are already using this system. And after maybe two or three months, we are putting the second part of the client, 
the, of the clients. The one disadvantage of this is that you need to run two systems uh, for maybe three, four, or six months. Uh, another thing is, are you doing something more? Are you providing something more than only software? And I think what is important to mention, from my point of view, uh, we are, I'm very proud that we are uh, a part of Polish Factor Association educational team. That means uh, we are providing some articles, some webinars to expand the knowledge about the technology uh, aspects. Uh, we just launched a podcast with one of our clients about how the system can help, how the cooperation, close cooperation with Factor and the end users will improve their journey through the, through the whole life of the agreement, factoring agreement. Uh, of course, there are also things that we are providing that are, that are going behind the scenes. And my next question to you uh, is, I really like to ask these questions. Please raise your hand if you have more than five passwords in your system. <laughs> you see, that's what I mean. Uh, because we are trusting that internet is much more safer than, uh, than the real world. And I will give you one example. I asked my colleague, um, a good old friend of mine, she has a six or seven year old son. And I asked him, please give me the date of birth of your child, of your son. And of course she told me this and I told her, please give me your laptop now. And I'm sure I will unlock it in a few seconds. And she told me, yes, that's, that's true. You see, so my question to you, and uh, I think you should all remember that good password policy is also very important here. So minimum 12 characters, small letter, big letter, number, special character, please remember that. Because during this 15 minute presentation, about 200 million euro will be stolen from your accounts. And maybe it's because of the password policy. Why we are thinking it's safer? Uh, there is a quote that money never sleeps, but I think we should change it right now that the fraudsters never sleep. And to sum it up, what will happen if we, wa if we add everything that I mentioned right now? The technology, the UX, uh, implementation, data migration. This is the result, 92%. This is a positive feedback that we collect from uh, our new front office system that we, that we launched just uh, one year ago. So this is the feedback from the uh, end users, the clients that actually used our system. So from my point of view, cooperation with UX team and doing all these things that I mentioned earlier are very important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, please stay, Carol, here on the stage. Now we will have a panel discussion, so let me uh, invite Federico back to that stage. Christian Ionescu, CEO of Instant Factoring, please come here, and also Lukas Adamczyk, NG Commercial Finance. <laughs> You want to sit here? Yes, we, um, it's written how we should sit. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> just we'll sit here to see you all. Yes, thank you very much for your great presentations. And I will start first from, from the factors. First question will be to Lukas and to uh, Christian. As you are one of the best digital factors here in the C region, what is Digital fact. What does the digital factoring mean for you? Well, for me personally, it's a it's a bunch of drivers that could affect the factoring evolution positively. I would say. Um, actually, one of uh, them is the implementation of fully of of um, fully implementation of the digital end-to-end -end processes, from um, client onboarding process to mm -hmm. Uh, to regular financing. Mm, generally, 
the support of digitalization is, is a matter of how to make sure, sure that clients have the most sophisticated, most important uh, client needs, such as financing of the, uh, of the invoices anytime and anywhere, mm -hmm. quickness of the full digital um, factoring process, and that's the, that's the clue regarding to the mm -hmm. digitalization of the factoring industry. Mm -hmm. How quick is your factoring process right now? Uh, you mean microfactoring? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's very straightforward. Uh, clients, in our case, mm, have a very simple and intuitive onboarding process. Um, we don't disburse advance payments. We have a very simple fee schedule. Uh, and our, in our case, clients pay only for financing period. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a easy to understand offer. So uh, at ING, we finance the full invoice value straight away. Mm -hmm. um, we don't disburse advance payments. Uh, we don't have uh, mm, additional fees related mm -hmm. to changing the limit, granting mm -hmm. the limit, and even late payments. Mm -hmm. And this is something which distinguishes us on the Polish market. So if you upload if the invoice, how fast it will be financed? Um, it depends. <laughs> Come on. Uh, where is the, when it's the primary process for the, for the client, I would say it's um, up to four hours. Mm -hmm. But of course, when it's the, um, let's say, current the existing customer, existing mm -hmm. customer it's one minute. OK, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Christian. What about instant factoring? So for us, uh, there's no such a thing as a, it's our DNA. Uh, we started in day one uh, with this mission that we want to serve the underbanked, the underserved, uh, to reach their full potential in uh, business mm -hmm. by providing them a 100% digital solution. So that's what we did in day one. Mm -hmm. Um, we are not a legacy company or anything of sorts. Um, and we strive to be, you know, super fast, super easy, uh, approve. Uh, we have internally a saying, uh, which is a little bit of an anecdotal saying. If uh, we have an entrepreneur that breathes and have an invoice, we want to finance them. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you do that? Only through digital fully digital solution, yeah? So we, r we run on average like 30,000 transactions per hour with mm -hmm. a team of 12. Okay. And we're thinking we're too much. Uh -huh. But with the same team, uh, we were able to increase this number this year like on 50% without hiring anybody. Mm -hmm. So it's super scalable. And um, we also uh, see the opportunity to be a, a regional player, if not an European player, if you like. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I think what we do can be, it's universally valid. So we are now in two countries, we're moving to the third one, and mm -hmm. the fourth one, in my view, it should be whole Europe combined. There's no point to go country by country, yes. let's do whole Europe, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A, with yeah. a centralized platform. Yeah. Why yeah. To, to go crazy and yes. every two years to develop a new country, it's hard work, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Do it once, do yeah. it successfully, and yes. serve everybody who needs this, yeah. Yeah, 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 great. What is it for tech companies? What does the digitalization of factoring mean? Yesterday in our workshop, uh, we had this discussion and um, um, the panelists came up also with um, quick and easy, was, were the ones that came up uh, the most, I remember. Um, and um, so quick and easy and good looking if possible easy, uh, to understand. Uh, for me, on top of that, digitalization means uh, to be able to create new business opportunities, um, business cases, uh, and we were using the, in our in our case, um, the uh, Islamic factoring mm -hmm. um, business case uh, as one. And if you remember this one here on the screen, 
um, that is another digitalization, understanding the behavior of your customers, allows you, of course, complete new business cases, evaluating uh, your customers and debtors basically instantly, something that uh, uh, insurance companies also would like to, would like to know. So um, yes, quick, easy, et cetera. But on top of that, the digital space, and I mean, if we look back 20 years, uh, since, uh, since we have uh, grown the digital space, how many new business cases have come up? I mean, um, Uber and um, Airbnb and all these companies that are out there are digital companies and um, creating new business cases. So for me, that's one of the major ones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think we should also remember about the past, mm, uh, because right now, I think in Poland, I will refer to the Polish market, I think we have fully digital uh, process in 12 factors or fintechs, yeah? But I remember uh, when I started working in uh, Raiffeisenbank, Poland at the time in 2010, I remember when we were having, a, we were having an agreement, factoring agreement, so the client needed to give me an invoice, I needed to send this invoice to the um, headquarter in Warsaw, so someone should to proceed this, mm -hmm. this uh, invoice. So right now we are, I think, in good posi position, but what the digitalization means to me, it's of course doing everything without going home, so I'm from my laptop, but also important thing is to be sure that I am able to cooperate with third party, like insurance company in this case, some, some case of embedded finance, because for me, factoring and insurance company is a very good marriage. The marriage should have everyone, yeah? So uh, I would like to have the access for the information about my debtor's problems, because why should I care about their problems? I provided my goods, I gave them uh, the invoice, uh, I financed the invoice with the factor, and I'm scared if he will pay, pay this invoice back. I shouldn't be scared. I want to sleep well. So I think cooperation with insurance, fast cooperation with insurance company is also one, of, one part of uh, digitization of the, of the processes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Christian, next question to you. What is the driving force of, of your growth on each the markets that you're present, so for two for Romanian market and Serbian now, right? I think it's it has to do a lot with our positioning. So in we see in other more, more let's say more developed uh, economies that the fintechs is the ones also active in the factoring space. Mm -hmm. They really try to compete uh, uh, shoulder to shoulder with the banks. Mm -hmm. We were not as arrogant to believe we can. Uh, disrupt the banks in full because obviously we didn't have the balance sheet, we had the same cost of funds, a lot of the mm -hmm. uh, good things that the banks can offer to clients. At the same time, the banks, due to all the regulatory frameworks and all the uh, very strict uh, risk procedures, they leave a lot of this, the traditional sector leaves a lot of companies, they can't cater to them. Mm -hmm. This is the reality, it's a global problem, it's not yeah. just in one particular market. So our idea was, why don't we do what the banks do for the top of the market, but to the bottom of the pyramid? So basically, today in today's world with the ESG and uh, impact investing, it's now super famous. Mm -hmm. We were labeled by the industry as a social impact lender. To be honest, we, when we started, we had no plan to become a social impact lender, but, but the, the fact we decided to focus on this market segment under search London Bank, it made us, uh, the industry gave us this label. And today, yes, we benefit of some support uh, on that support from investors and from financiers alike. But um, what drives us, uh, I'll tell you some numbers, for example. Mm -hmm. In Romania in 2021, the whole factoring market combined was doing 8 billion euro mm -hmm. with 3,400 companies. Mm -hmm. So 3,400 Romanian companies had access to fa traditional factoring. Mm -hmm. We have more than double that number of companies in our platform, mm -hmm. more than 7,000. Okay. So the whole market combined has 3,400. Yeah. We have 7,000 plus companies mm -hmm. enrolled today in our cool. platform. Mm -hmm. Why am I telling you? Of course, the numbers are nowhere near the, the, the mainstream mm -hmm. uh, factoring. 
uh, in terms of volumes, uh, it is much, much smaller. But it just shows that uh, it's, you ask me what uh, is driving the growth. That drives the growth. The positioning in the market, mm -hmm. really caring for the small guy that mm -hmm. nobody cares about. Yeah. After being rejected at five institutions, he's like a bit depressed. He's a mm -hmm. bit uh, upset, I would say, even mm -hmm. frustrated mm -hmm. yeah, because his, uh, his value is not uh, confirmed yes. mm -hmm. by the market, traditional market, and we are there to really help them to grow mm -hmm. to the next level. So that's yeah. what drives. And these numbers for Romania, I checked them in Italy, it's the same. Mm -hmm. Less than 1% of the market, the traditional okay. sector, yeah. uh, caters for less than 1% of the companies, mm -hmm. is valid in Spain. Mm -hmm. And in, in Serbia, where we are also present directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Wanted to ask, look, ask Lukas as well, and then Federica, you are right. <laughs> I want to ask Lukas you, because you are one of the leaders here in the Polish market, and included microfacturing, and I also bring your example because you were actually the first on the market to embed the microfacturing to the e invoicing platform. So tell us what drives your volumes. Um, well, I have no intention of, of being original uh, and revealing any specific tip here, because um, I would say the answer is truly simple. Um, there's not one or even two explicit factors that guarantee dynamic growth of the business. Um, this is certainly a more elaborate ecosystem, which means um, it's a part of slogan, but the, the right people with good ideas using the right tools. Mm -hmm. And essentially, um, support of the digital digitalization um, comes, uh, comes to the taking care of the client's most important needs, as I mentioned before. Um, because um, it still addresses the client's needs, uh, the digital factoring, and um, this is the clue when it comes to the dynamic growth of the business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And of course, beside these aspects, there are before beside these aspects uh, which I call standard. There are most um, other things um, which are not standard, I would say. So, which are the kind of a cherry on the cake mm -hmm. and, and triggers a sense of wow. And as I mentioned before, uh, in our case, is a, and you mentioned before, mm -hmm. it's the integration with ILG accounting system mm -hmm. where the client have a possibility and the way to finance an invoice as soon as it is issued in the accounting system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. yeah. You wanted to add here, Federico? Right, um, because the numbers that you were giving, Christian, uh, yeah. all over the same, and uh, I just yes. wanted to um, give an example. In, in Spain, for instance, uh, you have about three million companies, uh, and the uh, factoring is done today with uh, something like 20,000 companies. So what happens mm -hmm. to the rest? In, in Germany, it's, it's over okay. 4 million companies, and it's, a, it's nearly 25,000 companies that mm -hmm. are in the, in the factoring space. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the rest, right? Yeah. So um, the potential is, is yeah, it looks like, it looks like uh, still corporate customers are mainly financed with the factoring services, and SMEs still uncovered. So this is what these numbers are saying. I think general. it's worth to mention that SMEs maybe are starting to be covered right now. Mm -hmm. in, yep. When I'm speaking about, I'm referring to the Polish Factor Association. Mm -hmm. But I think we should also think about the micro segments even, uh, even more, because at some part of the journey, uh, they will grow up, they will become a SME client, maybe a corporate client. So if, you, if we gave uh, this micro client a good education at the beginning, a good systems at the beginning, a good customer journey at the beginning, they will become more loyal to you, they will stay with you, and you will also have additional profits from it. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, all right, how do you think all trends that we are seeing uh, uh, right now 
like uh, implementation of the invoicing, new generations coming to the market, and, uh, and others will influence the dynamic of the factoring during the next years here in our region. So the invoicing uh, will help, of course, because from my point of view, they will reduce frauds. Uh, we will be able to make also end customers journey uh, much easier because we will be able to integrate with the uh, invoicing system and put, put all these invoices into our platform. So it would also make uh, uh, their life easier. But uh, the other thing is what drives the digitalization in our market. And I also think that we are forgetting about the younger generation because at some point of their life, I will refer to my personal example. I have mm -hmm. two, two daughters, and uh, Alicia is six years old right now. Ten years from now, she will enter this market, this, market, this banking market. Yeah? And she will go to the... Br what I'm saying, she will never go to your branch. She will do everything online. Yes? She will expect to have everything online, the real-time decision. Uh, she will not have time as we had few years ago to go to the branch and to speak with the, with the uh, uh, relationship managers from the bank. So I think we need to remember that they are hitting us by storm. And <laughs> I f from my point of view, right now we are not ready for them. And uh, the, time f the time flies fast. So we need to speed up to remember about this new generation that are entering the market in a few years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? I very much uh, support what uh, Carol is saying. I think uh, here uh, many of us uh, are getting praise for uh, some great uh, website that a person can just send uh, uh, an invoice online. But this is, come on, guys, it's already expired. Mm -hmm. This is the technology uh, from, yes. this was cool uh, yes. five, seven, seven years yes. ago. It's, it's, it's literally outdated already. And I think everybody here uh, that is active, not only in factoring, but in all financial services, you need to think of uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, how many of you have a Revolut account in this uh, room? Can you see a raise of... Uh, not so... Uh, <laughs> some people, but not so many, right? When you first used uh, the Revolut app, you thought, wow, this was so cool, right? How cool do you think it's still now? It's still cool, it's still relevant, but it's, you know, it's the norm, app. right? It's just an app. Uh, do you think the guys in Revolut are sleeping, saying, oh, we are great, we had this amazing app uh, that we started five, six years ago, we should uh, fire all our engineers now because we are quite big? No, they're actually building the future in five years from now. Yeah, but they, they were think, thinking yeah. like that six, seven years ago, yeah? Sorry? <laughs> they are thinking that uh, they are super intelligent yeah, yeah, but already, six, seven years ago. I think they're investing in the, te in the technology of the future. Of the future. And I think, uh, to try to answer your question, mm -hmm. what we need to do mm -hmm. is we need to adopt all this technology. I'll give you uh, my personal uh, uh, vision in my head how this product that we promote today it should look like mm -hmm. in a very short space of time. By the way, all the technologies I will, you will think about to make this happen exist today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not even waiting for anything to happen. But mm -hmm. let's just imagine you're an entrepreneur you're going in your car, you, you are at the traffic light, and you see this cool, uh, maybe, uh, banners on some website. You're reading the news, and they say, do you want cash flow solution or invoice, invoice discounting, whatever. He clicks the button. There's an there's a avatar talking to him in <laughs> its own language, saying, welcome, we are doing this and that. Would you like to make an account with us? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. So a scan of the face, we have some biometric uh, friends uh, in yeah. the <laughs> providers here. They will immediately identify this person, do the KYC in a second, in a half a second. Mm -hmm. Your account was open one second later, yeah? Do you have an invoice? The guy just happens that he sent an invoice to somebody, right? So he takes a photo shoot, a photo screenshot or of his just phone. Don't, or just don't give a screenshot if we imagine that the invoice data will be available with the invoice, or if that, right? Yeah, so you can then just say, okay, I sent an invoice uh, yesterday to my client uh, XYZ. Uh, can even, you say, find it in the database? The, guy, the yeah. avatar says, I found your, is this your yes. invoice? Yes, it is. Okay, I'm happy to announce you, you're, you're, you're financed. Your money will now be deployed to your bank account. 
all yeah. these things, I'm not joking. Think about yeah. it, what I just said. I exaggerate. Yes, bit. yes. But they exist I would today. like to have this, you Everything know, this process. Everything exists today. The yes. avatar with the AI exists. I'm dreaming of the process. Uh, I'm very, mentioned the invoices. It already and exists in some markets, in Hungary. Yeah. In a second, in Serbia, I have an launched, offer. Uh, Romania <laughs> will follow next year. So uh, that's yes. what we have to do, if yes. you ask me. And it's not even revolutionary, I would say. From what to start? We started. We don't know about the others, but I, <laughs> I hope I don't inspire my competitors to move uh, so fast, you know. All right, all right. I would prefer they still sleep a bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, this is a dream process, you know, I think for SMEs. You issue the invoice and automatically you have an offer, or automatically it's finance, right? I don't need to send, upload, ask, send request anywhere. And, you know, it's very tempting for for people that uh, are in the product development to think about the technologies mm -hmm. and the features. But actually, we shouldn't care about that. Uh, of course, you need amazing processes to deliver that experience. But you should put yourself in the shoes of the client. The client doesn't yep. give a damn what you're doing in the back. Of course, and how you call it. It just needs the money yep. fast without any headaches, yep. if possible. Yeah? Yep. Maybe we should even think a little bit further than that uh, on what technology can do today. In the because many business models that we have today were not thinkable 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, so if they were not thinkable, what can we not think about in the future? Obviously, if we cannot think about it, <laughs> mm -hmm. we cannot imagine it. Uh, but some years ago, when the, the, the subject matter of um, DLT blockchain came up, uh, one of the ideas uh, that came up to my mind were, isn't this going to perhaps um, change the entire market and, and make banks, financial institutions, complete obsolete. So having the intermediary out of the game and, um, and therefore is, going, is banks going to be around in 10 years' time or are we just having banking like Bill Gates said one time? Hmm? <laughs> so the problem is the banks but not the banking. And are, are we going to have banks in 10 years' time? So this is something that I'm, 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 I'm thinking with the technology we have out there, probably some of them or many of them not necessary anymore. So our business in receivables finance would change completely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, answering, answering your question, Olena. Um, definitely AI has the capability to, to be the new engine or which accelerates let's say, the new era of digital disruption. Um, however, however, the problem, the most significant challenge, I would say, is the better word, is that we still haven't quite figured out in the factoring industry mm -hmm. how to find a useful use cases for this technology. And um, business world as a whole, um, NGOs, individuals, all need to act to work together to make this change happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Federica, you gave us an example just now in your presentation how machine learning and AI can be used in the factory, <coughs> right? When can it be scalable? Scalable or scalable or, or applicable? Applicable. Yes. Ah, I mean, uh, it's been applicable in our space at least since uh, over 10 years. Um, AI is being used for matching invoices and payments um, in our application, so uh, it eases the, the work of uh, having manual intervention and the machine is telling you which payment um, is probably going to be allocated to which invoice or vice versa. Uh, if you cannot match it automatically, and that is 50% of the cases like that, uh, so that's been in, 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 in the application already. Uh, machine learning, of course, uh, you saw it in our presentation. Uh, we have a lot of data, and um, um, just to give you an example, um, our systems at our clients, of course, uh, process every year over 200 billion euro transaction volume with over 100 million invoices. So the amount of data resident in these systems is just enormous. Now, uh, computing them, uh, trying to figure out what, what does that mean, what's in there, um, that is part of machine learning, mm, supervised, unsupervised, uh, as I mentioned before. And uh, when will we see it? We are now in beta testing uh, next year. We'll see it live. So 
mm-hmm. by the time I'm here next year, I hope to show you guys uh, the results of that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, <coughs> I really like the example that was uh, mentioned earlier about this um, Instagram girl that was uh, mm-hmm. gaining more and more uh, followers. And uh, I think it was about one week ago I read about this uh, this uh, case. Mm-hmm. And the main conclusion was, um, is AI fooling us around? Is AI testing us as a human beings? Is AI testing our intelligence? Because right now we believe in everything what we see here. Yeah? So, but when I'm thinking about this uh, fashion industry, yeah, so the mm-hmm. commercials, maybe maybe this is the trend because uh, you mentioned about the holograms. Yeah, I can imagine that this model have a hologram. She will go walk. She will walk here. Yeah, uh, the problem with her is maybe not the problem. She will never get age, or she will age very well. She will never be sick. She will. She can work 24/7. But is it a proper use of an AI? In my opinion, not. Uh, because looking at our industry, what AI means to me, uh, for example, if you have a, for instance, if you have a debtor, very good debtor with very good history, credit history and uh, payment history, with proper use of AI, I'm able to tell you why this debtor is going to bankrupt nine months from now. And this is the proper use of AI in our industry. Of course, I'm not talking about the fashion industry. Of course, speeding up the process, uh, protecting uh, from frauds. This is the proper use of AI. Mm-hmm. 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 Let's speak a little bit about frauds. So how actually the frauds in digital factoring can be minimized? I know that this is one of the challenges all factors are uh, having. So what are your opinions on that? Um, we can tell from from our experience in our systems. Uh, um, you know, the other day I was talking to uh, one of the experts in the market called Lenvi Risk Factor, um, mm-hmm. and um, we're having a discussion because they're partners of ours. And uh, they said, uh, you know, we have um, in our system we have 30 criteria to detect if there is something unusual, mm-hmm. even Benford uh, role, meaning that if something is strange there is a trigger coming up in the um, payments on Sundays and things like this. Um, so, um, so we already have uh, 30 criteria. Uh, and I said, ah, Federico, hmm. peanuts. We do 400 <laughs> uh, criteria. And I, wa- I was like, oh my God, 400. <laughs> what can it possibly be that you, you know, 400 criteria that you, um, that you do um, look at? But it seems that, uh, that it helps. Um, and, and um, what, we, what we did is, of course, apart from this, from these 30 criteria, and they really detect uh, if something is wrong. Actually, at one client that we implemented it uh, basically a week later, um, a possible fraud popped up, and it saved the client 20 million euro. So um, the system was paid for the next generations. Um, but what, what is out there uh, uh, on top of that and where technology com- can come in um, six years ago, when, when blockchain came up, and I told, talked about this in, in one of these sessions here, um, was uh, that blockchain technology, which uh, Bitcoin technology, which is blockchain, um, allows you to encrypt or hash data, uh, which could be your invoices. And uh, by doing that, you could, in principle, have um, a system, a repository that has all invoices hashed in a system, in a registry, and tell you if, um, if there is an invoice that's probably going to be sold twice, one of the reasons of fraud in the industry. Um, the diffusion of innovation is the problem in here. So the technology is out there. Now Monetago is uh, one of our partners, and they deploy the systems also since the same time as we do. And it's so difficult to get bankers convinced that this is a very easy to use, simple, cost efficient system that will prevent your whole industry in your region and elsewhere um, to avoid double pledge invoices fraud. But innovate, the innovation of putting this into place, that is the one that's taking so much time. So doing it. <laughs> it's there, but it takes time to implement it. 
-hmm. That's mm -hmm. the problem we face. Okay. So a lot of uh, the things, uh, I mean, technology can be also used to try to uh, to to spot uh, any alterations in any documents, basically. There is a company we spoke with in Silicon Valley some time ago. They do um, uh, alterations of documents in PDF at pixel level. So mm -hmm. it's something that the naked uh, Roma human eye cannot see. I was going to say naked Romanian eye. Maybe <laughs> Romanian eye could spot it, but human eye would not. Uh, so uh, basically, th this is just one example of the many things uh, that can be done. But uh, I like uh, Federico's uh, example because I remember there's a famous uh, blow up in the industry. Uh, I don't know how, how many of you have heard. You probably might remember it, Federico. Urica. Do you remember Urica? It was a French. Uh, UK-based uh, uh, alternative factoring company, around 300 million euro volume, so sizable business. The CEO uh, was the former CEO of uh, uh, G Facto France, which is the biggest uh, mm -hmm. factoring company in France. So mm -hmm. quite f good people, you know, top managers from the industry. And they had a fraud of about 4 million at the time. And I remember, because I met the guy, and we try, I, I tried to learn from their mistakes. So he told me when they went to the creditor uh, meeting, there were five banks holding the same set of documents. So this guy had sold 4 million times for five, you know? <laughs> so they were, uh, at the beginning, the bankers were laughing. Oh, look at these guys. They have nothing. They have no guarantees. But they had the same documents. And they said at the end, mm -hmm. I was the only guy who had some collateral. But the company actually blew up mm -hmm. because of that. Not... They had the collateral, so they were okay from that perspective, but the investors mm -hmm. lost trust in the model because mm -hmm. they said, how many millions you could lose for us if we mm -hmm. carry on like that? Mm -hmm. So fraud, yes, we all know it's a big, massive mm -hmm. uh, risk in our, mm -hmm. in our industry. And, is there and uh, just like the colleagues uh, in cybersecurity said earlier, the, the, the fraudsters are becoming smarter and they use yeah. all these technologies against us and you mm -hmm. have to outpace them. And uh, mm -hmm. it's not... A, if you can lower it by 99.9%, I think we should be happy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Will, you cannot remove it entirely, honestly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And is there a tool right now to check whether invoices financed already? Yeah, Without I would it? like yep. to add that um, for all intents and purposes to this day, um, none of the factoring company in the world uh, will implement or implemented uh, full-scale AI today processes, yeah? Um, this is the reality. Um, however, we have a lot of uh, companies which are partially using AI in the factoring industry, especially in the digital invoice uh, financing, I would say. And what needs to happen is the change of thinking regarding new aspect of where to use AI. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there are two areas where mm -hmm. the using of a AI could um, bring great benefits or, or it's very much needed. Uh, first of all, in the area of, you mentioned before, Olena, uh, risk or fraud identification uh, process because um, we have a lot of data, and mm -hmm. um, this is, let's say, including all of the institutions, including factoring companies, ha has a massive amount of data. And uh, the second aspect is, um, is the credit decision-making um, processes. Uh, and um, this is the direction where all the companies should uh, should going, uh, going on. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. okay. Do we have some questions from the audience? Yes, can we have a microphone, please? I don't think. Not you? Why? I had a question about uh, the micro factoring. I mean, what is the average amount of the factors applied? What do we call the micro? Mm -hmm. And also, what is the average default rate? Mm -hmm. So the question is, what is the default rate so far <laughs> you, <laughs> in the microfactoring? Okay. Uh, of course, I 
cannot say about the default, right? It's our, let's say, secret sauce. Uh, but regarding your first question, the easier one, I would say. <laughs> Uh, the average amount is uh, about 4,000 euro per invoice, of course. And uh, the microfactoring limits in, uh, within the ING invoice digital financing, it's up to 50,000 euro, more or less. Uh, and therefore, of the, our uh, clients are um, entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs more or less 20-25% uh, are SMEs. Mm -hmm. Maybe I try to provide you with... With, with your data. It's transparent, we don't think of it uh, as a secret. Uh, so in our case it's less than 3,000 euro average invoice and uh, default rates uh, would be less than 2% of the total exposure. Uh, and it's, it's, it's maybe you think the initially, I think people think, oh, it could be higher because, you, it, it, for example, if you look at the NPL ratio in Romania, across the banks, the banking sector is 3%, so we're under the banking sector. But it, it makes total sense. Be think about it. You have one seller of an invoice of and one buyer of an invoice. Something has to go wrong with both players in 45 days, which is the average financing period. It's kind of impossible that both of them will go under so that they don't pay. Maybe one of them, things can happen to one of them, but for both of them to collapse in 45 days, it's kind of unlikely to start with. And then, of course, you have processes to manage collections, etc. So that's why it's, it's actually quite okay. And we know from other markets as well, it's, it's fairly low in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Can we have microphone, please, because... We should hear the, the question. Yeah. We will exchange. Uh -huh. Yours. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for the, all the panelists uh, for the open discussion. Uh, Christian, my, my question is actually to you. You're quite a legend in the uh, Romanian startup uh, community. Can you share some of the challenges that uh, you've encountered in, you know, in your journey building the, building the company and, and how you overcame them? Uh, what about we, need, we need a whole conference just to, to <laughs> share some of the life stories I've learned. Uh, uh, thank you for the compliment. I, I think it's a bit exaggerated, honestly. But um, I, you're in a way, uh, so I came from the industry at the, serving the big boys, the big, the big corporates. And we, as I told you at the beginning, we, we felt like we wanted to do, to have an impact, basically. And that's what drives us. I can tell you we've done, I mean, all, although we had 20 years of experience, we know the industry like very well huh? before we started. We've made all the mistakes you can imagine. <laughs> uh, and I'm happy to share. I, I'll tell you just a brief one, maybe if we, I can do it. I hope I can do it in 25 yeah, seconds. Yeah, we have one minute. One minute yeah. Yeah. Uh, for example, when we started the, the company in Serbia with my friend and colleague here, Pavel Vlasic, when we were so excited, you know, we had the Serbian press writing about us. We were in the top five news in the Serbia at that day. And a few hours after, we were expecting to be flooded with the requests, you know. Mm -hmm. And nothing was happening, you know, and we start to panic, you know, after six, seven hours, there's not even one phone call. I was telling them in Romania when we started, we had like, the phones were super busy, you know, 100 uh -huh. people tried to reach us at the same time. So we called the IT team in Bucharest, we said, what the heck is going on? Is the website live? Is it going on? Yeah, it's all good. They checked everything, they called us back, everything is perfect. We figure out what was happening, because we had launched the website or the Serbian version like only a few days before, Google was not indexed, hadn't mm -hmm. indexed us. So people are going online and they couldn't find us anywhere in Serbia, you know? And we observed the incredible traffic on the Romanian website coming all from Serbia. So we were like, <laughs> what the heck, you know? But everything was in Romanian at the time. So immediately we put something in Serbian, we're live in Serbia, click here to root them. We made all these stupid mistakes, it's incredible. But I, I'm happy to tell you a lot more. Yeah? This is just one of the many. Yeah, did, yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. Thank you, Lukas, Christian, Karol, and Federica. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lena. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, all right, our, I will be back on stage for a second. Our next panel discussion will be devoted to the topic of um, digitalization of SME lending. So we will start from the two presentations first. So I will invite first uh, Christian Rumer from Kulana with his presentations and afterwards Marcin Boch, Algolytics, and then we will have the discussion. Thank you. You're welcome. Just like this. Thank you. Perfect. Great. Um, so I'm, I think, the obstacle between you and the end of the day. So <laughs> I try to make it short and I try to make it entertaining as well uh, because you all have heard a lot of presentations already and probably also a couple of workshops yesterday. So um, many of the things that you will hear from me, you have probably heard in some shape or form in the other uh, presentations as well, which is actually a nice experience from my perspective that we all face similar problems and we all face similar challenges that we can solve in conferences like this uh, together. So my name is Christian Rumer. I am the uh, part of the Kulana team. I created Kulana a couple of years ago as a platform that helps digitizing, digitalizing financial institutions. So our concept is generally speaking that we go into traditional banks, traditional financial institutions, help with our self software platform to help in the digital transformation of these uh, institutions towards um, SME lending with the general idea that if done correctly, these traditional financial institutions do have actually an interesting value proposition because of their proximity to their clients. And um, as I said before, none of that, what I will tell you here, is really rocket science, but it's really just trying to give another perspective on the things that we heard before. We heard it from uh, Comarch, we heard it from others as well. That if you we look at digital transformation, we have a couple of issues that we need to look at. First of all, we always hear about these digital opportunities, the businesses that can be done, the omni-banking channel, the uh, uh, increased efficiencies. Lots of ideas are coming out in this, in this area from the technology perspective, from what is technically feasible. But we also ha always have to also think about um, what are actually the real needs that the clients have, that the SMEs have. And this is what I categorize as jobs to be done. And then, of course, we need to think about it's still a financial institution. And while we have we just heard in the previous uh, panel that uh, there might not be really a need for traditional financial institutions, but let's assume there is an institution, they have a couple of core functions, so maybe there's a way we can use these core functions of a financial institution with uh, those requirements of SMEs in their lending. And then, of course, the last part that we have to look at is organizational maturity. Again, a factor that is relevant only if you look at the traditional banks, because if you create a startup from fresh, or fintech from fresh, you can select your staff, whereas in the existing organization, you have to live with what you have. So let's look at these four aspects, the digital opportunities, as I said, primarily coming from the idea that there are technical solutions like omni-channel banking, like personalization, process optimization, security, data-driven decision-making, and ultimately the collaboration with fintech or open banking. Those are all technical solutions, making them real, it's a technical problem, it's a software problem that can be solved, that can be addressed, where we can look from, uh, uh, learn from, from others and, and provide them. But the question is really, what are the SMEs really um, requiring? And if you really look at uh, yeah, smaller SMEs, you see that there are support areas which they demand for, which are going around the setting up of business, the reconciling of business activities, managing day-to-day -day finances and planning for the future. Those are the things that they really need. They don't really care whether this is now called an omni-banking channel or whether this is now called process efficiency. They like to have their problems being solved. So we need to make sure that we combine really what is the, the need of these clients that hopefully is expressed to a good relationship manager in a bank together with the technologi uh, technological advances that are possible. Thirdly, and again, um, I'm looking from the perspective of a financial institution, there are still a couple of core functions that banks have that could be useful in the business of uh, SME lending uh, or SME finance. For example, banks are technically an institution that take risks. 
the, the reason for financial institutions to be around, for banks to be around, is because they should have actually the best position to assess and manage risks of SMEs. If they look at it in the best way, they have the proximity to the clients, they have the ability to work with the clients, they know the clients, something that we have seen during the pandemic actually quite well, that those who really had an experience with their clients, who had a contact with the clients, could help them best. Banks still have the core function of bundling liquidity. So they are still the ones who have access to liquidity, and that's something that we've seen right now in the last two years as the risk perception in the market changed, as something like interest rates appeared again in the market, was something we have not seen for a couple of years after the financial crisis. But now that we have interest rates again, we see that banks are actually a place where liquidity can be uh, collected. And of course, lastly, we have transform of maturities, which is something that many of the P2P lenders are still struggling with because Again, most of the deposits are short-term, whereas if we talk about CapEx needs, if we go beyond, let's say, factoring or trade finance, if we look at SMEs that have um, uh, CapEx needs, maturities, and the deposit side are not really matching with what the financial needs are. And finally, we have the organizational maturity. Again, if you look at a financial institution, existing financial institution, and try to help them in the digitalization, then you need to understand at what level this institution is with regards to their advances to technology. Are they just starting to get uh, digital? Are they more formalized? Is the staff really already uh, prepared for that? Do they have enough skills in the team? Is the management already having a digital transformation strategy or are they just testing it? And I think I mentioned it yesterday in the workshop. In most of the banks I've seen, digital transformation is not necessarily a strategy that comes from the top. It's usually a couple of departments that start to develop something and if it's successful, then management greatly accepts that as a strategy, but it's not really coming as an initial strategy from the, from the management. Within this framework now, of what I have here, of these four factors, digital opportunities, jobs to be done, the core function and the uh, organizational maturity, I'm looking at ways how we can develop a digital strategy or digital transformation, sorry, a business strategy that can be supported by digitalization. And here for me, when we talk about digital transformation, it's always important that you don't talk about a digital transformation strategy, you talk about a business strategy that is supported by digital transformation. And if you look at the strategy, the things that I came up with here for, for many of the banks that we are working with, is basically your, your future strategy should really be around customer centricity or relationship centricity. And we had some uh, interesting input yesterday during our workshop from a company called Centeo that are really uh, quite keen on, on advising there on what really relationship centricity means. And the second one, second aspect is really risk mitigation, uh, where again the financial institution could be the place where ideally, ideally you are in the best place to assess and manage risks, not necessarily the one who takes the risk, but really assess the risks. If you believe that this is your business strategy, then a couple of concepts need to follow. And here, data analytics, process structure is of course important, but even more the concept of risk appetite and relationship pricing, that's something that I'm quite keen on. We always try to optimize our processes. And our, opt our processes always relate to a lending process where we have an application, where we have an approval, we have committees, we have scoring models and so on to try to approve a loan. And you can optimize that, you can make that faster up to a specific point where this all reaches a limit. The better idea for a financial institution to look at relationships is really to think about risk, appetite, and relationship pricing, where you say you try to assess a customer, an SME, on an ongoing basis, and you define a specific risk appetite that you have for that exposure, for that client. And then it doesn't really matter with which product this client fills up your risk appetite, whether this being a credit card, whether this being a factoring, whether this being a capex loan, whether this being a collateralized mortgage for his home, doesn't matter. But if you come to the point that you are able to assess on a continuous basis your risk appetite towards this client, then you can add on another level of optimization, of process optimization, that you wouldn't have if you just follow the traditional processes. So that's something that, um, again, a financial institution with the right database, with the right analytics, with the ability to continuously assess the client based on demographic information, but also based on transactional information, that will help you to really optimize that relationship by having the risk appetite and the relationship pricing in place. Obviously, that needs to require a couple of tools, such as a workflow analytics tool, such as a faster product development, and of course, implementation partners. And that's actually where we come in. I'm just skipping through this one here quickly. 
that's uh, again risk appetite. I, so sorry, let me just stop here. <laughs> the, the clock is running down. It, it irritates me. <laughs> um, I'm I'm down 10 minutes of 15, and I'm about a third done with my presentation. So I need to find a way to uh, uh, accelerate that. No, again. Um, Customer centricity is one aspect, risk appetite is a second aspect, so I made this clear that you need to define your risk appetite, which of course largely depends on your risk um, capacity, which it can take, as well as your risk limits. And that is influenced, of course, by things like the regulations, the business strategy, the risk culture, the shareholders expectation, that's pretty straightforward. But what I really like to say here is in the end that when you put this all together into a platform, let me just jump here, into a platform, then this is actually what we're trying to solve at Kulana, where we come together and say, okay, we have a platform. We are basically operating based on a low-code platform that is almost infinitely configurable to our customers. And we come together with our own experience of having worked as consultants with over 100 institutions over the past 20 years. We have the platform in place that is a proprietary low-code platform. And we have a track record of having implemented the platform with a couple of clients. I say a couple of clients because A, we are small, and B, also we are trying to work with our clients in the long term and come up with this platform that helps us really to offer a service that is combining the technology with some advisory, where we actually help institutions to develop the uh, risk management, to develop scoring, to develop uh, plat uh, um, portfolio analytics, but also collaborate with partners where we have front-end solution providers trade finance experts or mobile banking developers, as well as payment solution providers who we collaborate to really offer an entire ecosystem to a financial institution. Similar to what we heard before in the afternoon, we're not going out and try to uh, implement everything at once. Our goal is more driven by the idea of implementing within three to six months and define the scope of that based on that time frame and rather postpone other items that we implement to later stages so that we can really start working with institutions. We have three products that we're offering. One of them is called an open banking platform, which is really meant for co-development. The benefit of a low-code platform specifically for small banks that don't have a strong IT department is also that this low-code environment just gives you the right environment to also work with a variety of developers. Usually if you just have one or two developers on staff that develop a good solution, but if they leave, the next developer really takes some time to take over that code and, and deliver the next level of the platform. With a low-code platform, you're giving a specific framework that the next developer can easily pick up on. And that's actually, from our perspective, quite an interesting benefit to our platform. Plus, we also have our own team that supports you in that development. The other forms that we have is called a digital lending platform, which is more like for really small institutions, a starting point for digital transformation. And we have an asset management solution where we work with um, private debt and private equity um, asset managers who originate their own assets. The difference between the core, the core offering of the digital lending, the open banking, and the asset management solution is that the later one has a small accounting function in place, whereas the other ones um, rely on core banking for integration. Basically, we look at the entire lending process. We help institutions to really improve on every step of the lending process, as I said before, including risk appetite, scoring, but also some tools in the area of monitoring and, uh, and uh, collection, because for most of the banks in SME space, I think their weakest part is actually the monitoring. They all have great stages of analyzing. They all have great processes of making an assessment beforehand, having their scoring, their rating in place before they really disperse a loan. And good news is actually no loan defaults before disbursement. They all default later on. And therefore, you need to really do something in the monitoring space, which is something that we have implemented quite well in the platform. Um, that really helps if you really start uh, monitoring on an ongoing basis, help the clients and really navigate through problems. We've seen the biggest um, effect here on, on the credit quality uh, through the monitoring process. Um, we integrate well with other parts. We have um, any kind of uh, front end that you have. We can integrate with that. We can develop it ourselves. But we also integrate with your entire data analytics framework, as well as with your core banking and external solutions. And we're actually working on an SME lending fund, where basically the idea is if you originate in a bank, your assets under the concepts that we um, believe in, the concepts that we think are valuable, then there will be a fund solution that will work with you on 
co-investing and basically taking risk, not just funding your business, but actually taking some of the credit risk as well, as long as we share that. That's basically what we do. Whenever we implement, we also look at the respective stage at which the institution is to help them in their transformation and develop our platform as necessary. Um, as I said before, we have our own local platform that we, that we make available that you can actually co-develop with us as well or we develop with you. It has a significant advantage when you look at the question whether buy or build your own software. We obviously have a combination. You buy our support, but you also get access to the local platform that you can develop. And in that sense, we have actually a, an option to really work with specifically smaller banks in the digital transformation quite well. Our experience is that we have, as I said before, five, currently five clients that we work with quite intensely. And we're trying to add another five per year going forward. That leaves me with exactly 10 seconds in my presentation left. So um, I'm looking forward to the panel and then other questions that you might have. Thank you. I'm glad to be uh, here and uh, present uh, to you my presentation. I am CEO of Algolytics Technologies. Um, uh, I will uh, highlight in my uh, presentation the importance uh, for the lending companies of having robust analytical platform that they cover um, whole um, uh, processes uh, connected with risk management and anti-fraud management. This is our, one of our specializations. So let's uh, talk a couple of words about uh, Algolytics. The main offering of Algolytics is our analytical platform. This is a set of generic tools that can be used in different use cases and in different industries. And the main uh, role of this platform is to cover all life cycle of a machine learning projects from the data orchest orchestration, data gathering, collection, uh, processing, modeling, and finally uh, implementing in on production and running on production. Except that, in addition, we provide also uh, SaaS services that are connected with some uh, commonly uh, use, uh, common, uh, common uh, use cases that happen in many uh, lending companies like um, uh, data quality and location intelligence on so dealing with bad data, collecting data and uh, enrich them then, and uh, uh, ready to use credit scoring and anti-fraud uh, uh, detection and fraud detection solutions. Uh, as you probably know, running uh, loan uh, business is not an easy task. Uh, we have a lot of uh, factors that influences uh, our business, external factors. It may be uh, regulatory changes, it may be some market changes, it may be disruptive competitor uh, who have a new, uh, new solution, a new, new product. It may be even some macroeconomic crisis that affect our, our uh, customers. So every of, of this uh, change, every of this, uh, of this uh, change on market trigger some action in our organization. So uh, first we need to dig up data, uh, look at data, search a new, um, a new strategy data. So we prepare a new version of uh, risk management strategy, new models, new predictive models. After that, we implementing it. After that, we uh, testing it and calibrating on production. So there is a lot of, a lot of such a cycles that can be run simultaneously. So having a, a good toolbox for managing this process is a crucial part of of, uh, of operations uh, to be agile and to be uh, to be uh, uh, ready to to deal with uh, with these all these changes, but uh, not only agility is uh, is something we can uh, we can we can bring using analytical platform. Uh, the main benefits are moving manual onboarding to uh, automated onboarding. So typically, all businesses. Or bonding on new SME customer it takes a couple of days, for example. We can uh, uh, make it even uh, as quick as a couple of minutes. Uh, 
second uh, problem is uh, user experience. Typically, in all businesses, a customer should provide even hundreds of information to uh, run through the onboarding process. Having integrated and automated all uh, data uh, in one place, uh, we, need, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, make this uh, application for shorter and only a couple of information to run this process automatically. So from customer, it is a huge, uh, huge benefit. And of course, it's reduced our drop, drop rate. Uh, we can uh, use better decision models, better, better decision models based on machine learning uh, that uses a lot of uh, different information in uh, opposite to simple rules that, uh, that maybe use only a couple of information that are ineffective and uh, sometimes biased. So some group, big groups of our customers, may, potential customers may be included from, excluded from our uh, services because of inefficiency of these, of these rules. And another benefit is uh, speeding up learning curve. Having algorithms and data in one place, we can easily uh, mine knowledge from the data and uh, find out uh, new features, new rules that are important in uh, managing uh, credit and fraud risk. And of course, we can reduce some IT spends and uh, time we spent on developing new software uh, using low code and rapid development approach uh, included in, in such a platform. Uh, the next question is how to develop such uh, digital, uh, digital uh, platform that cover all all needs uh, we have in in, in area of uh, credit risk assessments on anti-fraud. Some companies started to build from the scratch their own applications. Some built a couple of or dozen of applications that cover some parts of this process. These applications are connected with strange uh, strange uh, way. It, finally, uh, it may uh, it may bring us fully digital process, but still there is a lot of application difficult to. Uh, to manage with uh, difficult connections, difficult to understand and difficult to quickly adjust to, uh, to changes. So uh, in many cases, uh, it, uh, and it's uh, some, such an in-house development of many applications uh, end up with such a mess as you see in this, in this, in this slide. Uh, another alternative, searching for something uh, ready to use in the machine learning AI space, there are hundreds of tools. Some of these tools are very, very well, Ryland tools that cover some parts of our, of our, uh, of our um, uh, operations. But still, we have a lot of different applications that we need to uh, integrate, we need to set up. They are not our applications, so we don't know exactly how they work. We can't uh, modify them. Some still Maybe it is easier because we use uh, ready-to-use components, but still we have to use a lot of components uh, together. So in Algolytics, we believe that the best solution is one integrated platform that is very agile. So we have everything, uh, our whole our process is simply configuration of the platform and not feature of this platform. And this platform is, uh, have all uh, required tools and data Included, included in one place. So for your uh, core banking system, so for your loan management system, it is only one point to integrate. Only one place you uh, ask for the decision and uh, get the decision back. And uh, what uh, type of tools should be included in such a platform to be, to, 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 to be enough uh, complete and agile? Uh, First thing is uh, monitoring and reporting. So our platform running on production should provide us information about how our process works and uh, uh, whether enough uh, working uh, correctly. Uh, another uh, role of this reporting service is uh, provide data for the future development of new uh, machine learning models or uh, new analytics. So we need to collect data for future development. Uh, decision engine, it is something, uh, something uh, very important. Decision engine, that is engine that um, have 
uh, some user interface, uh, graphical user interface, uh, interface that um, uh, allow us to combine algorithms and data and rules, business rules in one place, uh, typically in low-code approach, so without, without uh, software development. IT infrastructure, it is something that should be invisible from this uh, point of view. Uh, things like scalability, compliance, security, security or um, some kind of cost effectiveness, so uh, thinking about whether I have or no uh, uh, disk space, uh, it's something that we should be uh, hide under the hood of this, of this software. So, uh, uh, so this is very important. And data, data it is the, the most crucial uh, part of our process. Um, if you uh, are familiar with machine learning processes, about 80% of typical uh, development of machine learning uh, uh, solutions, it is uh, time spent on gathering and collecting and cleaning data. So if we have in our platform ready to use uh, data connectors and data, uh, get it. it is very useful and it speed up our development and, and, and running of production. In analytics, we, uh, we collect uh, all available public data about companies in one place because these data are distributed in different uh, places, in different uh, organizations, government uh, agencies, and, are dif different to, and are, they are difficult to, uh, to, uh, to collect. So we download this data clean and store in one place. We store uh, blacklists. We uh, have um, uh, labeling engine for uh, bank trans uh, transactions. Uh, we provide location intelligence, intelligence uh, uh, services. So it is very important in our scoring models the place where the company operates, the, uh, uh, the place the company is uh, registered. Uh, we have uh, data connectors for credit bureaus. Uh, we provide uh, some open source intelligence tool. So uh, uh, internet search and summarization information from the internet is very important uh, in many cases when we, uh, when we uh, assess uh, business uh, uh, business uh, customer, we search some open uh, information about about the, about this customer. We provide also tracking codes and SDKs for mobile application because, in the first place, if you have fully digital process, we uh, we can collect data uh, from uh, from, for example, mobile application or web page and uh, get and collect this data and process and use it for, for example, anti-fraud um, uh, discovery. And uh, the last thing is uh, internal data that we integrate. And of course, all machine learning algorithms, pre-trained models, uh, something, uh, learning algorithms, something that is required to uh, build a new models and uh, run in a production. So uh, we need to be sure that we have all required, uh, uh, required uh, tools to run this whole process. So, Every of our tools covers some element of this process, and it is it is it is integrated. And uh, I would like to show you something that uh, will help to understand how it may work. This low-code approach uh, from the perspective of uh, user of this platform. So uh, here we have some uh, process of building new models. So we start with new predictive model. Uh, data are already in platform. Data they are data gathered from from past operations. And now we deploy this model on uh, decision engine. Uh, we move to decision engine. We uh, look at this, uh, at this model. And after that, we can use low-code designer to uh, build uh, new decision uh, process. So we start with defining the input data. Um, after we define this input data, we can put our predictive model to the process. So we put these predictive models. Uh, we, after that, when we have scores from these predictive models, we use these uh, results for uh, delivering some simple decision. In this case, we divide our customers for two groups, good and bad customers, based on the uh, scoring results. Of course, in real, um, uh, real, uh, real cases, these graphs are very much more complicated. They use a lot of, a lot of data integration and a lot of a lot of uh, models uh, together. 
but, uh, but this is something that uh, can you help to understand how we can uh, make work. So there is no development. We can uh, ready to use uh, scenario. We can click deploy button and have it deployed on, on production. So summing up uh, the main, uh, main benefits on using this integrated, uh, integrated environment with integrated data and integrated all necessary tools. Uh, the, the most important it is uh, the, in our ability to quick to making quick changes. Even small changes in traditional uh, approach uh, may, uh, may take weeks, even months to, 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 uh, to develop new uh, simple feature in our, in our scoring sorting. We can uh, make it shorter. We can, uh, we can uh, do it in uh, hours and uh, days. Uh, we can uh, simplify our our uh, environment by using only one tool uh, in contrast to using many, many applications that are uh, connected together. Uh, so uh, sometimes in traditional uh, systems, one small change, uh, one, one small change uh, trigger some three of changes in other, in other uh, parts of the application. So uh, these multi-level changes are uh, not the case anymore. Uh, we uh, get the flexibility of this uh, of our of our environment, and we can uh, easily make change in this graph uh, uh, using low code designer. And uh, something that I haven't mentioned before, uh, it is security and compliance. Using one application that process all customer data, it is um, it is situation when we have better uh, control on data integrity and data security. When we pass our data through many applications, especially external applications, external vendors, we can, uh, we can lose the track of this data, how they change, how, uh, how they are processed, and uh, we can lose uh, integrity. And losing integrity from the future development is something uh, that is the worst case scenario, because after that, if you have uh, bad data, we, 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 can't, we can't use to, uh, to improve our process. Okay, um, this is the uh, end of my presentation. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin and Christian, for your presentations. Uh, I invite you yeah, back uh, at the stage, and uh, let me first of all invite Michal Pavlik, Vice President for the Product Development CE Region at uh, Nithon. And uh, Michal will moderate the panel discussion. Uh, and also, let me invite Bala Stopor, SME segment leader, Raiffeisenbank International Austria, Kamil Goswawski, uh, key account manager, Krif Poland, and Yuzhi Lexa, head of marketing and partnerships at Limonero. Yes, I think all of you are on the stage. I'm passing ah, the mic. Guys, it's simpler. Yes. Like we know yes, where it's to sit. It's how you yeah, how you should yeah. sit it. <laughs> yeah, guys, sit down. I have a microphone for each of you. You have a lot of microphones, so like yeah, Christian, you're here, marching here. First of all, I have to say that I'm unhappy that we don't have any woman among us. It's always nicer, but maybe next time. Uh, maybe a different moderator next time. Yeah. Uh, so, let's talk about the SME finances as a uh, whole day. And I'm really happy of uh, having here also the providers, the fintechs and the software. Uh, companies, maybe Christian. Let's start on the beginning, like to to like about the whole topic. How do you evaluate a pace of the digitalization in SME area lending this year, as we almost the year is finishing? How you see? Do we have an acceleration, slowdown? We are after the COVID period. So, how do you see it now? I'm not sure whether it's necessary. It's a very good question. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm not sure whether it's indeed an acceleration or a slowdown, but I see a little bit more substance in the topic. Yeah? Um, previously, it was what is technically feasible, 
And as you heard today also during the conference, it's also about what is really accepted by the customers, um, focusing more on what the customers want and not just what's technically possible. Yep. So therefore, I see a little bit more in-depth development. I'm not sure whether this means an acceleration, but I see it more substantial, I would say. Uh, maybe maybe some, some of you like to add something to that, like a general view, how this last year, of this year is almost finished, looks like, uh, especially after this period of this, like let's say the break, where, which we have after the COVID. Uh, uh, Balash, I see that. Let me continue because we are the market leader bank in, in, in this region at least. Uh, picture is a bit mixed because on the different markets with the, we see totally different developments. So you were mentioning a longer time frame from the COVID for sure. We had a, a, a boom in the, in the lending needs. But more important is the last one, one and a half years. Mm -hmm. that in this new, after the war, in this new area of, of um, gas and all of those prices bumping up, huge inflation. So this has an impact. But this is a very selected one. So we still have uh, countries where there is demand and the loan books are growing, but there are really other ones where, where we are really not saying we stopped lending, but the demand as such is not there anymore. So again, picture mixed. So far after the COVID region, we were, we were totally agreeing with you. But from the war started, kicked in, and especially in all markets, we are represented, unfortunately, uh, with the suffering countries as well. It's, it's, it's a totally mixed picture. And just as you mentioned, you are also present in Ukraine. Uh, how does the situation change now as this you think, important topic, just to know? Ukraine is, is simply amazing because we are still landing in Ukraine. There are still many companies coming for loans, coming for lending. So which me personally, and this is purely a, a personal uh, sharing, if I may do that, that I never ever imagined that the country which is bombed, which is in war, and there are entrepreneurs who are still continuing the actions and, and, and agriculture simply needs that you need to put the growths, they need to do the seedings, they need to harvest. Cafeterias are still open, branches needs to be open, you still need to manage the, 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 the cash flows, the, the, the cash needs of the customers. Um, on the other hand side, it's still true for Belarus, it's still true for Russia. So it's, it's very difficult to judge the situation. But let's focus on that part for yep. whom we are here, for the SMEs, because SMEs are individuals in each of the countries and they are not stopping activities, they are continuing it. I, visit, I think this is what you just said about the, the behavior of the entrepreneurs in, in Ukraine. It shows like how SMEs are flexible, how SMEs are strong. I think like in many economies, in Central and Eastern Europe, even here in Poland, the SMEs are like a core of the all. Of course, the GDPR is produced by also the big companies, but I can say we, because I was also an entrepreneur, now I'm not, but you know, I, I had this experience, we're more flexible. That's why we can adjust even to such a difficult situation, environment, which is war. It's not only, for me, it's about, about survival. Yes. Survivor restarting. Let me bring another example. I was, I was having a holiday a year ago. I was in, in Ceylon, Sri Lanka. There was a guy who was driving us from one city to the other and, and, and he told to me that, that finally after 15 years being in this industry, I was able to put the down payment for my first van. And I had a van. I was driving tourists. And then COVID kicked in. And the oh. whole country and the tourism almost collapsed. And the guy was after, it was beginning of this year. So after two or three years of COVID, he was driving a car, which he was asking from somebody else to earn money. And he, with, with, with sparkling guys, told to me that now I will put the down payment for my f new tuk-tuk. So it's not a van anymore, it's yeah. a tuk-tuk. <laughs> but he was totally knocked down. Van was taken by the leasing yes. company. He restarted. And um, yes, I did not want to bring this, this Ukrainian or, or Russian example, but, but another one from far, far away, another part of the globe. But, but I truly believe that SMEs, yeah. micros, middle ones, they are really based on family businesses. They simply must to survive and they will survive. That's for sure. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this, uh, this, this, this outcome. Uh, maybe, maybe just a few words about this topic. How this year 
was from your perspective after we'll go deeper to the products and everything? Yeah, yeah. From our uh, little point of view from Monero, because we are lenders or online lenders in Czech and Slovakian market and also in Benelux. Uh, I can Czech and Slovakia. Yeah, Czech and Slovakia, <laughs> not Czechoslovakia. I'm so old, but I remember that it was one country back then, you know, I remember Czechoslovakia yeah, yeah, as so one it, country. Yeah, it's Czech and Slovak, not Czechoslovak. Uh, but I can say that we are growing, you know, because uh, as you told, uh, SMEs are really flexible and they are trying to use these opportunities uh, to benefit with, uh, f from them, even if it's uh, in the first, uh, first look, it, it could look like, you know, it's negative thoughts but they are trying to, to benefit from that somehow. Yep. And uh, of course they are trying to be more careful. Uh, and uh, if, I, if I compare the Western European mentality of the SMEs, I would say that they are you know, uh, really more, more open-minded and straightforward uh, because uh, they are used to get a loan for some kind of investment opportunities and they are uh, almost you know, uh, trying to look forward to it uh, and uh, in the Czech and Slovakian market, uh, I can see a huge difference from my marketing perspective view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wait a second. Like, as, as, I, as I have you, the, you, I think that you are like a great example of expanding business, going more to the, to the, to the product. We'll come back to the market, don't worry. Uh, you begin in the Czech Republic and Slovakia, and now you expand to Europe. Uh, you are representing this embedded finance fintech, which is, I think, something which is really growing. I will also will ask you more about it. How you assess the European market of the embedded finance? How you see the market? Maybe let's start off this here, CE, but also broader. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even on CE market and the Western European market, the uh, most crucial thing for us is to have a strong, powerful par partner uh, in our back. And uh, for us uh, right now, it's KB, Commercial Banka from Czech Republic, and it's our credit uh, associator. And uh, of course, Societe Generale, which is a French bank, and uh, that is, uh, I think, the first uh, first important thing. And the second one is to find a uh, right partner into that in, in in that country. You know, for example, in uh, in Dutch, we found uh, two two biggest uh, e-commerce platforms. Yeah. And uh, we need those kinds of partnerships for every in each country because uh, we are working with the merchants, with the SMBs, for which are, who are using these platforms. Uh, so we, uh, crucial, uh, we, we really need those platforms and have these partnerships and API integrations and things like that, because we need the data flow from the, from the platform to make a scoring uh, and uh, risk assessments and things like that and give them the offer of financing. So on the one hand, you have a financing from banks. You mentioned two of them. And on the other hand, uh, you have e-commerce platforms for businesses where you deploy your product, yes? Yeah, yeah that's, that's it. And I think this example shows something amazing in fintech world. Is first, you have banks which finance fintech because we have a bank here. They are not able to do it alone. This is the question, why? You mentioned two big banks. One is French group, huge one. Why they're not able to do it alone? Why they need you as an intermediary and they're losing some part of their margin? Should I, should I answer it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can be frank. We have only Raiffeisen here and some Polish banks on the, on the, in the audience. So. Yeah, maybe, maybe a quick answer. I, I can totally agree with you that uh, I think that the banks are aware of uh, the, the lack of the technology and the digitalization progress on their own because they have a huge bureaucracy, you know, and uh, I can see it uh, that it's, it's hard for them, you know, to develop so, so quickly. So some of the banks are, uh, are now understand the problem and they're trying to look, in, look for the easiest solution and uh, uh, I think that in this case it's uh, it's a fintech or cooperation or something like that. No. Yeah, maybe let's have an a, a answer from the bank and also I will ask you. About it. My smile is a bit artificial. I need to admit <laughs> here. Uh, true, 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 true. <laughs> once once we will speak about our transformation project, you will see that it started four years ago. Two years we were using only for creating a concept, one year for getting the approval, half year of making a decision, do we do on our own or we are buying from somebody? 
uh, another nine months to select that from whom we should buy. And the technical development was two years, one year probably about setting up the infrastructure, get, being able to gather and, and, and pull in the data. And purely setting up the BPM, the decision engine, doing all the parameterization for many various markets, it was, let's say, six months. Currently, we are doing it in, in, in three months. So yes, we are slow. But once the giant walks up, then <laughs> there will be a challenge for you guys. This is what I can promise. Of course, of course. And I said, yeah, I'd just like to add, as, as you and uh, Marcin, you are providers of some solutions which can help grow banks, but also fintechs. Maybe just, just, just to the discussion, let's, let's stick to this topic, which is amazing. Yeah, maybe one comment uh, from my side, because I represent Creve, and we are a service provider for, let's say, the banks, yeah? on one hand, and for the other hand, also we provide uh, additional services uh, for the uh, e-commerce uh, entities, and also we, we try to support uh, SMEs. And what is my observation, uh, in one hand, when I cooperate with the banks, they want to act as a uh, e-commerce, and they want to act somehow uh, like a marketplaces. Yep. And in, on the other hand, e-commerce want to act and maybe learn something from the banks. And there is a, some kind of a balance between the uh, knowledge sharing, the technology sharing between them. And I think that the, the crucial at the moment is uh, to, to get that balance and to, let's say, allow banks to somehow act as e-commerce because customers yeah. expect it. Because when yeah. I'm, as a consumer, uh, when I use the e-commerce uh, platforms and uh, services like BNPL, uh, I also uh, want to be able to uh, use similar products and solution uh, in case I provide in the, the business, yeah, as a B2B partner. Understand, understand. Because understand. also uh, from my observation, when we provide uh, solutions, data for the BNPL entities, uh, we also observe that uh, there is a, uh, let's say, huge opportunity uh, to support the, the, that entities in case of operating with the customers, but also with the business entities. Yes. Yeah? So we, we can observe that BNPL uh, growing since the pandemic uh, time. And I think that it's, it's a huge opportunity for the banks, for the fintechs, and also e-commerce to, to try to cooperate between and try to catch that, that balance. Yeah, I will be in this cooperation in a minute, just marching as from your perspective, because it's an amazing case. I love this case, you know, when you have the FinTech in the middle, you have bank and you have e-commerce platforms. So like, let's, let's see, as you are also supporting FinTechs, with amazing yeah, yeah. tools, which you showed. We work uh, both with uh, the financial institutions, banks, uh, FinTechs, as well companies that work in mentor uh, credit. Yes. So there is also important. Is, it is typically not uh, not recognized as a lending business, but in fact it is. So uh, banks, uh, you know, banks are uh, um, uh, organizations that works slowly. They have a long-term roadmaps. There is, of course, need for dig digitalization. Dig digitalization going on, uh, on, but it 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 is some stable, slow process. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of pro open projects, but every of the projects takes months, years. But in the other hand, we see a huge demand from this uh, fintech sector and these companies who work with uh, merchandise credit. Uh, now there's a lot of new companies on the market that uh, start their business, that uh, work for, have, have been working for two or three years on small scale, gathering some uh, knowledge and so uh, knowledge about market and about and gathering also data for build the internal system yes and now they're kicking uh, with the with the with the process of digitalization and there are very quick and rapid proce uh, processes projects in three months we need to deliver whole yep. uh, whole uh, whole infrastructure models uh, uh, data and of course uh, i see very uh, very um, uh, uh, huge, um, uh, huge demand for for this uh, technology for for lending for these uh, companies who work with merchandise credit, uh, because I, in in many cases it for them it is uh, one of the um, crucial 
element of uh, being competitive on market, but giving their customers a, a credit, yes. it is something that can uh, generate them uh, extra revenue, new customers. Of because, course. Because especially now when the uh, macroeconomic situation is worse, uh, where uh, companies have worse financial results, external financing is something that is very mm -hmm. valued by these mm -hmm. companies. Thank you. Companies. Thank you for this. And there is also an option to digitalize banks, which you do, your company does. You, know, you can help also to help banks being more digitalized and compete with the fintechs. Right. And, and in addition to everything what my colleagues have said, I think there are two more, two more aspects in that. One, of course, yes, the banks are conservative and the banks are slow. But that's on purpose, because the banks also are stable and in the end, yeah. they are sort of a utility function. And as such, you don't want them to be too adventurous. You want them to have a certain slow uh, development. But, of course, the collaboration with a fintech, which mitigates the risk. I'm just collaborating. I'm not putting this all in-house. I can cancel that collaboration if it doesn't work anymore. But I can test that. And that's, that's certainly a beneficial factor. On the other hand, of course, it was extremely difficult uh, up until recently to drive a fintech against the wall. There were no interest rates, liquidity was plenty, so it was really difficult to fail as a fintech. Now we see that fintechs have some challenges on occasion as well, specifically around funding, but also in long-term yes. client relationships. And that's an opportunity for banks to catch up again, maybe get them in-house, maybe uh, have them as a credit as a service, or find the uh, previous fintech employee or entrepreneur as a, a department head. There are options that goes both ways. So it's it's... I don't think that fight is over, or I think there's a winner or a loser. There will be a collaboration for some time to find the right business model, and there's a, an option for various parts, for the fast-moving fintech, but also for the slower-moving long-term client relationship, because one aspect is, of course, important for the SME. It's not just about dispersing the next product. It's also about being around, as you mentioned before, during a crisis, having somebody in the bank you can talk to as a relationship manager if there's a problem to manage if there's a need for restructuring, if there's a need for a postponement of services. That's where fintechs in the past were not as strong because they lacked that physical, that, inter that, that knowledge of the customer. So it's a, it's a wave and yep. I think it's an interesting observation and gives opportunities to many business, different business models. Yeah? So we have, we just discussed this left side, so the funding and the bank situation, but I think in this competing market, we also have this e-commerce platforms with which we have to work. And this is also, I think, amazing, because, for example, what we see in Poland, we have an amazing example here in Poland, on the Polish market, where there was a very innovative BNPL company, which starts to work as you with the big e-commerce platforms. I think we can mention the name, the biggest e-commerce platform in Poland, Allegro. But after just, I think, even less than one year, Allegro as an e-commerce platform starts to support their customers with their own BNPL product. And now Allegro's product is bigger, is the biggest in the Polish market, one of the biggest in the Central Eastern Europe. So the e-commerce like bypass the, 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 the fintech and is having their own risk management, their own fintech inside, and they are the biggest in the market. So I see there are like now three competitors in this lending market. You have banks, you have fintechs, and you have e-commerces. This is also the, the question about the future. So maybe let's, let's talk about the debt maybe more. Um, how you see this, how to, because in, this, in the situations is what I one thing, the, the one who is winning in the situations are you, are, you know, the, the companies which support all of them. You support with the risk management, with the, with also risk management and the, 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 the data, yeah? So where's the future? Maybe the question to you guys. So with whom, who, who will be your future customer? Banks, e commerce fintechs? I think that the, um, the crucial for us as a, let's say, a service provider for, for the banks and e-commerce entities is to cooperate with, uh, let's say, whole spectrum, yeah? Because mm -hmm. in case that we'll, uh, let's say, want to uh, cooperate only in one 
uh, let's say, uh, leader as a bank, for example, or e-commerce, and we will close the relationship with the different source of the revenue and the different source of, uh, of uh, even products. Uh, it will be hard to, uh, to let's say, have the um, stable situation. And I think that, as you mentioned, uh, there is a specific, uh, specific situation in the market that uh, e-commerce platform want to also provide for the customers additional values. Yes. They create the, the fintechs, let's say, that, uh, for example, providing the BNPL solutions. But also the banks, let's say, want to do something uh, uh, very common because of fact, for example, Pico Pay. Uh, and uh, Alior Bank in Poland also they already they started start, this yeah, BNPL. The yeah. new new product, uh, yeah. Allegro Pay. Uh, so, sorry, uh, Alior Pay. And yeah. uh, from the PKO uh, perspective, there is also additional uh, product for the for the customers. And from my perspective, uh, I would say that we we have to try to um, get that balance and cooperate with, uh, let's say all yeah. of them, to, yeah. to make sure that it will be, let's say, win-win situation yeah? for all of us, for the banks, for service providers and e-commerce. Yeah. Marcin, probably as you established the company a few years ago, you started probably collaboration first with fintechs, yeah? As I uh, could remember. Yes, with fintechs, but also with these uh, companies who do some kind of lending processes for also SME businesses, but are not fintechs, but any uh, or any. Okay, let's bank. call them like a, like a not ba not banking, like utilities not or something yeah, like, like not banking. Yeah. So, how you see the future? Who will be your main customer? I think the innovation incub incubator still will be uh, this fintech sector and this. Uh, 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 not not the banking sector, uh, because uh, of course there are a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, features that that um, uh, that uh, support this. There's uh, less regulations, smaller organizations, uh, organizations that are um, focused on uh, uh, high growth. So they they are aggressive. Yeah, they want to yes. they want to they want to uh, um, acquire a lot of customers. They have a rise uh, rise a, a lot of funds and 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 rise quickly. So of course uh, the innovation uh, innovation. But also also banks are are, are are we we will follow after that because you know because for banks also these uh, these fintech companies are so huge com competitors. Yeah. If, if they start to uh, working uh, quickly, uh, they will have a very good um, uh, credit uh, assessment uh, systems and they will, will not uh, uh, finance uh, bad customers. They uh, start to be uh, important competitors for traditional uh, financial institutions. So, uh, so uh, I, I, I think uh, in innovation, innovation will will be triggered by the uh, by the uh, fintechs. Yes. But uh, uh, financial institutions will follow follow, follow after these yeah. innovations. Talking about innovation, talking about the processes, is it now possible having so many processes, having so many? Uh, companies who are delivering so many face recognition, uh, credit scoring, engines, AI, everything, is now possible in 2023, 2024, to build a fully automated digital customer onboarding, like 100%, everything, from your perspective? Mm -hmm. uh, from the technology perspective, I believe yes. Uh, but uh, there is second part, uh, access to the data mm -hmm. and quality of the data. It still is, uh, there is a still a lot of, uh, of work to do. Uh, I know that, uh, for example, European Union, from the regulatory uh, point of view, do a lot to, uh, to allow data sharing and, and uh, build some legal framework to, to, to make, it, make it happen. So uh, the, the main, uh, the main uh, problem is that uh, Still, we don't have uh, uh, we don't have uh, easy access to all data required to uh, 
uh, to, uh, to make an automatic assessment, especially for the new customer, because if you have a, a customer that have a long relationship with us, it is possible, as you mentioned uh, uh, yesterday about, about your bank uh, who, who finance your family from for generations, yeah? So they, you have very long relationships and they can make a decision quick because they know you well. But, uh, but for the new customers, we need to, um, we need to uh, easy access, access to data and good quality, quality data. And the second, uh, second problem is that the data are fragmented. Even in, uh, for example, European Union, in different countries, there are different um, uh, level of access to this data and the different uh, uh, methods of provide by governments uh, some data mm -hmm. by banks uh, exchange. It's a lot of work in this data. If we uh, if we uh, solve this problem as a whole market, I think it it it, it will be uh, possible to make uh, automatic assessment. It, it also depends on the scale of 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 of, uh, of uh, ticket. Yeah. So of if, course. If you if you if you if you if you borrow small, uh, small amount of money for a short uh, period of time, now it is, it is uh, possible to automate. If yeah, in is, payday is, loans, we see it. Yeah. If, if it is a uh, big amount of money uh, and the risk concentration on the one customer is, is huge, of course, it requires uh, manual evaluation. Of because of are the collaterals and everything, yeah. Yes. From your perspective, Kamil. Uh, I will totally agree. Uh, that uh, from the technical point of view, there is, let's say, uh, no issue because of the fact that at the moment we have so many uh, different systems, tools, solutions, approaches. Uh, and uh, from my perspective, uh, I think that the, the biggest blocker will be the uh, regulations. Yeah, because of the fact that, of course, we we also we always want to be more flexible, but uh, in case of financial institutions, there is always, let's say, the, the challenge, maybe not the issue, uh, with the regulations, because financial institutions uh, are the uh, institution of the public trust. Yes. Yeah, And we always have to uh, pay attention about the regulations and the uh, law, because that is, the, from my perspective, the biggest blocker. Yeah, because the the um, legislation is uh, changing so fast, and maybe not uh, so fast to meet the challenges of the market from the yes. technical point of view, but there is a lot of areas to cover, like ESG, like AI, machine learning, and so on and so on. That I think that the the legislation will be the the biggest blocker. Yeah, perspective of the bank. Just what I think should be emphasized now, uh, Raiffeisen Bank International uh, got two rewards here uh, in uh, SME Banking Club conference in the last years. Uh, Tatra Bank in Slovakia and Raiffeisen Czech uh, Republic was awarded at a, as, a, as a top uh, banks in the best SME lending. Congratulations for that, but it's not Justice, because you did a lot, and last time you also transformed and digitalized SME lending journey in next countries in Albania, yes, Romania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Croatia. And I, I got some numbers which are really amazing. How you transform the the process from days to minutes, if you can say a few things about it, like. Quick question to the audience. Have you ever tried to write down your own name 690 times? Like one time in a row? Yeah. Maybe have you, Do you have a guess that how much minutes you need to write down your own name 690 times? How long is it? Your own name? Few hours. One hour. Two, one hour, three. few hours. Okay. If you are fast enough, it's 34 minutes. Oh, really? 34 minutes. And, and the 690 is an uh, interesting number because these were the fields which we were asking in Albania from a single loan, only for an overdraft renewal. We know the customer, he is with us for 10 years, but in every year we were asking 690 fields. And not the only name of the company, not the name of the owner, but financials. Yeah. In reality, even the 
owner survive blood type, we were asking, believe me. Um, and this is from where we started, and yes, we are making a decision in 30 minutes, and we are doing the disbursement in 60 minutes. So within an hour, you got the 16 money. 16 minutes. Yeah, 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 and you got the money up to half a million euro. So it's not the private entrepreneur is coming in and buying some, no, it's, it's, it's real stuff and hard stuff. So there was this transformation, but, but, but coming back to your question that, Yes, on a stage of a conference, it's it's fancy. We did blah blah. Oh, this conference is but, fancy. Uh, but my answer to all of these questions is: it theoretically possible? Yes, it is. But for whom? Because SME as such is a very simple word. But still, there is the micro, there is the small. Behind the SME, we have the single entry and the double entry and the flat tax payer. Behind that, we have the ownership structure of the private individual, of a yes. legal entity, or a legal entity owned by another legal entities. And then we have the different geographies where legally you can do remote identification, you can do remote contracting, and there are other geographies where you cannot. Yes. So the simple answer is not so simple. It's not black, it's not white. Yes, on the stage here, it's a yes, we can do and we will do and we will transform everything. But if you do a double click, we see that in some cases, in some countries, in some uh, customer segments, it's just purely an automatic decision. And then still a human is needed. And then maybe a remote identification contracting is not possible. But there are components, and here I totally agree with all of you, that technology is, is, is just booming. It's yes. just booming. It's extremely fast. And there will always be components which we can reuse in the different stage of this automatization of the entire uh, lending process and lending flow. So more to come. Technically doable, even legally doable, even in some cases immediately doable. But the way we are moving, and I remember how we started, that in some network, uh, some countries, the network banks were the ones who reached out to the local regulators and pushed them to have remote this, remote that, contracting. So even if you are big enough, and maybe it's difficult for the for the fintechs, but but if you are an old traditional big guy and you go there, they start to listen to you, and the whole environment is changing slowly. But I believe we will get there. So. Let's agree with the yes, it's doable. Christian, I see that you like to add something. No, I, like. I think I mean, uh, on the whole discussion, it's actually quite interesting. You brought up the, the buy now, pay later, which from my perspective is not necessarily an SME product other than the idea that you as an SME can sell your product to a consumer. But we also have buy now, pay later for SMEs. Of course, but, but right now, look, buy now, pay later for me is benefiting from the idea that you want to have something and you are yes. willing to pay a higher price for that. That is not necessarily the traditional SME entrepreneur that you were just elaborating on. Yeah, That's, yes. um, That guy needs a subscription to a working capital that is continuously available, not necessarily the ad hoc payment. He needs that service now, next year, and every year, and he needs to be around. And This needs to be available because you know the customer well and you can work with them. So where exactly that pans out is really around that relationship centricity that I, I had it in my, my workshop yesterday with with Michael Ruckman uh, there as well to talk about what is it really that the client needs and there needs to be one counterpart that could very well be the bank from my perspective to manage that relationship and whether you produce everything on your own or whether you rely on a fintech to supply certain services that's a different thing it could be the marketplace it could be somebody else but it needs to be one place that is that mm -hmm. It's not the horse whisperer, it's the, the SME whisperer, the one who really understands what this SME needs to be in the long term successful as well as being approachable. And how we compose this under the surface in collaborations, in insourcing, or in the ability to have a buy now, pay later for the consumers to buy my products. That's something that we have to figure out together, but outside, and need to provide that service. That's what we owe to the SME actually mm -hmm, mm -hmm, as a service mm -hmm. in the end. So let's talk about future as we have just exactly five minutes. What will be the products of the future for SMEs? Let's think about 24, 25. For sure, I think we are somewhere around embedded finance. It works, we know, it's obvious. There is this new lending as a service. Uh, but also think about the, the young generation. They are not only in a retail banking, but the generation Z is also now, uh, also they are also entrepreneurs. They start their own businesses, first, second businesses. So 
how to finance them, what will be the products. Let's focus on this financing because it's, it's most important, I think, for SMEs. Maybe, Jiri, if you can start. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, for in the future, uh, financing and lending, uh, it will have to be, you know, in embedded in uh, their their uh, well-known uh, well-known uh, space uh, uh, and administration of uh, the tools or platforms they are using to to do their business. And of course, it's going to m m must be automated. You know, so the, for for example, we've got a unique product, revenue-based financing, for the clients with uh, with uh, payment services, payment services provi providers, and payment uh, payment how to say it, payment service providers. I would say, yes. and uh, the repayments are automatically in here. You know, so it's more much much more much more easy for for these uh, these merchants and i think that, that this is going to be future digital digitalized uh, fully automated and embedded financing in the best known uh, uh, environment for the for the smes mhm mm mm -hmm. so where the young generation so maybe financing on a tiktok <laughs> yeah yeah maybe 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 so uh camille i think that uh, also from our point of view we observe the, the situation that uh, the younger generation and the whole market uh, also pay attention to the, let's say, green uh, products and the green finance. And yes. uh, also there is a, let's say, huge impact of the SMEs to, to that area because of the fact that SMEs are the, let's say, uh, in a quantity, uh, the, there are uh, so massive in case of uh, influence for the big companies like banks in case of the uh, participants uh, of the supply chain, uh, value chain. And I think that uh, the banks, of course, understand that they, they uh, have to move to more greener, let's say, products and financing. And also the, the expectation of the market is uh, in, in, in that, that also the consumers and SMEs expect such, mm -hmm. uh, such ideas, such products. Yeah, this is also a topic about these green yeah. things. I'm just like mention. I live in Berlin and in Germany. There are a few banks who offer an account which is like a green account, meaning that they use. It's very funny. They use less paper to, I don't know, like to make processes connected with these customers who have these green accounts. And what is funny to have such an account? It's two, three times more expensive than having a normal banking account. Uh, but it's like a very German thing. <laughs> Martin, from your perspective, future, uh, future. next two years, I think the, generations. I think products and the way they are constructed, I will, they still be the same. If you look at the financial services in medieval times, you can find a lot of, a lot of uh, similarities with what we have uh, now. But uh, the, this digitalization and, uh, and, uh, and ability to quick onboarding new customers may generate some intermediate level of uh, companies who uh, 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 make some marketplaces or places when we need to connect a SME uh, company with some needs with a lot of offer that can be checked in instantly and uh, very well uh, connected with uh, a good uh, financing provider. Mm -hmm. So I think this, is, uh, this technology can make this market more competitive uh, because of uh, speed of making decisions. So we can uh, check a lot of offers in very short uh, time, not one offer uh, a month yeah. because of long processes. Balthus. I didn't like the question. <laughs> and, and I will explain to you why. It's four weeks ago, another story. Four weeks ago, I was on a wedding. And the wedding, uh, the young couple said that we get to know each other on Tinder. Uh, but the funny thing was that not the girl was swiping the guy, but the girl's mother. So the mother-in-law was swiping somebody based on that there was a, there was a marriage. <laughs> During that marriage, uh, the founder, the father-in-law, the founder of an SME company, 5 million euro annual turnover, said that I'm going retired because I founded this 30 years ago when the changing of the regimes in these markets happened. I'm tired enough. Here is the company, 5 million. So a guy took over the 5 million euro company who made a decision getting married on Tinder. One picture, two seconds. 
And the reason why I didn't like the question is that you were asking what are the products of the future. In reality, nobody likes us. We are bankers. You are financing. Nobody needs you. What the customers need, it's a solution. Yes. I need a machine. I have a business opportunity. I need a whatever, a business case, a plot. Yes. Whatever. We need to understand this and we need to offer a solution, invisible, immediate, not even products. Nobody knows what a working capital loan is, what's a term working capital, what's yes. revolving, and nobody knows. So I believe if we don't want to be dinosaurs here and having old school type of dating, not in there anymore, <laughs> this is what we need to learn that the world is changing so rapidly that, that, that even our words which we are using needs to be changed. So it's not about product, it's about understanding, it's about providing immediate solutions. Thank you very much for this and just like to wrap up, uh, Christian. I, I just, just a small joke on, on your Tinder example. I mean, <laughs> even Tinder doesn't believe in its own product, otherwise they wouldn't sell a one-year subscription to it. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, a, but talking about True. subscription, I think in the line of what you said, I think the weight is towards embedded finance and subscriptions, that indeed we offer solutions. You don't finance a storage home, you rent a storage space and you put in the financing cost into that rent. Or you you lease, I mean, actually you're not just leasing a car, but you're basically subscribing to a transportation opportunity that you continuously finance and you offer that SME, whatever transportation service is necessary, whether this is now the mail, the FedEx or the own transport. Those are the things we need to provide. These subscription ideas, the same way like in the US as a consumer, you now can subscribe to the iPhone. You no longer have to buy an iPhone, you have a subscription with Apple, and every two years they send you a new phone automatically. So that is basically yep. uh, solving your problems and then putting the finance in the back because, as you said, nobody really cares about that finance. Uh, let, let that do the banks in the end. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you very much. Let's see how, what future will bring us. Thank you very much. And uh, let's move to the next break. break. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. Join us for the CE 23 conference and SME Banking Awards on 29th and 30th of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using PartnerHub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. PartnerHub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for Beyond Banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. 
Partner Hub, your partner for beyond banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXeed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omnichannel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper-intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements and workflow management, AI-powered smart forms, straight through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings. This year, we invite you to Krakow. It 
which is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using PartnerHub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. PartnerHub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for Beyond Banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. Partner Hub, your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXeed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper-intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements, and workflow management, AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
Yes, we are back on stage. And now we will start the panel discussion uh, on the topic of digital sales for SMEs. And we start from the presentation, and after that we have a discussion. And I invite Efrosima Zogovic, Head of Sales, Logate. You are welcome on the stage. Uh, hello, everyone. It is my immense pleasure to be speaking at CE23, organized by our dear partner, SME Banking Club, which we consider important stakeholder for the growth of business professionals and banking professionals and the industry as a whole in Central and Eastern Europe, but also beyond. We at Logate are very passionate about SME banking because we see so many areas for growth. Uh, and you may think, but the level of digitalization is so low. And to be honest, yes. The most of the innovations are happening in the retail banking. And the, so most innovations happening in retail banking. And just notice how much we are used to it today. My colleague paid for a dinner via Google Pay last night. And my friend got her loan approved in under 30 minutes. We got so used to this banking in seconds that we grow tremendously impatient with anything that lasts longer than that. Um, digitalization in the SME banking is highly requested by our clients. And we can see that uh, sales teams are lagging behind their colleagues in retail banking divisions significantly, even lacking CRM solutions. Um, probably the fact of 99% of businesses in the European Union uh, will not blow anyone's mind, but this is important to know because they employ over 100 million people. And this means that you are impacting the lives of 100 million people through your products and services. Or better said, you have the potential to directly or indirectly impact the lives of 100 million people working for an SME and and we all know how challenging is uh, personalizing experience and how frustrating that is for SMEs. But we uh, still notice that uh, in many banks, relationship managers are using Excel or even their notebooks to keep track on valuable data and to manage sales opportunities. And look up anyone, well, that, that data can easily be lost, and these tools cannot be used for managing and tracking campaigns. And I don't know about you, but there's nothing in this world that can drive me insane as quickly as Excel, especially when using those advanced functions. According to a recent uh, corporate Banking Innovation Survey report, more than six in ten banks believe that the superior customer experience is a driving decision behind the choice of a bank. And this is not surprising, especially when UK Finance reports that 81% of clients are choosing their banks according to digital customer experience. And despite the wants and the needs and the awareness that exists, we see that banks still fail to reach the goals set out by the digital transformation projects they initiated. Uh, according to this uh, report, only 26% of them believe they succeeded in their digital transformation initiatives, and it is only in these two business lines. Well. I will specifically focus on sales departments as a salesperson myself. And these are the uh, trends and major shifts happening in the SME banking that we see as a vendor. Increasing number of lead generation sources. Blogs are important channel for lead generation. And we have example of our client, Erste Bank in Montenegro, with comprehensive content marketing strategy that enables them to educate leads, uh, segment them, and warm them up for the sales teams to follow up in order to provide uh, personalized uh, experience. Of course, there are many touch points between the client and the bank, which are automated before the initial contact with sales teams. So that saves them resources and qualifies leads during the process. 
Gen Z entrepreneurs. Well, this one is uh, dependent on macroeconomic and cultural factors, but Gen Z is quite entrepreneurial. And social media platforms have been around over a decade now, and they have caused behavioral shift that we all notice, but not only in kids, but in ourselves as well. Our level of concentration and our capacity of information retention have dropped dramatically, and we are more prone to use or to consume short video content rather than long textual posts. My colleagues, after my presentation, will talk about contextual banking, but uh, I certainly must mention new business models that are arising, and they are significantly affecting sales teams, but not only in terms of what they are selling, but also how. As you can, uh, could see uh, in the example of retail banking, banks uh, can no longer function it as a separate entities, but instead are expected to collaborate with fintechs, with non-banking stakeholders, in order to bring value to their customers. And when it comes to the SME banking, uh, it's kind of expected that the sales teams will have a role to play in these partnerships, managing not only direct sales, but also partner sales, which makes the lead life cycle management even more complex. And now you may see why it doesn't mean you should do something in Excel just because you can. And that is where we come in as a vendor of a specialized banking CRM solution that has its implementations in both retail and SME banking. CX360 is a specialized banking CRM solution which initially was developed as standalone loan tracking system for the needs of our clients. And the solution grew and developed into a CRM as we kept learning about the industry and improving the features. And there is a lot of talk about artificial intelligence, and please don't get me wrong, I do think there are some uh, interesting use cases for it, but I also think it's become massively hyped to some unrealistic expectations that it will solve all of your problems. And uh, it's got so big that uh, many organizations are looking for, uh, actively looking for artificial intelligence solutions without having some, let's call them, basic necessities for completing work. As Olena and her organization shared, only about 60% of banks in the CE region have implemented the CRM solution. And this is staggering, considering how much the data contained in the CRM is important for the sales in SME banking. And without a CRM solution, that data is like kept in a silo, and there is no structured data flow throughout the sales teams. So what happens if your top salesman decides to take his notebook and work for your competitor? Or what happens if he or she is absent? In these cases, Excel doesn't say much, no matter how many lookups you run. Um, I like to say that we are not just a vendor, but rather we are partner. We truly dive deep into your processes and needs before modifying our CRM to fit your needs, your goals, and your team. In the end, we do not want to add your logo to our, our client's page on the website and we are done. No. We want to ensure that your team uses CRM and benefits from it personally. With 360 Client View, uh, detailed reports and the management of the entire sales opportunities life cycle. We covered a lot for the sales departments, but recently we implemented a new module of our solution, which is Campaign Manager. Well, whether they are seasonal, uh, repetitive, or one-time campaigns, we managed to centralize sales, but also marketing efforts in uh, creating and managing them. And we all know how much segmentation is important. And yes, it can be done using various parameters, uh, which you can modify according to your existing data. 
all of your uh, campaign channels, including bank branches, are connected to the CRM, so you can get comprehensive reports to access the impact of those campaigns and their effectiveness in reaching sales and marketing KPIs. And the solution also helps isolate different parameters, split test the campaigns, and even modify the approach, if necessary, in order to reach the desired goals. And since we are talking about centralizing data and making decisions based on the data, we integrated our Connect, which is our omni-channel contact center solution with this CX360 CRM, uh, in order to provide a real-time 360 client view for the contact center employees handling calls so they can uh, be able to uh, execute outbound campaigns, provide better customer service, and of course resolve uh, issues much faster. So, as you can see, we are continuously developing and bringing new banking solutions to the market. And we build around your core, and we help you focus on fostering relationships while we take care about technology. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yefrosima. And now let me invite the moderator of the panel, Simon Kochi, co-founder at Everly EU. Yes, to start the panel. <laughs> Something or no? All good. Hello, everyone. I hope you still have some energy because we will be talking about what matters and it's money and sales. <laughs> so, uh, this panel discussion is going to be about the digital sales. Thank you very much about the introduction. I will leave the introduction to our speakers. Let's just jump right into it. So, please, uh, if you could introduce yourself, one, two sentences about yourself so I don't do any faux pas. From uh, straight from the beginning. Thank you for that introduction, and I think you gave some, you know, uh, energy to the room. Uh, my name is Jovan Radnic. I am a product marketing manager at Logate. Uh, you just heard my colleague speak, and uh, CRM is one of our solutions that we offer, like off-the-shelf uh, software. And uh, my role here is basically like we stepped out of this outbound role of marketing and we're doing more of the inbound in the sense that we're not just looking to educate our clients and potential clients about the, the solutions we offer and the industry as a whole, but we are also learning. That's why we're here. Yeah, uh, I am Onur. Uh, I am responsible for uh, digital uh, sales and marketing department uh, in Turkey, ING Turkey. Uh, I have been almost uh, in banking sector uh, 17 years and CRM uh, of course uh, for us uh, really important uh, tools uh, and now uh, we improve ourselves uh, day by day. Uh, so. uh, hello, my name is Martin Schlibertz. Uh, I'm from Latvia, I live in Lithuania and my company Flex Idea out of Latvia is also now currently operating in Poland. It's an invoice financing company, uh, super digital, 24 hours to the money, uh, best record 40 minutes maybe. And I have done a lot of sales, a lot of uh, digital sales, CRMs and stuff like that. So I think that will be interesting discussion today. Hey, Piotr Mieczkowski, Santander Bank Poland. I'm CPO, central product owner in Santander for SMEs. I focus on acquisition, digital acquisition, later activation, loyalization of customers and building some features for them in mobile application. Beautiful. Thank you very much for the introduction, gentlemen. First thing that I want to mention at the beginning, uh, listen and prepare any questions that you have. There will be five minutes, ten minutes at the end that you can ask them. And uh, you mentioned uh, this this word uh, CRM, right? Uh, so let's start uh, with that. So CRM should help you understand and, uh, your customers. So whenever somebody comes up uh, to your branch, you already have some information, right? But what turns out uh, that uh, actually uh, this doesn't happen. So people come to the branches and uh, uh, the 
uh, specialist in the banks, the bankers doesn't know anything about them. This happens in four uh, out of six banks. So 60% uh, of the banks have implemented uh, CRM, but uh, in a lot of them is not working well. So my question on you is uh, how to implement CRM well and how to use it well. Thank you. Uh, well, I think it's funny that you actually mentioned that because my colleague actually had an experience like that in a Montenegrin bank. She went to a branch and she spoke to the, the branch employee there who was basically like clueless about her. And uh, the process took like two or three more days because she couldn't have any details on uh, my colleague where she works, you know, things like that. Uh, sh they had to get it from the core. It took some time. She had to make some calls. It was a whole thing. Um, uh, you know, I certainly don't have uh, such a, an extensive uh, experience like the gentleman sitting on my left uh, in the banking industry. In fact, I've been at Logate for less than two years, actually. But uh, what I really noticed is like I like to talk to people in general, and I like to talk to um, people who know more about me, uh, more uh, than me about certain things. And uh, when it comes to the the banking industry, when we were uh, you know discussing things like in market thing you know you always want to address the problem and first you need to figure out what the problem is but usually when people talk about the problems they usually name uh, some uh, consequences of the actual problem so um, you would talk uh, I, I had a I had a, a pleasure to talk to many B level C level executives from different banks uh, many users of the CRM systems uh, or people in sales departments marketing departments and, and etc and we notice right away as a vendor that there is like this disconnect between what each department and each type of a decision maker so to say in the whole process wants out of the CRM solution so user wants one thing they want to have like a simple solution they don't think about these things oh my supervisor is gonna need to control me I need to complete all these reports etc etc they just want to do their tasks on the other hand you have their manager who is basically overseeing them who wants to see the uh, the reports who want to see how how well they're per performing how fast they're performing their tasks etc so you have another type and then you have like a guy or a boss above him you know uh, and uh, who wants uh, some more details and who wants you know profitability and things like that so there's like this uh, issue of the alignment like so each person has different goals and different needs uh, but they often, uh, I have to say, they, from what we've seen, they often don't talk between themselves uh, openly about it. So that's why when we implement something according to like the tender, you know, as as the tender requires, there is like a resistance uh, from the employees, and in a lot of the cases, they're not even sure why they're implementing a CRM. Why are they, you know, switching from? And I'm talking about some very basic ways of relationship management like notebooks or excel or uh, some old legacy systems that uh, you know uh, freeze up when you open the the, the window uh, to like uh, a modern crm and uh, y they don't see the benefits and no one explains it to them and uh, for me it's like the starting point you know getting the onboarding process i feel like starts when you publish a tender or even a little bit before mm. and you know, you get all of the people on board. And if you don't have that, I think it's also important to talk to the consultants that uh, have been in the industry yeah. for a while and that can help you figure out what your needs are, what is realistic on the market and what you can do because m maybe you're not aware of all the possibilities. No, the, totally, the, the, that makes sense. Uh, uh, maybe, oh no, uh, so what is your experience this because uh, uh, why and how to use the, the CRM, you know, the, yeah, uh, for the actually, implemented? Uh, when I think about what CRM is, uh, I imagine uh, a relationship manager who knows their customers very closely, who can offer them a personalized experience, who can establish uh, interactive dialogue rather than one-sided. Uh, actually, we can see in this approach personalization, segmentation, uh, campaign management, uh, uh, all about CRM. Actually, all of us uh, imagine uh, as a tool uh, in which uh, this approach is, is digitalized. Uh, as ING Turkey, we uh, sell more than uh, 30,000 uh, SME products annually, our uh, CRM tools. 
and when we are uh, managing the uh, CRM, we have lots of uh, dimensions and rules. And maybe uh, I can uh, share some of them. Uh, creating meaningful uh, interactive interaction with clients is really important for us because all of us uh, receive lots of SMS push call from everywhere. Uh, which of these do we read? Uh, what is uh, needed to be readable? Uh, these questions and answers are really important for our teams. Uh, and second, uh, developing uh, channels presentation skills uh, is important. Uh, because channels uh, should support each other, but in different ways. Uh, for example, uh, some of them can speak customers' visual memory. Some of them can speak their uh, numerical uh, memory. Uh, the other uh, modeling uh, is really important uh, when we are managing uh, CRM. Uh, customers touch us uh, from lots of points uh, and we have lots of data. If we use them uh, to create uh, models uh, such as uh, propensity models, churn models, retention models, and CRM performance uh, is going to well. Uh, as a result, uh, I think uh, CRM is all about customer uh, experiences uh, rather than uh, selling. Yeah. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I was just thinking, right? The, if I receive a push notification and it's just a generic message that doesn't apply to me at all, I'm like, I will just ignore it and maybe I will maybe even delete the app because it's uh, annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Martins, uh, what is your experience with uh, CRMs and helping it, uh, you to sell? Uh, yeah, I have some experience with CRMs in, in different industries. Uh, I think your first question was uh, how to make the CRM project well. I think it's very easy. You just make it simpler because uh, even when I was listening, guys, how you are implementing, you're totally right, correct, everything. But it was just so complicated. <laughs> I think that very often we overcomplicate CRM. Uh, we kind of managers come in and think that uh, employees need to fill 50 fields and stuff like that. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it doesn't really work at the end of the day and the efficiency is really bad. Uh, I think that you just need to have personalized stuff pulled up and to make it really easy on the employees and then employees will be happy to fill, will be happy to use and users will get the personalized experience. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's the thing. Uh, and uh, that's how, I think that's a key. It's uh, maybe different opinion, but that's a key to make it actually simple uh, and simple to use for both sides. Thank you. Uh, how about you? How is it working in Santander? Uh, I think that we have two interesting questions. First is how to build effective CRM and how to build not successful CRM. So I have seen a lot of models in uh, CRM models in the uh, last years. So I think I have good recipe, recipe how to fail. So it is thinking about numbers. So it is thinking how many campaigns we are ready to implement for our RMs. It's a thinking how many communication we are ready to send to our customers. So this is not CRM, so this is spam, to be honest. So if you wonder sometimes why your RMs don't use CRM, probably is not useful for them. If you're thinking why your customers are not reading communication, probably is not used for them. So I think that CRM is more about value proposition, about context, about quality, more than how many we can send information to customers. So I think it is when we build CRM, it's good to start with campaigns with the best hit ratio. For example, predictions model, which is said, propensity, based on triggers, for example, to build a trust and engagement uh, at the beginning. And sometimes, probably, uh, we don't have so many advanced analytic tools, we don't have business intelligence teams. So maybe in that case, it's good to start with your RMs. Go there, ask them, how do you search customers? How do you talk? About do, do, do you talk? and implement campaigns for rest of uh, sales channel. And in different way, 
you also go to the best RMs, but for example, with NPS high, and ask them, how do you build so long and strong relationship with customers and build campaigns for the rest of our sales? So I think that is a good idea to build engagement for your RMs, trust in your customer's side. So I think that CRM is more about quality and value proposition at the end. Interesting. So, so basically, first thing is that uh, we need to align internally in the bank uh, how to use it on many levels, right? We need to personalize it. We need to make it simple. Uh, and then we need to have a strong proposition in the end, right? Uh, but what to do with uh, MTCRM? So um, basically, my next question is how to get people into the CRM, how to acquire new customers. You know, nowadays, uh, if I don't have an account uh, and I get hit by a uh, YouTube ad or Facebook ad, I can send money from not having the app, I can send money with the Revolut within five minutes. With SME, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more complex. You need to have more information. So how do you get the customers uh, digitally easily, the SMEs? You're asking me, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I think uh, going back to what you said previously, actually, it was uh, really funny to me when you said that uh, getting those like spammy messages, you know, when that are not relevant to you. I remember like uh, a few months ago, I got this uh, message from my bank uh, in Montenegro, one of my banks, because I have multiple accounts. And uh, one of them was like, uh, spend your unforgettable summer in uh, the US on a work and travel program. And I'm like, I graduated like a few years ago. Why are you sending me this now? You know, it's so irrelevant. And then you cannot, in a way, honestly, you take you take the bank like less seriously because uh, you see that they don't really uh, personalize the experience to you at all. That it's not, re and then like every other message that I get, like of a promotional type I'm going to kind of ignore by default because I'm getting so many irrelevant messages from like different uh, sources airlines I don't know uh, all these different companies to my email to my to my SMS uh, Viber WhatsApp whatever um so I think when it comes to uh acquiring new customers first of all you need to I think uh, address who the customer is and uh, segmentation. I mean, it's it's uh, today you cannot avoid it because uh, right now uh, marketing teams are running out of options. Like uh, basically, advertising is becoming much more strict. And uh, uh, just today, I talked with someone on the topic of Facebook or like Meta implementing this ad-free uh, subscription where. People will be using that, you know, and it might be your customer using that. So you cannot count on one channel, you know, where you can send the promotional offers, videos, whatever. Uh, in on YouTube, that already exists. Like you mentioned, you you can already pay like for YouTube uh, premium. And is, are those channels the right channels? Where exactly. To acquire no, ex exactly. SMEs? I was gonna say exactly. Like, uh, well, you know, when when TikTok first appeared, everyone was like, it's for kids who are just uh, performing dances, and it's just stupid. And then all of a sudden you had uh, uh, like really successful use cases of uh, accountants using it to like address uh, their target market. It made people uh, really uh, get to the core of marketing to say the least number of things in like a very limited time and to say things that are relevant. And you know, in the beginning it was bad because it's like you had this 30 second format and everyone thought, oh my God, how am I gonna pitch something in 30 seconds? But then people started doing it and now TikTok is like doing really well, like not just for like retail, but B2B as well. Yeah. What are your experiences, experiences Jen? Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, two points are uh, critical, I think. Uh, one is to be able to create a meaningful value proposition. Yeah. Uh, two is uh, to be able to uh, create uh, effective customer touch points. Uh, as ING Turkey, uh, we acquire more than 80% uh, uh, customers uh, through uh, from uh, digital channels. Uh, maybe uh, uh, effective ones uh, are uh, in digital journeys, uh, in business partnerships, where intensive customer touch points such as marketplaces, wholesalers, um, chambers, unions. Mm. Uh, 
uh, maybe I can say second uh, uh, digital marketing, content marketing, uh, uh, member get member programs. Uh, and third one, uh, last but uh, I think it's first uh, f uh, embedded finance and uh, embedded uh, payment options are really a uh, great way to acquire customers. Interesting. So it doesn't have to be just bombing, pe bombing people or with PPC, with paid ads, but yeah. you can actually kind of hide it and subtly mm -hmm. so provide the, yeah. the seamlessly provide exactly. the financial exactly. Exactly. service. What is your t take on it? Uh, on this okay uh, i think that in sun thunder bank poland we have good experience in digital acquisition in last years i think that we acquired almost 200,000 customers through digital channels and based on that i think that we have three most important areas first is value proposition for me, it's something like promise that we have to give customers that we will be able to be with him today. When we will grow, we will be medium and large. And sometimes uh, it's a promise that we have some products, maybe today dedicated only for corporate customers. So we have to prove that we will be able to be with customers. That could be value added services, of course. The value for them is always if someone has branches with good advisors. But we have to have some value proposition, as Honor said. Uh, uh, it's good to start with maybe small target group, yeah, and later and later improve and improve. So, secondly, uh, for me, important is customer journey. So, how customer can open account and all touch points, of course, uh, it's obvious. So for example, a Santander customer can open bank account in branch, can do it via selfie process like Revolut or ING also. Uh, he can open via video uh, conversation with advisor or even can order courier with documents ready to sign. So we have a lot of ways to open this account through digital. And third thing, last not but least, is marketing. But thinking about digital acquisition, I don't, don't want to say that marketing on brand awareness is not important, but crucial is performance marketing, direct marketing in a digital acquisition. Martin. So, so the question was how to onboard SMEs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so in Flexidia, it's 99.99 .99 online. There was one weirdo who wanted to come to office to sign an agreement because he didn't believe that we are a real company. <laughs> uh, so, and it takes for SMEs five minutes, you know. They use the tools that the gentleman over here said, face recognition, ID, then it automatic AML KYC in sanctions and all the other necessary places. Then we actually fetch up. SMEs, sign, signatory persons, we see that the person who is in the process is the signatory person. We do some magic with some uh, phone numbers and stuff, and then like sign agreements, that's it. Bank account open. No, not bank account, but account open, can finance invoices. Uh, then when we are talking about uh, digital channels, uh, I will fight you, but I think that digital channels for SME doesn't work. Uh, I want to see some numbers from anyone that Facebook ads worked for you, or that TikTok ads worked for you, or YouTube ads worked for you. Uh, the places I have seen, conversion is maybe 1%. The companies that are more lucky maybe have conversion of 2%. And everyone is thinking that, no, it would be awesome if we made it to 5%. So um, in my life, uh, in various uh, SME-related projects, I have spent huge amount of, on ads and I have never seen it work, and I'm actually going to fight anyone who wants to say yes, and we can have an awesome discussion about that and maybe learn something out of it. Yeah, I want to add, it's very interesting. I agree with you about Facebook and TikTok. So we have to find different touch points, and I'm sure it's not Facebook or TikTok. Let's talk. <laughs> I would say I would do those say that it, they are important channels and not essentially in direct acquisitions, but that they play uh, a big role uh, in, as you said, like brand awareness and um, in general. I feel like it's 
not as simple as for individuals in general, like for, for SMEs, but I think you'll see a growing number of Gen Z entrepreneurs that my colleague mentioned, uh, you know, being more impatient and being more, you know, prone to, to these kinds of acquisitions. A quick one, I think the problem with SME acquisition is that it's really hard to target them yeah. because large, small companies are not really making LinkedIn profile. And I think on other platforms, it's really hard to pick it up, like who is actually an SME owner or director. And that's kind of, so yeah, it's like mixed and complicated. And I think in the platform, it's sometimes too late, unfortunately, to catch them. So yellow pages. You have to go through yellow pages. <laughs> now, uh, so you already mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, and touched upon it, uh, the the channels, right? That actually somebody came to your office and signed the paper physically. Uh, there are still people who wants to do it physically. That somehow, you know, may, maybe they're old-fashioned. They are scared. Uh, how do you deal with this? How do how do you become omnichannel, basically? Anybody? Uh, okay. So I think that omnichannel is about experience, to give customers the same experience in all channels. And I think that banks are quite good on that right now. Uh, and I think that we have three steps or three stages to be omnichannel. And I can give you an example from Santander and it will be a long process. So the first stage for us was when we have process only available in branch. And we discovered that our competition have process in digital and this process works quite good. So we moved to the second stage. So we implement processes in call center and uh, in digital. And later we find out it's not working. Why? Because we give the, the different experience. We, expect different information, we expect different documentation. So then we figured out that we need uh, omni-channel, not multi, but omni-channel, and we implement one credit process available in all channels. It means that you can start, proceed, and finish in mobile if you want, or branch, or call center, you can choose. But it means also that you can start process in branch Proceed later if you want in call center support, and at the end, if you want, you can uh, sign documents and agreements at home using mobile applications. So, for me personally, this is real omni channel, giving good experience for customers. I'm just here to mess you all up. Is it really necessary? Like, is it really necessary? Because uh, some of you say yes, but wait a minute. I have been working for government like 20 years and, and building e-services on a national level. And there is always this discussion about omni-channel because some pensioner in, in countryside will not be able to get an e-service. And then nor, like, the actual very like, innovative mode is we don't care. They will get a consultant to help them do it electronically and that's it. So we will get some other structure to be able, for example, in a bank, if you want omni-channel, but we just say mobile only, come to the branch, open your mobile, and get a consultant help you, and that's it. You will be mobile only. I'm actually asking, is it necessary? Who needs branches? Uh, who needs this omni-channel? Why we don't build just one channel and maybe additional services to get everyone into that channel? Aren't we overcomplicating things? Uh, do you have any take on this, or you, uh, you one? Uh, actually, a challenge. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, creating omnichannel uh, where all clients in SME uh, can get experiences uh, is very important, I think, uh, because uh, when we talk about omnichannel uh, from uh, touch transaction points in mobile to uh, to uh, customer uh, digital journeys in business partnerships. Uh, it's an ecosystem uh, that uh, can uh, orchestrate it with uh, visible uh, and I invisible uh, channels. I was going to say to address your point, uh, 
in Montenegro uh, and not just Montenegro, Serbia, Croatia, even um, Bosnia, there's a ridiculously high number of young people, like we're talking between 18 to 25, who don't have a credit card yet. They will go to the branch and they will go there to pay like their bills and stuff. And we were like talking about it. And one of the guys at the conference told me like, I wonder why does not someone like, you know, coach these like employees of the bank to just go outside with their M banking app and just show them how it works. And he's like, that would be the best advertising because like uh, they use billboards, they use uh, TV ads, like people 18 to 25, I tell you, they don't really watch TV and they don't pay attention to billboards. So TikTok or Facebook would help there, <laughs> maybe. Uh, but uh, I think it also depends on the quality of those experiences, you know, because uh, for example, uh, I had situations uh, even in the US when I lived there that I had to go to the branch like uh, uh, my account was in Wells Fargo I had to open it in person and then I remember I had to like I don't remember what, we, what it was uh, but there was like some transaction issue or something and I had to go to the branch like in the US where you have like all competitive a lot of competitive banks and they they have all kinds of innovations there and all of that I still had to go there like so the quality of the experience was really bad so it was easier for me to go to the branch because it gave me like this reassurance that I will talk to the real person and that I will you know stand there until they solve my problem you know uh, meanwhile I can, you know, stand on the phone uh, and wait in a queue and be there for like two hours and I won't even know if that person is like working on my problem or they're just, you know, uh, holding my me in the line. So it, it's also like the trick there. And I also saw some research um, that was done globally that uh, the Gen Z actually has more reassurance 44% uh, or something like that has a more reassurance when there's like an, a physical bank branch that they, they can go to uh, when it comes to choosing their banking provider. I just want to add that I agree with you about digi uh, mobile only, but I think that we have to remember about digital maturity in regions, in countries we, we have. So it's good, but not for each of us. Not the ATS. Adaption issues. Yes. That's what I was just thinking about, uh, right? So I've got a dad, he's 65, he's got a small uh, business, he's kind of innovative, but you know, he doesn't have a, such a much, a lot of money, right, in his business. So is it even customer that you want to serve if he's not able to use the phone? You know, so that would be the question. Maybe, uh, uh, is there somebody from the audience who would like to challenge our speakers with some question? I have one question uh, in the reserve, but cameraman? No, no, you don't. No. Okay, so uh, we already touched upon on it as well. The basically question of uh, embedded finance, uh, contextual uh, banking. You know, uh, how to basically sell something in the right time for to the right people on the right spot. So we uh, we spoke about it that embedded finance. What are the other channels that uh, you can? embedded financial products to, again to anybody okay uh, it's the first area for us uh, we are learning already uh, but uh, to in uh, since 2015 uh, almost 30,000 uh, 3,000 uh, merchants we have BMPL uh, solutions uh, for uh, individual customers and uh, we see uh, we can see their uh, effects uh, positively in transaction ways or uh, acquisition ways uh, but uh, it's still uh, in baby steps uh, in turkey um, now uh, we are uh, we should uh, improve our uh, skills uh, in embedded uh, finance uh, because we, I think three years later, it's the main channel uh, when I call a customer. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, you can embed the finance in many various places, right? Like invoice, for example, financing, you can embed in e-invoice system. You can embed in some, some logistics, uh, brokerage exchange, 
where you get cargoes and you just say, I want also money right away. You can embed it in like an um, online store, to B2B store or something. You can embed it in a bank, like a big browser that maybe doesn't want to deal with certain SMEs and kind of pass it over to FinTech. I think about embedded finance, however, it's very interesting, I think, is this technological um, readiness of banks, I think, to do it. Because I, I had a conversation in Poland with a bank that was really having this innovative department to do innovations and stuff. And then they said, yeah, it's really awesome. We would like to do it. Our queue for IT is one year. And I was thinking, no, in one year, <laughs> there is no point doing it. Maybe the world will be different, you know. So I think um, uh, we somehow need to solve that in embedded finance a lot. You know, like how to get it quick. And, and most likely, also, when you start embedded finance, you will need to do some testing, like piloting, A-B testing, like different experiences. So technically, both partners most likely should be ready to really adapt quickly and change quickly. And I think that's the biggest issue uh, in the banking uh, sector now, if they want to have embedded finance as a partner. And I believe that banks that will be faster can actually win a lot. Yeah, I think that embedded finance is a future, or maybe might be the future. So right now it's a, a big opportunity for SMEs. You know, they can have some financing products, insurance, and they can combine to sales processes that they have in e-commerce. So this is opportunity for them. I think this also opportunity for banks to have fast products, easy from uh, fintechs. But I think that it is. It might be so easy and quick because it's still not regulated areas, so like BNPL or different products. So I hope I hope it will be still, but we have to uh, wait. I personally see a lot of um, you know benefits in connecting the non-banking. Um, uh, players with the banks, uh, so not even fintechs, but um, essentially what happened in in the telecom industry to, to draw a parallel is like uh, they're also undergoing some massive changes right now and they're having to change the business model. And I know there that Telecom Romania, for example, what they do is like they partnered with a, with a marketing agency and they provide um, SEO services for um, their biggest clients or, or no for the SM, for the SMEs actually and it's a great way for them to like onboard new clients because when you're starting a business or something like that you don't know ev any everything about every aspect of the business or you may have like marketing people but they need some help with the SEO or something like that and it became you know uh, a partnership there and it became like this new offer like uh, so i think in the in the banking industry essentially i think that there's going to be a lot of collaboration with uh, us as vendors uh, to to bring these uh, solutions to the market, uh, but also to connect it to their existing partners, whether it's uh, airlines, whether it's like uh, you know retail stores, because uh, that's like the most uh, used uh, use case for retail. Uh, and um, also on the other hand, like uh, Martin's mentioned, like the supply chain financing as well. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, uh, the audience as well. That was a beautiful build-up for the next part of uh, our uh, program, the rewards. Right, Olena? Now it's break. Thank you very much. Thank you. This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. 
Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using Partner Hub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive beyond banking offer. Partner Hub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for beyond banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. Partner Hub, your partner for beyond banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iExceed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements and workflow management, AI powered smart forms, straight through processing, unified access across downstream applications and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using PartnerHub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. PartnerHub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for Beyond Banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. PartnerHub your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXeed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper-intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements, and workflow management. AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.
Yes, we are back on stage. And actually, we are back, I guess, to the favorite part of, of today, uh, our fifth SME Banking and FinTech Awards. And this year, we will award as well, for the first time, tech solutions in the region, so the most innovative tech solutions in the region. So let's start. All right, let's start from the uh, SME banking uh, and fintech solutions and awards. And the first category, uh, which we award every year, uh, and this hasn't changed and uh, probably will not change for the next years, is the best online banking for SME customers this year in the CE region. So we, as you probably know, who are several years with us that we do our studies and this ranking is based uh, on uh, our studies that we do at SME Banking Club and every year we gather the um, uh, functionality, the data and analyze what is available, which functionality is available for SME customers in the online banking channels. So this year we analyzed 37 online banking solutions from the region. 85 parameters were analyzed, and this is uh, the analysis of the functionality, so uh, user experience was not analyzed in, uh, in our ranking. And um, the functionality is like all uh, 85 parameters are available to all the contributors of the ranking and our members, so uh, uh, you can uh, and you are able to compare all of them. And uh, if you're not our member, you're welcome to become one. And uh, so the main parameters are grouped in the following uh, um, uh, groups. Uh, for the online banking, this is, uh, so we analyze the onboarding process, and this includes seven criteria, so whether the customer can uh, uh, be onboarded with the online banking fully with no paper, signing of the paper agreements. Then we have uh, set up of the main dashboard, whether it can be customized or not. Uh, the second, the next group is accounts. So we have 12 criteria on uh, possibility of opening different accounts with that, via the online banking. The next uh, group is payments in the local currency, 15 criteria. Uh, deposits, four for, uh, for criteria. Uh, loans, so the possibility to apply on the loan, uh, uh, see the um, balances, repay uh, on the schedule, early repayments via the online banking. Then we have the group of the criteria for the um, payments in the foreign currency and also uh, currency, uh, foreign currency exchange module. Uh, cards group with eight criteria in that, including whether there is a possibility to order a um, business card via the online banking, uh, activate, block, unblock, etc., and also um, set limits within the card users. Uh, then we have uh, a group of criteria for factoring and trade finance, so whether there is an opportunity to apply for factoring or trade finance product in the online banking. Uh, um, Value-added service in integrations, including uh, e-invoicing, online accounting, e-shops, um, uh, other services that are connected with the um, general services in the online banking system, and support functionality. So, how quick a customer can give some feedback or connect with the uh, with the bank support. So, these are the criteria. They it, they, hasn't, they haven't changed um, uh, from, from the previous year, so uh, they are the same. Modules weights uh, are also the same, so they were based on our expert opinion and uh, surveys of the aggregated statistics, what we did uh, in the region. And now the, the results look the following way, so that this year the best online banking for SMEs wins two banks with the same scores. Angie Bank Schlonski, Poland, and Pekao Bank, Poland. So I invite first Angie Bank, uh, Joanna Wienczyk-Sitek, to receive this award. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Olena, and SME Banking Club for this uh, award. Uh, we are very proud of it, especially it's not the first time where ING Business yes. is recognized by, uh, by this category. Maybe I keep it like that, <laughs> it will be easier. 
And yesterday, exactly, we celebrated 16 years of launched uh, this platform for business banking clients. So it's the good moment for <laughs> such recognition. And I want to congratulate and thank very much all my uh, teams from tech, business, and all the units from the bank uh, responsible for this successful award. Thank you very Congratulations. much. Congratulations. Very thank much you. deserved. Thank you. And uh, Andrzej Furstenberg, Pekao Bank, you're welcome. Oh, the whole team, all right. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Congratulations, all the team. Thank you very much, Elena, for this uh, award and the uh, jury. Actually, it is the first time we're getting this uh, award. As you see, there are three of us. It means that this is a teamwork. It's uh, not only the work of one person, but I think there are several people that, uh, and also the external vendor who uh, should be awarded here. So I'm really proud for the team and for this uh, celebration. So thank you very much. And we are still yeah. developing, so it's yeah. a very Looking good start for, for the this, next yeah, year. Yeah. So we'll see what will be next year. Thank you very much. Next category is the best mobile banking for SMEs uh, in the CE region this year. So we analyzed 26 mobile banking uh, application in the region, 80 parameters, as well only functionality, uh, no UX design was analyzed. Um, the same table to compare the results. So this is this is trans transparent, and uh, you can you can check um, what is available and what is not among all the um, applications that we analyzed. Uh, the main parameters are also grouped the same way as uh, they are grouped for the online banking um, functionality, so I probably will not repeat them. And uh, the weights are um, the following uh, for, the, for the categories. Uh, this also uh, hasn't changed since, since, the, since the first time uh, launched the award. So let's go to, to know the winner this year. And congratulations to Santander Bank Polska for their changed, updated, I would say, application, mobile banking application. And I invite Piotr Miaczkowski to receive this award. Okay, so thank you very much, Olena. And I just want to say to Santander, it is a result of our hard work. So congratulations for you and thank you very much for support. Congratulations. <laughs> Next category is the best digital SME lending in the region. Uh, here we analyzed uh, all the banks and non-banking financial organizations that are providing loans for SME segments. So we, uh, we analyzed actually 76 uh, banks and organizations and 27 from, from them are the scope uh, of this ranking and analysis because they have uh, full or partial digital process for SME uh, loans. And uh, 11 parameters were analyzed uh, uh, within this ranking and study. Uh, which are grouped the following way. So this is the possibility uh, to apply for a loan in the online uh, banking channel, in the mobile banking channel, separately for private, so sole entrepreneurs, and separately for companies. Uh, automatic decision making, uh, online signing of the agreement, automatic disbursements. So this parameter were weighted 12% uh, each. So we consider this uh, as the most important, whether we call this 
process digital or not. And for uh, another parameters were given just additional additional scores for the possibility to um, uh, upload documents on covenants when the loan is um, disbursed already. Also, whether there is a possibility to sign digitally annexes to the loan agreement if there is a case. And also possibility to repay uh, scheduled repayments and, and early repayments. So these are the parameters that were and criteria that were analyzed. And we go to learn the winners this year. Two banks, Pekao BP and uh, uh, Tatra Banka uh, from Slovakia. The same numbers, uh, first place. So please, first Pekao, Pekao BP, I invite you to receive the award, Anna Podguska. So hello, uh, first of all I would like to thank SME Banking Club, we really appreciate this award, but of course uh, thank to our Scrum, PKO BP Scrum teams, uh, because our uh, digital lending solution are the result of the work of our Scrum Agile teams, people from uh, risk, uh, from business, uh, from uh, IT of course, and sales, uh, UX de designers who sit together, work together as a scrum team and create and develop uh, innovating uh, solutions. So it's your reward, my friends, and I'm really proud of you. And uh, we still keep working. <laughs> of course. So I hope to be there next year. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you very much. Congratulations. All right, and Tatra Banka, yes, guys, welcome. For the next year already, congratulations. Hello, I would like to thank uh, the SME Club Banking and uh, uh, this uh, award is for of my colleagues which participate in um, digital innovation for SME and uh, our supportive management and our external pan partners. Uh, we are continuously working on interesting uh, solution for SMEs and that is why I am looking forward to next year. Thanks a lot. We either. Thank you very much. <laughs> and within this um, nomination, within this category, the best digital SME lending, we honor and award also the fintechs, the best fintechs in this area. And this year, the award for the best fintechs, digital lending for SMEs, goes to two fintechs, Limonero, Czech Republic, and Omnicredit, Romania. So I invite first Limonero, Yiji, as well for the next year already, congratulations. Thank you, Rina, for this award. It is a huge success for us to win this for the third time in a row. And I think that it's uh, also a great, uh, great confirmation that we are on the right path to fulfill our goal to provide uh, external growth capital for the underfinanced SMEs. I'm also uh, uh, super proud of the whole Lemonor team because it was uh, their hard work which led us to this success. And at the end, I would also like to thank to all our clients, uh, partners and investors because it wouldn't be possible to stay here without them. So thank you again, have a wonderful evening, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, congratulations once again. Yes, Elisa Russo, Omnicredit, congratulations. First time, congratulations. Thank you, 
you very much, uh, Olena, for inviting us in uh, your uh, study. Uh, it's an honor for, uh, for me and for our team to win this uh, prize. And uh, it's, uh, of course, the result of uh, four very hard years of uh, working. Uh, and of course, it couldn't be possible without uh, the help of my team, of my the trust of my investors, of my creditors, of my partners, of my clients, of my family, and so on. <laughs> Thank you very much to all. And congratulations. Thank you. All right. And the next category is the best digital factoring for SMEs. Um, here we analyzed all the factors uh, on the on the markets available on the market in the region. So, uh, banking, so factoring companies from banking groups and also fintechs. Uh, 27 uh, factoring companies this year were analyzed. 17 parameters were taken into the account, into the account, and um, they are the following. So, the possibility to apply for a factoring uh, fully online and uh, mobile for um, sole entrepreneurs, for companies. Possibility to upload the invoice, uh, sign the factoring agreement if needed, also digitally. Possibility also to send uh, payment reminders, automatic disbursement, integration with the accounting, invoicing and online banking systems. And uh, yes, and this is it, an automatic decision making. So these are the criteria that were taken into account when we analyzed uh, the companies here. And the winner this year is ING Bank Shlonsky, ING Commercial Finance, for their product, Microfactoring. And I invite uh, Konrad Kosson to receive this award. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for this award. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor for us and it's uh, kind of an obligation also to keep, uh, keep improving. Uh, and uh, as you know, we, we introduced this product several years ago and it was uh, completely new territory for us in terms of new clients, new customer service. And, uh, but we believed in this idea and we were dedicated. And after a few, few years, we can say that we are really proud of what we achieved. Uh, and yeah, we'll just keep keep going. And thank you very much for the for the whole ING team that is behind this product, for for the management that supported us. And yeah, thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. And fintechs. So the best fintechs in the region for digital factoring. Smeo, Poland, and Instant Factoring, Romania. So let me invite first Marius from Smeo. Congratulations. Very well deserved. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elena. It's a pleasure to be here, to be among you. Congratulations to my colleagues from ING Commercial Finance. I remember the company working there in ING, helping you for a small ticket for 10 years. So really congratulations. But uh, I hope not to be here the, the, the last time. Uh, I can announce now that we are starting to fly together with Bochan Group to implement more of the uh, online business for lending and factoring in Poland. So it is coming soon, I hope. But first I would like maybe, or the last, I would like to thank the entire team. We are only 20 people in Poland. So very little staff and uh, very engaged. We are just after the problems, but I hope uh, getting new business partner, getting new ideas, uh, we can come back here. But really I enjoy working with young people and uh, getting this very nice uh, prize. Thank you so much. Thank you, congratulations. <laughs> Christian Ionescu, Instant Factoring. Congratulations. Good 
Good evening, all. Nice to see old friends uh, tonight uh, uh, in the audience. Uh, thank you, Olena, and uh, your team for this very inspiring event. It's really great to come back thank you. every year for two days of immersion in some inspiring ideas. It's, it's great to be part of CE. It's a very full of talent, as we see, and I'm pr we are proud to be part of it. Of course, this is a, a token of recognition for all the hard work for our team, and this prize is for you guys, the guys in Romania, the guys in Serbia that are working daily, day and night, to, to make happy clients and to help them to get to the next level. Uh, in the last two years, we shared this award with a company that is not here today. It's a good friend of ours from Poland. I would like to pay uh, respect to him, uh, Maciek Drovanowski, the CEO of Monevia, ex-CEO of Monevia, I believe. At this stage, he suffered a terrible accident uh, two, three months ago. He's in hospital recovering. And I would like for those of you that know him to to, you know, I want to pay respect because he was an inspiration to us when we started this company in Romania. And I think it's worth uh, sharing that with you. And Maciek, if you, when you hear or see this video, uh, it's this award also is for you. So thank you so much. I wish us a nice evening. Thank you, Christian. All right. And tech awards the most innovative solutions in the region. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of today's, today's day, today's conference day, uh, for these uh, awards, um, these were you who voted for the best solution on our conference website. So these are the results of all of your voting. So let's go to the first category. The best core banking solution in the region this year Saskada, congratulations. <laughs> and right here, Steve, you are welcome to receive this award. Congratulations. Thank you to the SME Banking Club. Uh, it's been a great event, and uh, thank you for Krakow for welcoming us. It's been brilliant. My first visit, definitely back again. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Steve. Thank you. The best CRM solution in the region. Uh, CX360 Logate. Yefrosima Zogovic, welcome. The whole team. Okay, of course. If you're Sima Sanya and Yoga, congratulations. Hello again, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Olena uh, for uh, the nomination for the best CRM solution in the region. This means a lot of us, and this is the proof that we are on the right path. But also, I would like to uh, say that uh, our clients and our experience and uh, successful projects with our clients are also part of this award. And of course, me as a salesperson, I have to match this uh, award with my outfit. But <laughs> I really want want to uh, proudly take this one to my colleagues in Montenegro who are behind this uh, solution, Logate, and uh, as we like to call it, Finnegate team who is behind <laughs> the solution. So I'm proud and I'm thankful uh, in their name and in the name of the entire Logate company for this one and hopefully see you again next year and come to Montenegro, of course. <laughs> it's warmer. Thank you. <laughs> The next category, the best SME lending software. Kilana, congratulations. Christian, you are welcome to the stage. This award is yours. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Alina, and thank you for the entire team of the SME Banking Club. It's been a couple of years now that we have been here, and this is a great motivation to do more in the region, to come back, and to offer more 
services, including the things we plan for next year, like the SME Lending Fund. So thank you for the trust, thank you for the vote, and hope to be back soon. Thank you. The best factoring software in the region, Comark Factoring Platform. Congratulations. Thank you, Elena, for this award. Uh, I would like to thank uh, our all Comar factoring team, also sitting here, of course, and our uh, development team, a group of many people that, that works hard every day for, for our success. Uh, it shows that the path that we've taken a uh, few, few months, few years ago, pays off, and uh, we are obligated to do it uh, again and again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, the best supply chain finance solution in the region, Supplier Plus. Congratulations. Peter, you're welcome to receive the award. Good evening. Uh, being Estonian, I'll keep it short and simple. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The best SME ecosystem software in the region. Komar, congratulations. Much is the Thank you guys, right? This gives me a lot of confidence, right? The path of empowering internal teams at banks that we have chosen, again, a, a couple of years ago, really pays off. And this is something that is really needed on the market. So I would like to thank all of the teams at Comar, including product managers, production teams that actually made it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. The best e-invoicing solution in the region. Partner Hub, congratulations. <laughs> Katarin Kauzli. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, like having a category for e invoicing, it feels like you know being a sport analyst into the Olympic Games. Uh, I think besides our work, it shows the gaining uh, of the importance of the topic. So e invoicing will come and is coming. Yes. And yeah, I would like to say thanks for our banking customers who made it possible to for us to stand here today, and equally to the partner hub team. Thank you. Thank you very much. The best uh, ESG solution in the region, Kreef Poland. Congratulations, Kamer Goslavski. First of all, thank you very much, Helena, and whole SME Banking Club team, because I, I think that it's a great job today, great evening, to be honest. Uh, I think that uh, I want to thanks and uh, congratulate our global team, uh, as uh, let's say the, the provider of the, that uh, solution, and also our local team that support to implement it in locally. So thank you very much once again, and please enjoy the evening. <laughs> Thank you very much. And the last category of the awards is the best digital onboarding solution. And 
the biggest number of scores uh, Epsilon I exceed. Dimitris, congratulations and welcome at stage. First of all, I would like to thank the SME Banking Club. Our relationship goes back uh, many years, and I've yes. been to this event in many different uh, countries. I would like to thank also the voters and the IXID uh, team uh, for making this happen, and obviously our customers that are testament to our success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. So just to say um, what is next uh, from our side before we start drinking finally Prosecco today. So um, for the next year, uh, part of you already knows and I would like to announce it today uh, officially that uh, next year um, we are starting uh, the project which is called Word Digital and um, so Word of Open Account Digital and the project uh, will be devoted to the promotion of the digitalization of receivable finance products and uh, so the, um, the, uh, all our topics that are connected with digital factory uh, will be uh, now uh, under the project of War Digital. So this is the um, uh, synergy of the existing War solution that uh, is covering uh, Western Europe right now. And, uh, and our SME Banking Club community of the digital factoring in the CE region. So that from the next year within this project, we will cover this topic globally. So this is the first news. The, um, so we will announce the detailed agenda for the next year very soon. So we plan to have uh, uh, webinars, of course, uh, different content on the website, and also annual conference for the mid of the next year. Uh, so stay tuned for the, for the news. And uh, SME Banking uh, Conference, so we plan for the next year and uh, I would invite and encourage you to discuss next year the future SME banking. So not the topic what we see and what is available right now, but how the future banking in five, ten years should look like. Let's discuss it already now, next year. And we will do it during our conference in uh, one of the most modern and futuristic, I would say, buildings in the CE region, which one you will also uh, new, no, in a very, very short period of time, so in December. So the date is November 15 next year, so mark your calendars. I invite you all to join next year, and thank you very much for today. Thank you very much for coming, for attention, for your innovations, and for readiness to share it with the community. Thank you very much. Yes, and now it's time, time to have a Prosecco. Thank you. This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is the second biggest. This year, we invite you to Krakow. It is 
the second biggest city in Poland, one of the oldest and at the same time one of the most innovative cities in the country. Here, in one of the largest congress centers in the whole CEE region, with the view of Wawel Castle, we will discuss important SME banking topics, network and award the best banking and tech solutions in the region. of November. Invoicing is a headache for your SME customers and for banks, too. But it is the perfect start to implement your Beyond Banking strategy. Implementing an e-invoicing solution can be a challenging job. Using PartnerHub's white label solution you can make your SME customers happy with a comprehensive Beyond Banking offer. PartnerHub's white label e-invoicing solution can be integrated into your online and mobile banking channels. Banking and e-invoicing are stronger together, the breakthrough concept for Beyond Banking. For SMEs a revolutionary and future-proof service. For the banks, control and flexibility to provide unique value. The future is now. Be part of it. PartnerHub your partner for Beyond Banking. Businesses of all sizes play an important role in our lives directly and indirectly. Hence, the responsibility of empowering businesses to do well is something we shoulder very seriously. iXeed's cloud-based corporate banking solutions help you do all that and more with its user-centric approach, comprehensive support for a wide range of products and modules, omni-channel user journeys, seamless integration with disparate back-end systems, and so much more. Up till now, one of the biggest costs involved in the SME and corporate banking sector was onboarding a new customer. The process was paper-intensive and took several weeks. But we changed all that with inbuilt loan and accounts origination modules, chatbots and instant messaging support, roles, entitlements, and workflow management, AI-powered smart forms, straight-through processing, unified access across downstream applications, and more. As a result, what would have once taken several weeks now takes merely a few hours with AppZillon SME and corporate onboarding. Now, get in touch with us today for a live demo of our offerings.